Chapter One of Murder Takes the Veil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. Chapter One The door of Mother Theodore's parlor opened slowly. For the past twenty minutes, Mother had been sitting absolutely still in her great, uncomfortable, carved chair, watching that door. By neither nature nor training was Mother Theodore given to premonitions. Hunches, feelings in the bones, warnings by black crows, prophecies of death from the dank smell that often permeated the swamp, these were to be heeded only by the unknowing outside the convent walls. Mother knew better. It was excitement alone that had sent a strange tingle along her spine, minutes ago, when she had heard the whistle of the 415 pulling into Marysville, across the bayou. Coincidence, also, that a crow had flapped, calling above the cypresses, almost on the heels of the whistle, and nothing but imagination that scented the breeze with the odor of tombs as it moved through the open window. But Mother's hand had gone out involuntarily to swing shut the casement, and now the door was opening. Mother Theodore rose, her eyes upon the dark wedge of hall twilight, expanding inch by inch. It's not too late yet, she thought. I could refuse to see them. I could say I changed my mind, that the College of St. Aurelian had prospered for nearly two centuries without lay instructors, and so it could go on. But that, of course, was the whole problem. Evidently it could not go on so well without some concession. For this year the enrollment was ten less than last, and so they were importing a writer, an artist, and an athletic instructor all high in their fields. The very thought set Mother's brain to whirling in unorthodox panic, and she wiped her right palm surreptitiously against her habit. She must shake hands with dignity and enough welcome to fit the occasion, and trust that the gentleman would not notice the unaccustomed clamminess of her hand. She had managed well yesterday, she believed, but there had been only one of the great Torvaldsen, the artists. Now there would be two to greet. The door had now opened wide, and out of the corridor gloom Sister Osmond emerged, a large woman whom the amplitude of the habit made enormous. No one had ever been heard to remark that it was a pity Sister Osmond was so big, for her size was not only a fine attribute in a portress, but a trait of personal dignity. Very erect, unhurried, she met all visitors at the door with her gracious smile, and listened tranquilly to their requests. Those who were admitted felt that they had passed a test but those who were turned away, with the same gracious smile, usually masculine colors, with designs upon the girls, or the convent purse, never entertained the slightest rancor toward Sister Osmond. They simply had not measured up. That they might have gained entrance through several other unguarded ways never occurred to them. Inside the door Sister stepped aside, inclined her head respectfully to Mother, slipped her hands up her sleeves, and turned a penetrating glance upon the two guests. The tall, dark young man stood gracefully at ease. The older looked across at Mother with an attentive smile. Unlike as the visitors were, they shared one reaction. Neither was overawed by the decorum of the proceedings. "'Mother Theodore,' said Sister Osmond. Then, having paused for Mother's permission, she indicated the guest who took precedence by age. "'Mr. Crispin Archer.' The gentleman's head tilted in the conscious manner of people who have been often before crowds and consider without being aware of it the angle and effect of every mannerism. In Mr. Archer this learned poise appeared to be arrogance, and yet, as he advanced with a slow swinging gait, Mother Theodore realized also that it might be a compensation. For Crispin Archer was very oddly built. He was all wide, his head wide from ear to ear, his forehead broad under a broadly curving hairline his eyes wide apart, his shoulders muscular as a boxer's, the hand he extended to mother short and thick. Still he was handsome. His hair, becomingly tousled, was of the tawny blonde that photographs dark, and his eyes and complexion matched so perfectly that anyone seeing his picture would judge him to be swarthy brown. In the photographs which had accompanied the reviews of Feathers of the Pin, and upon the back jacket of the book itself, Mr. Archer was pictured sitting down. He was not proud of his short legs, even though their shortness was only in comparison to his general width. Standing before Mother Theodore, he could meet her gaze levelly, and Mother was of more than medium height for a woman. "'Mr. Archer,' she murmured, 
and at the same moment Mr. Archer murmured something polite. His back was to the guardian sister, and his companion guest, still in the doorway, and suddenly Crispin Archer flashed toward Mother a most extraordinary smile. It stood around the strict impersonality of their meeting, and became a recognition of the man for the woman, a bridge of humanness over the chasm beyond which all women retreat when they enter a convent, and which few look back across. Mother Theodore gasped, but only mentally. Aloud she made no sound. In that instant Archer's eyes fell decorously, the smile retreated. He pressed her hand and stepped back, his manner all that one could ask, plus a nice touch of humility. Mother turned her head slowly from him, and Sister Osmond took her cue. Mr. Franz Eric, Mother Theodore, the portress announced, and then, having completed her duty, she glided out into the wedge of twilight and closed Mother in with St. Aurelian's immediate future. Franz Eric smiled also as he shook hands, but it was with the familiar deference of having said, yes, sir, and no, sir, through eight years of grade school. He was young, half the age of Mr. Archer, dark and slim and olive-skinned. Mother noted his dashing good looks, and the pixie way he had of catching his lower lip between his white teeth when he smiled, and the graceful nonchalance, which had no doubt contributed to his fame as a fencing-master in New Orleans, and the indolent charm which had made possible the evolution of Franz Eric from the grubby little larva which was Frank Erickson of the downtown Poydras Street Ericksons of New Orleans, who had lived six to a room. The list of his qualities added up to far more than the simple fact that Franz was just Frank, with his face washed. To Mother Theodore, already shaken by Crispin Archer, he loomed as a promise of disaster, eighty-two separate disasters, according to the enrollment of St. Aurelian's, for Franz undeniably had magnetism, and in his lowly beginning, perhaps, lay the compulsion to raise himself high, to prove that the accidental poverty of his birth meant little. Standing there, looking him over with every appearance of calmness, Mother was appalled at what she had done. The great Travaldson, nearly sixty, and with a couple of grown daughters, who no doubt had conditioned him through the years, would have been quite enough to modernize the curriculum. Admiring him respectfully, the eighty-two college girls would have continued about their business of submitting to education, but now, in their mists, Mother was about to inject two gentlemen of highly individual personality. That both had come well recommended was a small consequence, where the basic urges were concerned, and that she had happened to fall upon two bachelors and a widower seemed indeed like a grim joke of providence. "'Gentlemen, you will forgive me,' mother broke in upon her own confused reverie please be seated you had not too uncomfortable a journey i trust the connections were not bad gravely they seated themselves the guests of necessity facing the light because mother had lowered herself once again into the carved chair but she did not relax while crispin archer tactfully suppressed his opinion of the bayou country and franz lied like a gentleman about the drudgery of the trip from new orleans Mother Theodore politely failed to listen. Firmness, she decided, that must be her course, a clear, straight statement of their position and hers. She could not back away from this situation, which, after all, was of her own inviting. There would be no sentimental yearning, even in the privacy of her own cell, for the dear old days when St. Aurelian's was a self-contained little world from whose portals Sister Osmond could fend off every enemy. Mother Theodore turned to Mr. Archer, I do not intend to dissemble before you gentlemen, she said bluntly, and then wondered if she should soften her manner. Archer's smile was one of surprise, and out of the corner of her eye she saw Franz come to attention. You will be living inside the convent grounds, you see, and it will be quite intolerable for all of us, including yourselves, if we were to become too intimate objects of one another's concern. I hesitated long over taking this step. We must compete, in a manner, with other colleges. In addition to religion, modern parents want also what they term advantages for their daughters. And we are the advantages, Mr. Archer remarked. Mother continued as if she had not heard the flippancy. Sharing as you must in much of our routine, you will come to know a great deal about us, and it was that thought which made me uneasy. A writer must sketch from life, naturally, in the same spirit as a painter, both can do it cruelly, or with human understanding. You have a reputation for keenness, Mr. Archer, 
and I do not expect your months with us to be a hiatus in your creative life. I do, however, expect discretion, and I ask that you write nothing specific concerning St. Aurelian's. Mother's eyes came to Franz Eric. Our girls range in age from seventeen to twenty-one, the most impressionable time of their lives. Many of them have attended sister schools, always, through grade and high school, and it is going to be a thrilling innovation for them to sit at the feet of a masculine instructor. You may find that a few of them troublesome, but you may limit your contacts to as little as you like outside of classes. Franz coughed, and Crispin nodded gravely. Each of you will be given an office, Mother Theodore went on with her usual competence. I understand you are a musician as well as a writer, Mr. Archer, so we have arranged a studio for you in the music department. For you, Mr. Eric, there is a small office in the gymnasium wing. The bookstore, where the girls buy their school supplies, is also in that wing, she added. And in the bookstore, as Mr. Eric would soon find out, old Sister Aloysius would be forever puttering about. Yes, mother, Franz murmured with great docility. Since your time is entirely ours, Mr. Eric, we have already arranged your schedule. Mr. Archer's is not yet settled. The new books, you see, take precedence over our own small needs. And shrinks my salary, Crispin thought, but aloud he said, You are considerate, mother. However, I write like a maniac at any hour of the day or night, or not at all. I'm not a consistent producer. Some of the reviewers, bless their black hearts, have expressed the notion that I'm not a creative writer at all, but only a photographic recorder, who happens to be a pretty slick craftsman. Which leads me to wonder, mother, why I was honored by selection for St. Aurelian's. Mother Theodore's eyes fell in the shadow of her cough. Here was the man who had been revealed in feathers of the pen, the detached observer who sat back looking at the world with a philosophic eye and setting down his record of it. The eye was now being applied to himself. Mother smiled at the toe of Mr. Archer's bronze polished shoe. Fame is its own recommendation, sir. Ah, then who shall say it is worthless? Tolerantly amused at this thing called success, that was his pose. And so, thought Mother, upon that plane I shall meet him. I doubt if one person can teach another to be a writer, Mr. Archer. Our personal gifts come from the hand of Providence. But you have already arrived in the literary world, and your knowledge of the practical side will constitute your main value to your students. Mother's tone was very near to a reprimand, and Mr. Archer murmured something by way of apology. Franz Eric shifted in his chair. The nun regarded him with gratitude. Without her attention appearing to wander, her mind cast back over the excellent recommendations which had preceded Mr. Archer. In numbers and enthusiasm, his rooting section equaled that of the great Tolvudson. Of the three, Franz had been the one to have merely adequate backing, yet that fact appealed strongly to Mother Theodore now. With two geniuses on her hands, how comforting it was to know that the third member was normal enough to furnish a balance. Still, young Eric's eyes met her with a strangely shrewd speculation, as he asked with surprising seriousness, If Mr. Archer's fame and experience constituted his recommendation, Mother, then exactly what prompted your selection of me? We wish to give all our young ladies equal opportunity for something of added interest, Mother replied, hoping she did not sound as if she were mentally giving him a nice pat on the head. Some will not take either to writing or painting, and for these we offer, ah. Uh... Mr. Eric, Crispin suggested in that facile way he had of finishing a statement. But Franz could not be led away from his question. With an eagerness approaching anxiety, he insisted, and was that why you chose me, mother, to temper the weight of culture? He was determined upon an answer, and like a flood tumbling into a spillway, mother's premonitions rushed back. Where now was the balance of personalities that had soothed her a moment ago? And yet Franz had asked the perfectly legitimate question. Why had she engaged him to complete her triumvirate of the famous, when his fame was actually only a sort of harmless local notoriety? Mother Theodore arose, and the two stood with her. Being upon her feet gave her confidence. Carlyle once wrote that fame is no short test of merit, but only a probability of such. It is an accident, not a property of man. If the accident has been slow in happening to you, Mr. Eric, it is no reflection whatsoever upon your merit. 
your contribution to St. Aurelian's should be quite valuable in itself. Franz was listening intently, as if he tried to clothe every word with far more than its meaning, and the thought struck Mother Theodore that this young gentleman was a good deal older than he admitted. Around his eyes were tiny lined proofs of it, proof again in the rather hard maturity of his mouth, before the pixie smile took over. Mr. Archer laughed. Forgive me, mother, but your modernity amazes me. There is nothing archaic about you except your habit. The peasant dress of the Middle Ages, isn't it? Mother Theodore folded her hands under the brown scapular, which was the peasant's apron of the Middle Ages, as Mr. Archer had assumed. There is no reason in the world why he should not know such a fact. The ancient dress was the historic mark of many an order, varying but slightly in color and in the design of the headdress. Yet this common knowledge became, with Crisp and Archer's statement, a personal revelation, as if he knew too much about her. Like what kind of toothpaste she used. And Mother Theodore knew how to deal with him. If you are with us long, sir, she said with faint emphasis on the if, you will find that withdrawal from the world is one's best assurance of understanding it. Our convent walls are barriers, not obstacles. Crispin bowed, and Franz choked. You have a troublesome cough, Mr. Eric, Mother observed. I'll see that you are served an eggnog with cream every morning. Very strengthening. She walked to the door. Franz was ahead of her to open it. I hope your stay with us will be happy, gentlemen. Sister Osmond will show you to the guest house. Mr. Tolvidson is already there. I think you will not find it crowded, even for the three of you. The great Tolvidson, Crispin exclaimed. I've heard of him ever since I was a kid. Tell me, mother, is he as great as his reputation? Mother met his glance coolly. Trevoltson has painted his masterpiece. One true picture, sir, and that assigns him a place with the immortals. One faultless contribution is enough for one man. But if he had never had painted, he could still be a great man. Mr. Archer, and God makes too few of those. Good afternoon, sir. Mr. Eric. Their exit was as ceremonious as their entrance, a fading into the gloom which had admitted them. When they were gone, Mother did not return to her chair. She went instead to the window and opened it wide. Down on the green lawn under the magnolias and live oaks, groups of girls strolled or sat with their books open in their laps. Beyond the convent gates, the road swung on to Marysville, a mile away, and between convent and village, the, ba the bayous looped into currentless, brown stagnation hidden by cypresses and tupelos. Back behind the comet, the usual farm life was going on. Within, it was the quietest hour of the day, the sisters at prayers, the girls happily disposed according to necessity or temperament. Why was I not satisfied with this as it was, Mother Theodore thought, and her automatic use of the past tense slapped at her sense of security. From the beginning, from that moment last July, when she had held in her hand the letter from their famous poetess graduate, and known she was about to pay them a visit. Mother had been uneasy. Marguerite Rantonga had always known too well what she wanted, and she had known immediately upon arrival what St. Aurelian's wanted. Opportunity. Never had opportunity knocked unheeded at Miss Rantonga's door. Writing under the name of Anna Crean, the Greek lyric poet, she made for herself an exclusive niche that almost everyone envied. To her salons in New York had come Archer and Tovaltson, along with a hundred others, and Marguerite had nipped them out and set their abilities before Mother. Then she talked to the patrons, who already had contributed heavily to the support of the school, and each had telephoned Mother and come to tea. The result, in the light of the decreasing enrollment, was inevitable. But it was my own decision, Mother reminded herself fairly. Not a single patron had done more than to suggest that she looked into the fitness of the writer and the artist whom Miss Rontanga recommended or allow a certain New Orleans connection to interview Mr. Eric, and so word had come to Mother through the poetess that all three would be willing. There had been no pressure whatever, except the trend so much emphasized by Marguerite. But perhaps nothing was changed after all. The new would very probably sift into the old, and soon the artist, the fencing master, and the writer would be no more a source of disturbance than any other of the very human frailties gathered together within St. Aurelian's. Mother Theodore turned swiftly from the window. She was hungry in soul and body, and the sooner both hungers were satisfied, 
the sooner would she return to her usual placid normality. Leaving the parlor, she hurried through the clean, dark halls and out the beautiful arched cloister walk to the chapel. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Murder Takes the Veil》by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Two There were three cloister walks, one leading from either end of the long main building, which formed the front of the square, the west walk terminating at the house occupied by the contemplative sisters of the order, the east walk ending at the chapel the third joining the contemplative's house in the chapel. Within the square was a garden colorful with late-blooming flowers. Crisp and Archer looked across the garden, saw the figure hastening to the chapel, and smiled. "'It would seem that Mother is in need of spiritual sustenance,' he murmured to Franz. "'We must have proved a trial to her. Your cough, no doubt.' Franz grinned wickedly. Ahead of them, Sister Osmond bustled unconscious of the fact that the participants in the specially conducted tour were lagging, and therefore missing most of her explanation of how the sisters had come north from New Orleans in 1769 to escape the attentions of Count Alexander O'Reilly, the Spanish butcher, and had remained to build the convent, much of it with their own hands. "'You may have noticed that our extracurricular activities are to be expressly limited,' Franz replied in a low voice. If we are to remain within this holy realm, we'll have to be, shall we say, circumspect. Let's do say it, said Archer. Sister Osmond turned to meet the bland gaze of the two who had, from all appearances, been listening earnestly. Certainly no one could deny their pioneer spirit, Crispin said, without allowing a second's pause. Yes, I believe that's a sad lack in our own time. There is nothing left to explore. Those early trailbreakers are to be envied, sister. Sister Osmond's manner became that of one whose dignity will not permit her to nose frivolity. St. Aurelian's, as you see, is built in the form of a square, she stated, as if those tons of stone must not be encouraged to jig around into any other pattern. Nodding toward the artistic tangle of angel trumpets, hibiscus, jasmine, and a crybaby tree, which wept tears of sap, she explained, This is the convent garden. The contemplative nuns of our order often work here. Their garb is like ours, and you will not know them from us, except that they will not speak. You must not think them unfriendly. They have taken a vow of silence. Crispin might well have said something flippant then, but in time to restrain himself he caught Sister Osmond's expression. She was looking across the garden to the contemplative's house, and in her eyes there was such longing that she was transformed. The older man was astonished, but Franz understood. Once he had very nearly gone down such a sun-arched walk, and opened such a door, himself. For Sister Osmond, that silent life would have represented no sacrifice, the rigor of it no service, because it would be what she loved. To meet the world at the convent door, instead of withdrawing from it, to maintain her amiability while making explanations, apologies, and evasions all day long, there lay the sacrifice in the service. Even now, when she might be with the sisters chanting vespers in the chapel, she must lead around two intruders who said things behind her back. Franz was moved by a sympathy that Crispin could never experience, and he said after an instant, "'Don't stay with us, sister. Show us where the guest house is and go to prayers. We'll find our way.' The sister stirred with a wandering glance at Franz. So few ever understood, and to stumble upon this fellow feeling in anyone so worldly as the young man before her, was remarkable. She turned to lead the way out across the side lawn, her veil filling with the breeze, so that she bore on like a seasoned windjammer bound on an important mission. Franz endeavored to keep up with her, but Crispin lolled along, enjoying the first real view of convent grounds. Coming up from the main gates, he had been able to see only the imposing pale stone front of the convent, with the thickly matted foliage of the bayou, forming the west boundary, and the groves and orchards on the east but from this side lawn the farm buildings were in view, back beyond the cloister, an efficient little village in themselves, and farther on were the pastures. The girls have done well, real well, Crispin muttered to himself. The guest house settled snugly at the end of the east lawn where the orchard began was much to his liking. 
picturesque without sacrificing comfort he thought with approval it was squat and gave the illusion of being small but it was only an illusion from the centre of the roof rose a sturdy chimney the outlet for several fireplaces and over it two enormous pecans bent dropping their nuts with gentle taps upon the shingles sister osmond advanced no further than the flagstone walk this house is yours for the school year gentlemen she announced with her usual urbanity your meals will be served to you in a special dining room in the main building mr tolvertson knows he will show you the way as with mother theodore the mention of the artist alighted some inner fire and sister glowed for a moment before she came back to the matter at hand you are welcome to attend all our exercises in the chapel to-morrow we have an outdoor mass in the cemetery all souls day you know and in the evening a procession to the village burying grounds both lovely traditional observances now is there anything you wish with their polite protest ringing in her ears sister osmond departed a grey squirrel leaped from the roof in beautiful flight and sped after her along the walk lovely traditional observances all take place among the dead crispin remarked sounds like we hit the jackpot in gaiety this time well this is our new home my boy shall i carry you over the threshold franz did not answer over the bayou the sun was setting in a carnival display of color and against it the cypresses and live oaks were black a heron flew up his legs trailing and winged slowly away on the convent roof the pigeons told their last gossip of the day the cowbells jangled as the herd which was the pride of st aurelian's near the pasture gate but franz's eyes were on sister osmond's figure silhouetted on its passage through the arches of the cloister walk he waited until she was gone before he entered the house crispin was already standing in the middle of the spacious living room if he had taken in the comfort of blazing fire big chairs radio books and the lack of clutter that appeals to a man it had been at a glance for his profound attention was centered upon the man asleep on the davenport the sleeper lay flat on his back his sock feet cocked up on a pile of cushions his hands clasped across his stomach and he was snoring in deep rich tones even lying flat his roundness was apparent his cheeks were ruddy the smile wrinkles deep around his eyes there was a portly plumpness under the old-fashioned vest crossed by the heavy gold watch chain he was a typical uncle of the fairy tales the sort to rise up, eyes a twinkle, grizzled red gray hair on end, and inform every one that there was just time for a miracle before supper. So this is our Uncle Tor, Crispin said softly. He looks more like a genial farmer than an exponent of the arts. I bet my typewriter, the old guy's a fake. Franz was intrigued. How could he be? I mean, he came up from nothing, didn't he? I've heard his father was a fisherman, poor as a church mouse lived in a houseboat on the bayous. You've got to have something on the ball to get started. Of course, after a good start, you can get away with murder. Archer grinned. Ain't it the truth? The sleeper gave a snort which startled even himself. His eyes flew open and came to rest upon the pair solemnly looking down on him. Immediately he sat up, ran his hands through his hair so that he looked like a viking heading into adventure, and bounced to his feet. "'Gentlemen, you must excuse me. I'm an old man. I'm not yet rested from my journey. Mr. Archer, what a pleasure to meet you, sir. And young Mr. Eric. Well, well.' Tolwitson's cheeks plumped into a smile that nearly closed his eyes. He shook hands, he brought out cigars, he showed off the good points of the guest house, as if he were the official host, and yet, in his manner, there was nothing effusive, no false cordiality.' He liked people, all types and kinds of people, and the result was a warm-heartedness that overrode even Crispin Archer's cynicism. Back in the living room after a tour of the house, Archer bit the end of his cigar and grinned. I haven't smoked one of these in years, Tolwoltson. The artist was down on the floor hunting for his shoes. He sat back on his heels, chuckling delightedly. I buy a box of that particular brand whenever I need to remind myself that I'm a success. When Franz turned in astonishment, he nodded. Oh, yes, my boy, there are times without number when I wonder if Tolvotsen, the artist, might not have been a better blacksmith. That's when I buy the cigars my father used to provide for the grandfathers and all the uncles on Christmas. 
and the nostalgic Ramoma brings back the realization that I've risen from the poverty of those days. I haven't done badly. Something has always come up. Like this. He indicated the whole situation of St. Aurelian's with a smile and a shrug. So you didn't come here with any high intentions of spreading art through an indifferent world? Franz asked. I came because I needed the job, Tolwitzin said simply, and, having discovered his shoes, he sat where he was to put them on. I know nothing of the ups and downs of your profession, Mr. Eric, he resumed. Yours, Mr. Archer, I believe builds up a backlog for you, each new book adding to your income, while the previous publications continue to sell? Yes, but in my work it's quite different. I paint a picture, I sell it, and there you are. In order to sell again, I must paint again. So I am never finished, you see. It is what keeps me young. The statement had sounded in the beginning like a complaint, but ending as it did, it was confusing. In the days ahead, the two young men would come to expect the unusual from Uncle Tor, but not yet. Then you wouldn't be an artist if you had it to do over again, Mr. Trovoldson? Franz asked. The artist paused in the act of lacing one of his high top shoes. I didn't intend to imply that, Franz. I am what God and the devil made me. Exactly, said Crispin, almost as though he had been waiting for such a declaration. Tor looked up without a trace of a smile. If I were a blacksmith, I would still be an artist, just as a cypress board late in the floor is still cypress. And won't you call me Tor? It's born to too long a name. I've seen your masterpiece, Tor, Franz said abruptly. The old man laughed. Which one? But Franz was serious. The man walking alone along a woods road. You painted it in the north, I believe, because the woods are of brilliant autumn colors. I sat for an hour once studying it, and I don't know why. The figure is quite unremarkable, walking away from you. There is even a blueness around him that nearly hides him. All the light is on the trees. I painted it in Normandy, Tor said. He finished tying his shoelaces in a neat bow and clasped his arms around his knees. Every man walks his road alone, Franz, often in the shadow, although there is brilliant light above. That's why my picture fascinated you. You saw that man as yourself. I've seen people glance at it in the museum and pass on by, only to return with a somewhat puzzled air and study it as you say you did. It became so common a thing that the procurator finally put a bench at the proper distance from the picture and now the viewers can puzzle in comfort. Archer laughed and strolled into his bedroom to unpack. Some time later, he looked up to see Franz in the doorway. Chris, he's not a fake. Uncle Tor? Being an artist has little to do with it. Mother was right. It's the man that's great, not a lonely artist. His simplicity, honesty, his genuineness, those are what make him what he is, not his picture. Oh? said Crispin. I might argue several points there, my lad. Such as? Such as his description of himself as an old man. He's not, you know, only well past middle age. But his manner says, Be kind to me. I'm old. You must overlook any slight weaknesses or fancies I may have. And above all, protest that I'm not old. Oh, yes, indeedy. Franz scowled at the sport shirt Crispin held, pumpkin orange painted with moss green ducks. Are you going to wear that rig around here? Certainly. But getting back to the fatherly attitude, I believe I'll adopt it myself. Unless I sublimate my natural gifts, I'm afraid I'll have a dull time in these holy precincts. Tor admits he came here because he needs the job, Franz pursued. He was a lot more honest than we were. A rugged soul of vast integrity, said Crispin. Could be, but I bet he seldom spoils the effect by combing his hair. Laying the yellow shirt in a drawer of the high boy, he shot a sly glance at the frowning young man in the doorway. My reason for accepting Mother's bid is no secret, Franz. I like to be where I can work in peace and still be in close touch with people. These college kids are going to be people some day, and the ladies under the veils are unexpectedly individual. I am delighted with the whole setup. By the way, did you come because you can use the pesos too? Franz grunted a monosyllable that could have been denial. Then, light-footed as the squirrel that had followed Sister Osmond, he was gone. A door shut hard down the hall. 
In the living room, the great Tolvoltsen began to play the piano very badly. End of chapter 2「Three of Murder Takes the Veil » by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 3 Trillium was twenty, a convent young, dreamy twenty, and very happy. Not only was she happy because of the present moment, but because the future, as it met her and became the present, seemed to promise exactly what she wanted. Running down the stairs with her thin blue veil lifting around her face, Trillian paused on the landing to look over the eighty-two other veiled heads exactly like her own. Blue, if the promise came true, she would be wearing the white veil of the novice when another All Souls' Day gathered the convent company in the big main corridor. No one, as yet, knew of her secret hope, although Mother Theodore might have guessed. As soon as her mother's letter arrived with the expected permission, she would go to mother and ask to be admitted with the next class. The news, of course, would travel, and soon there would be about Trillium, that aura of awe surrounding all girls who had announced their intention of taking the veil. And the veil itself would be most becoming with her fresh complexion and dark eyes. "'What are you mooning about, Trill?' Mary Elizabeth called, fluttering a hand to distinguish herself from the masses. "'Come on, or you won't get in line with Helen and me.' Trillium sighed. There was nothing saintly about Mary Elizabeth, except the way she looked, her blonde hair and blue eyes accented by the veil. Helen, small and dark, was Trillium's twin in appearance, and her second inseparable companion. What these two would say when they knew of her decision to enter the convent, Trillium could well imagine. For ever since their freshman year, the three had planned to be bridesmaid at one another's wedding. Smiling mysteriously, Trillium descended, but her aloofness on the stairs had set her apart long enough to draw Sister Osmond's eye. "'The bouncer's sending out distress signals. I guess it's you, Trill,' Helen said. "'Hurry up and we'll keep a place for you.' Sister Osmond, looming large above the girls, held up a plain white envelope. Because the envelopes were always the same distinctive size, longer than an ordinary letter, Trillium knew even from a distance that her wait was over. Her mother had replied. "'You haven't time to read it now, dear, so you'll do an errand for me, won't you?' Sister Osmond suggested, handing her the letter along with a yellow envelope. "'This telegram just came from Mr. Archer. Run over to the guest house with it, and then go straight along to Mass.' "'Certainly, sister,' Trillian replied. She slipped her own letter into the pocket of her white dress. Mr. Archer's telegram felt important folded and thick in its envelope. It must be very long and very expensive. Sister Raymond passed her through the east door, and Trillian came out into the perfect morning. Behind her, the processional line moved smoothly through the open door on its way around the buildings and up along the bayou to the cemetery. She would have to hurry if she didn't want to be late, but the arrival of her mother's letter filled her with a peculiar sadness and a faint stirring that she did not recognize as apprehension. Her throat was tight with the excess of emotion possible only to the very young. I must be alone, she thought, alone in this first moment, and started slowly across the lawn toward the guest house. She could not face her friends, the dear friends whom she soon must leave behind. Surely renunciation would claim a few minutes, particularly when she had Sister Osmond to give her an alibi. Picturing her own lovely movements, she felt that she floated across the lawn. A tear, a crystal tear, cool on her cheek. It was embarrassing that one eye always wept more easily than the other, in these over-emotional moments. Enjoying herself immensely, she stood still, her eyes closed. If she had been gifted with second sight and a revelation of what lay in wait for her with the turning of the knob on the guest house door, Trillian would not have lingered in her romantic dream. She would have stood trembling, instead with eyes strained wide for final appreciation of the peaceful safety of St. Aurelian's, and she would have known then, also, that her supposed vocation was only affection for certain people, and a place and a routine, and a reluctance about leaving them all, an analysis that would have been gently made by Mother Theodore at the proper time. But Trillium wandered, still in her dream, down the flagged path and up the two steps to the tiny stoop, 
and knocked at the guesthouse door. There was no answer, no breath of sound from inside. From far over at the cemetery came the first chant of the asparagus, and Trillium knocked quickly again. When there was still no reply, she turned the handle of the door and entered. She was in a small hall from which opened several doors, all standing ajar. The first she investigated was the living room. How masculine it smelled already! Pipe smoke, leather, shoe polish, turpentine from Tolbertson's paints. The room was cluttered with several packing boxes, and their contents, piles of books, golf clubs, tennis rackets, a stack of canvases turned face to the wall, a beret, and two caps on the Davenport, the private possessions of all three tenants sprawled companionably together. It appeared to be a jumble that would remain as it was, granting the removal of the packing cases, and Trillian giggled. Why, they're all sloppy as can be, she said aloud. She could imagine Rindy, the colored maid, rolling her eyes and muttering when she came in to clean. Rindy was used to convent neatness. How would she ever work her way through this? Even the mantle was loaded with a pile of books, ashtrays, a can of tobacco, trinkets. Trillium's gaze tripped over an object and held it, fixed upon it. Her heart stopped for a matter of seconds, then gave a sudden flip and thumped until it shook her. The sisters had set a statue of St. Joseph in the place of honor, centering the mantle. Now beside him, his cat face smug and his paws embracing the world, was a six-inch silver image. The girl remained still, staring at it as if the thing had eyes to see her. She could not think. Her brain would not work. Only her heart was alive, choking her. How many minutes went by she never knew, for time had ceased. The clock tapping somewhere in the room did not warn her to hurry. Nothing existed but that hideous little god upon the mantel. She thought of his name first, Billikin, the god of things as they ought to be. And then she remembered that there are many Billikins, just as there are many Buddhas, and certainly there would be in the world more than one made of plaster and painted to look like silver. Of course this isn't the one, Trillium exclaimed, even laughing a little. The paralyzing fear eased. She went softly over to the mantel, never wondering why she should be warned to silence in the empty house. With her hand outstretched, she paused. What if this figure did have the mended break? It couldn't, but suppose it did. Wouldn't it be better not to know? Before her dread could mount again and stop her, Trillium seized the small god, felt him cool in her palm, and turned him around. She had known it would be there, the little brown vein of glue, the plaster chipped white along its edge. Her mother had said the blemish would not spoil Billiken. No one would ever notice. But now it was a brand. Trillium's hand left the figure to clutch the edge of the mantle. Memory was a wild thing, running loose. She saw her father, huge in the cramped quarters of the houseboat, desperate, grim, shouting that he would not have that bounder giving presents to his wife and her mother, small, dark-eyed like herself, emphasizing his roughness by her own withdrawal. He looked upon her silence as a taunt. He had knocked the billikin out of her hand and left with such tramping violence that the dishes rattled in the cupboard. Her mother had picked up the little figure, fitted in the broken part with glue, and that night Trillium had lain in bed, knowing her father had not come back, but hearing a whispered conversation in the next room, between her mother and the stranger she never had seen. The next day the billikin was gone. He had taken it, and brought it here. Trillium touched the god with a shaking finger, turning him back to his former position. It was imperative that she leave no trace of her presence. She dared not think farther now. She had to get out of this place. Stumbling over the litter, Trillium was at the door before she remembered the telegram. She had been going to lay it on the table. That was what brought her in. The table, like every available surface, was burdened. With a sweep of her arm, she knocked a pile of books to the floor, then picked up one and propped the telegram against it. Then she fled. An onlooker would have concluded that Trillium ran so swiftly because she was late for Mass. A second glance would have set him wondering what punishment the sisters inflicted on latecomers, for this girl was obviously in terror. It was a terror, however, that had nothing to do with tardiness. As she ran, a sickening realization came to Trillium. 
She did not know the present identity of Billiken's owner. She never had seen the man on that one night. His name, she knew, had been Jim. None in the swamp, never even heard his voice above the whispering of the three, was named Jim. Yet, Billiken was here. Had he changed his name, or given the trinket to someone else? To Archer, Eric, or Tolvutsen? Trillian forgot to slow down and catch her breath before actually coming into the cemetery, and so she was still panting from her exertions when she hesitated at the beginning of the long, open aisle. The scene was beautiful, familiar, and it called up inconsequential things. Old Sister Hattin's conviction that it would rain, the stout optimism of the farmhand's wife, Glory Muckleroy, and Glory's faith had triumphed. The morning was ideal for the outdoor mass, the sunlight infusing golden life into the magnificent stone crucifix with its figure drooping above the altar. Flanking it were the tombs of the sisters, dazzling white from recent cleaning, each bank with chrysanthemums, which reflected a sunlight of their own. The girls in white with their blue veils, the sisters in a protective cohort of freshly pressed brown and black, the white-veiled novices unobtrusively at one side, the Muckleroys with all their children, every employee and inhabitant of St. Aurelian's was in attendance, and, ending the far curve of the crescent, the three new instructors, all down on one knee, Franz Eric with his head bent, the other two observing the ceremony with solemn interest. Trillium, still at the end of the aisle, knew she couldn't walk the distance she must to reach Helen and Mary Elizabeth and the place they had kept for her. She would be too conspicuous. He might be attracted by the movement among all those quiet people, look over, ask afterward who she was, and he would know her name. No one was named Trillium. It's all right, dear. Go on. Sister Osmond whispered, close to her, and the girl realized she had been standing there much too long. She would have to go. She started up the aisle. What did it matter if he did find out who she was? That old incident was over, if death could be termed an incident. Tovoltsen glanced towards her, then Archer. Her eyes skidded away to the priest, to the blue veils, to Mary Elizabeth's profile, turned as far as permissible without looking back. The scene grew misty. So near did she come to fainting, but she kept moving with the peculiar sensation of the ground rolling toward her, while she herself stood still. The congregation arose, and Trillium, sheltered, slipped in front of Mary Elizabeth to her place. Helen passed over a missile. When the girl took it, the thin pages fluttered, and Mary Elizabeth put out a hand to steady her. It was not unheard of for girls to faint at Mass, particularly when they had gone long without breakfast, and there were no chairs to sit on. "'I'm all right,' Trillian whispered. And, almost miraculously, she was. With commonplace sights and sounds around her, Trillian regained enough self-confidence to draw away from her apprehension and look at it clearly. In the first place, there was no certainty whatever that the Billikins still belonged to Jim, or that, because the little god sat on the mantle of the guest house, Jim must be one of the three new instructors. Someone might even have given the image to Mother Theodore, who had placed it where it was. But that was too far-fetched an idea to entertain. Mother would not set Billikin up to rub shoulders with St. Joseph. She would go to Mother Theodore and tell her the whole terrible story, the tragic part Jim had played in her life, her suspicion that he was here on the campus. And Mother would listen earnestly, and a few days later would call Trillium in and tell her it had all been explained. I need not bother my mother with it all, the girl decided, and touched the letter in her pocket. For the moment she had forgotten the pleasure in store for her. Mother Theodore would be pleased to hear of another vocation. There were so few these days. By the time the mass was over, Trillium had nearly recaptured her earlier expectancy. In the crowd breaking to straggle back into the building, she was able to lose Helen and Mary Elizabeth. They would insist that she go with them straight to the dining room for breakfast, and she couldn't. She had to read her letter. Alone she ran across the lawn to the west door, up the stairs, along the corridors to her room in the east wing, and locked herself in. Throwing herself on the bed, she tore open the envelope. She had been smiling in anticipation when she began to read, but at the first line the smile stiffened. Hastily she skimmed through it, dazed and fearful bewilderment growing in her eyes. Oh, no! 
she breathed once. But there it was in her mother's writing, not to be denied. A fit of trembling seized her, and she rolled over on the bed, the letter crackling under her. She didn't cry. When she could sit erect again, she picked up the crushed page and forced herself to read it through deliberately. As she read, the cold stillness inside her grew until it kept her even from trembling any more. My darling, I fear this letter will come as a shock to you, but there seems to be no way I can spare you. I must disappear again. The truth is, dear, that Jim is somewhere in the vicinity of New Orleans and has been trying to find me. It must be that he suspects I am coming close to the evidence I need to prove that he killed your father. I have known all these years that your father did not commit suicide, but there was no proof. Now we are in search of a witness, who must have seen the whole thing happen. I cannot tell you more about it now, dear, but it will be a satisfaction for you to know that your father was blameless. I can't pretend I'm not in danger, because I am, but I'm taking every precaution. Jim is blaming me for what he did himself. All these years his fury has grown against me. I think now that he was keeping silent in order for me to build up a security he could destroy. No matter what happens, dear, say nothing. My life may depend upon this. Nothing could happen to you there, and it is a great comfort to me to know you're safe, and I know what he is doing. Above all, dear, don't mention this to Mother Theodore, and please don't worry. Henry will forward my letters to you as usual. There was a little more, a few lines about the mother's happiness in giving a daughter to God. The daughter, however, lay curled upon her bed in a tight ball of fear, tears filling her head to bursting before they finally soaked into the pillow, the blue veil pathetically crumpled across her face. Against her closed lids she saw two figures, her mother, sad-eyed and remorseful, a hunted victim, and the silver billiken smirking on the guesthouse mantel. No longer was she in doubt as to the identity of Billiken's owner. It was Jem, Jem who now bore a name her mother had not known when she read Trillium's account of the three, whose arrival had then been imminent. Say nothing, no matter what happens. Only what could happen in the security of St. Aurelian's. Nothing, except that her father's murderer had taken up residence on the campus. The girls were wandering up to change into skirts and sweaters for the day. Someone knocked on Trillium's door called, rattled the knob, and went away. Trillium lay still. She had an enormous welter to think through. Once she picked up the letter again to reread a certain sentence. Above all, don't mention this to Mother Theodore. But why? Mother was so good, so wise, so... The girl checked her rebellion swiftly. Always she had been an obedient daughter, not only because she loved her mother, but because the two were alone in the world and their first loyalty was to one another. That was the way it had to be, else each would stand entirely alone. All that was necessary had been put into the letter. Reasons, of course, would be satisfying, but not required for her obedience. So now I cannot go to Mother Theodore. Julia made herself hammer home the thought. Very well, what then? Write to Uncle Henry? No, because the word would be passed along to her mother and there was no point in adding to her worries yet. She might even come to St. Aurelian's, if she knew, and Jim would have his opportunity. A seizure of trembling shuddered through her, so that under her the bedspring made timorous little noises. I'll have to decide a course for myself and follow it, Trillium told herself firmly. Mother Theodore would approve of that. Even though I can't consult her, I can act as I think she would advise. The girl sat up, seeing herself in the dressing-table mirror, pink-cheeked and eyes with a deep-washed look of recent tears. She had changed in seven years, grown from a little girl with a Dutch bob into a young lady with a fashionably long haircut and lipstick. He would never associate the child with this college senior, unless he heard her name. "'I'll manage so he won't,' she whispered, watching her lips in the mirror. "'I'm really too dumb to take on anything extra,' So Sister Omfra will think I'm just being sensible when I ask to be dropped from the art class. I'll say I need all my time for my other studies. And if I don't take a class from any of them, he'll never hear my name. I'm not pretty enough or brilliant enough to draw attention, thank heaven. People don't talk about unremarkable other people when they are very remarkable people themselves. 
I'll just be one of the crowd, and he'll never know me. And the minute he gives himself away, so I'm sure of which one he is, I'll telephone to Uncle Henry and tell him to get out the bloodhounds. Trillian jumped off the bed and began to pull the hidden bobby pins out of her veil. Jim probably had no intention of harming her, but he might try to pump her, to find out where her mother had gone. Well, he'll see what a clam I can be, she declared aloud. I'll be so perfectly naturally uninterested that none of those three geniuses will ever notice me. I bet they're all too stuck up to see us, anyway. The jocular air of the girl in the mirror was pure bravado, but it helped. Trillium folded the veil, pulled off her dress, and got into a rose sweater and tweed skirt. She herself was in no predicament. She could not ask Mother Theodore to receive her into the convent, not until she knew what this billiken gem business involved. But after all, that meant only a postponement. A faint relief accompanied the thought, but Trillium was not yet ready to admit it was the dream that had intrigued her, and that the reality was more than a little frightening. In the pit of her stomach there was a queer emptiness as if her fear had made a vacuum. "'Golly, I'm hungry!' she exclaimed, and slammed open a drawer to hunt for her rose anklets. She had missed the late breakfast, and there would be no other refreshments until the middle of the afternoon, when the juniors served their traditional tea in the parlors. Down in the kitchen, the food committee would be at work, cutting out sandwiches in the shape of stars and crescents. Fancy tidbits would not do for Trillium. She would get the kids to make up a whopper, and she could take it out into the shade and have a private picnic. She was fairly light-hearted when she opened her desk and slipped the letter in. Then, frantically, she snatched it back. Hide it in her desk when anyone coming in to borrow some paper might see a line or two and wonder, and run to mother. All her fragile self-confidence gone, Trillium sank down on the little study chair. So this was how it would be. The one big decision to keep her secret would not suffice. There must be a constant watch for small slips, an endless sly planning to make all her actions seem normal, when every minute she carried the most unnatural burden in the world, fear for the life of a beloved one. I can't do it, she thought wildly. I can't. I'll run away, deep into the swamp, until the mud sucks me down, and I can crawl under the cypress knees. I'll know, there, if anyone follows, I'll hear the splash and plop in the mud. But she couldn't run away because then they would hunt for her, and her name would be shouted all over the campus. No, she must not show by word or action that she had anything on her mind. All she need do was watch and be careful. Through the entire school year he might remain quietly following the schedule Mother had worked out for him, and never suspect Trillium's identity. And so long as he was here, he could not be endangering her mother. Oh, I can make a million pesky little plans if I have to she breathed. It's worth anything. I can do it. Trillium seized the letter, about to tear it into bits. With the first split in the edge of the paper, she paused, staring at it. She could not destroy the letter, the only evidence in the world outside of her mother's knowledge that her father had not committed suicide, and it pointed out his murderer. The memory of what she had almost done with the letter, placing it in her desk for anyone to see, was shattering and she pricked herself several times as she fastened the envelope inside her slip with two large safety pins. The girls did not intentionally pry into anything. It was just that you might walk across the lawn and meet your green anklet and your charm bracelet and your sweater, each on a different person, and at the same time yourself be wearing things belonging to two other people, and all the articles would have been secured by simply going and taking them. No one minded. So you'll stay there, honey, until I know what to do with you, Trillium said, patting the letter in her bosom. Her appetite was gone, and the emptiness giving her a clear-headed detachment, quite removed from physical sensation or emotion. She knew now exactly what to do. Since it was a holiday, many of the girls had gone into Marysville, and would not return until time for the tea. Sister Onfroy was not in her office. Trillium found her out in the cloister walk pacing slowly with her rosary in her hand. Sister Armfroy was the registrar, and therefore accustomed to dealing with changes of mind. She listened to Trillium's apparently frank account of troubles with chemistry and history, the prodigious amount of time it took to do these subjects justice, and finally her invention of frequent headaches. The headaches were a mistake. 
You need a lot more fresh air, child, said Sister Enfoy. Something to take you outside, you see. None of you get outside enough. I couldn't sign you up for tennis. I'm sure there are already too many for the one court. But I'll put you into golf and fencing. Won't that be nice, dear? Oh, sister, I don't believe... Trillium began. You don't look well, not at all well. Trillium tucked her hand under the brown serge elbow. I'm perfectly fine, sister. Only a headache once in a while, but not very often. I mean, I'm really in wonderful health. I'd love the golf and fencing, but... Then you shall have them, Sister Enfoy declared. Mr. Eric is an exceptionally fine instructor. I've wondered why he consented to come here. Oh, don't misunderstand, child. I feel that he will profit as well as ourselves. But still, Mother showed us those wonderful pictures of him taken at last year's Mardi Gras. I believe he was king of the parade, and... The sister wheeled suddenly keen to Trillium. Why don't you want to take these instructions from him, dear? Trillium was startled. Oh, but I do, sister. It's sweet of you to put me in like this at the last minute, and I just appreciate it heaps. I know I'll feel better being out in the fresh air. And, sister, if you wouldn't mention to Mr. Eric that I signed up so late, well... Sister Enfoy patted her hand. Of course I won't. He doesn't need to know he was an afterthought. Drop into my office in the morning and I'll have your schedule ready. Trillium thanked her and escaped. I couldn't have done much worse if I'd thought it out for a million years, she ruminated bitterly. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. Or was it? Wasn't Mr. Eric too young to be Jem? Helen, smitten already, had been conjecturing about his age in the shower room this morning, and had started a discussion in which no two people agreed. The only unanimous sentiment being that he was the type, with his dark good looks and gracefulness, to look young until he was fifty. So he was old enough. That the fencing and golf entailed individual instruction had intrigued the girls this morning. To Trillium it was the most formidable detail. In the art class, Tolvoldson might have come to look over her shoulder, perhaps criticize her work. But his attention would be more upon the drawing than upon herself. Mr. Eric, on the other hand, would be concerned with her stance in golf, her grip of a sword, and she dare not drop the course now. Already she had drawn far too much notice from Sister Enfoy, who might pass the word on to Mother Theodore, and Mother would question her. Trillian was so weary that her apprehension turned to rebellion against this circumstance, which bound her like Prometheus to the rock. Reaching her own room again, she lay down, and in spite of her worries, fell asleep. The supper bell woke her. She had a dull pounding ache in the top of her head. Because I fibbed about it, she thought drowsily, and this is my punishment. As she lay there, half awake, the ache seemed to be the billikin doing setting up exercises inside her skull. Fingernails rattled on her door, and Mary Elizabeth poked her head in. Trill, where have you been all day? We missed you at the tea. What's the matter? Nothing, Trillium yawned. I had a nap. Well, you look like you could stand a few morsels. Helen's just about ready. Meet us on the stairs, will you? The blonde head was withdrawn. Trillium got up, put on too much lipstick, fixed her hair, and wondered how she could keep from being conspicuously ill. The ordeal of marching to the cemetery tonight, with his eyes upon her, would be too great an endurance test after all she had gone through during the day. I'll not go, she decided abruptly, and opened her door. Sister Laurent, the prefect, who supervised the girls on this floor, was just passing. At the sight of Trillium she stopped short. My dear child, how ill you look! And on this night of all nights! I was a little worried about Kathy Thatcher. You know how she reacts to overexcitement. But I never thought of you. Sister Laurent bit her fingers as she always did when perturbed. No tragedy could be more complete than to miss the old soul's procession to the Marysville Cemetery. I'm not at all ill, sister, Trillium said quickly, but her brown eyes were wide with alarm, and she glanced past the sister into the deep shadows. I'm tired. You know how you get a lot of tiredness piled up. I think I'll stay at home tonight and read. Sister Laurent bit her finger so hard that she winced. 
Trillium, of all people, chattering about staying at home with a book, when she hated reading and had been known to write book reports on movies she had seen. She hadn't even been considered for Mr. Archer's class in creative writing, and as for reading... Trillium, you seem to be afraid, Sister Lawrence said quietly. The sister was young, her own school days not many years behind her, and she was used to keeping the girls' little secrets. But Trillium apparently had no intention of confiding in her. Such a spasm of terror passed over the young face that Sister Laurent involuntarily glanced around them. I don't understand, Trillium, she said in apology, but of course you needn't go to the cemetery tonight if you're not up to it. I'll stay with you. I don't mind at all. My brother sent me a box of chocolates and we'll... Trillium smiled, but not before the shadow had flitted again over her face. No, I'll go, sister. I'll feel much better after supper. Thank you for offering to stay with me, but I'm going to be right there with the others. As she hurried after Helen and Mary Elizabeth before the sister could protest. Stay at home with a sister in attendance to emphasize her unusual behavior? Oh, no, there must be nothing out of the ordinary, Trillium warned herself. In the twilight, with a flickering light of candles as the only illumination, dressed exactly like the others in long white with a wreath of flowers, she would be one of the crowd again. It was unnerving to realize how nearly she had blundered once more. Her tension gave her a false gaiety, and through supper she laughed and talked with animation. But when supper was over, she ran up the back stairs to her room and dressed quickly even to the final touch of fastening the wreath in her hair. She looked lovely but she didn't take the customary pleasure in it. Only one concern occupied her now. She had to get out of the building without seeing Sister Laurent, because Sister had not been satisfied with their conversation, and she might decide it would be wise for Trillium to go quietly to bed. How lucky, she thought, as she let herself out into the hall, that she had no roommate, no one to question her. Through the closed door next to her own, she heard the giggling of Helen and Mary Elizabeth and across the hall where five girls roomed together there was a waterfall of laughter. Trillian walked slowly to the stairs leading down to the main floor, then caught up her long white skirt and sped down. It didn't matter much where she went, for when the belt ordered the forming of the procession she would join it, and every woman would be too excited to ask where she had been. Coming out at the west entrance, she half turned into the cloister walk, but over at the far end of the lawn the bayou lay in primeval elegance. Trillium stepped onto the green grass. Primeval elegance was her own term, and she had used it in a description of the bayou, which had fascinated Sister Raymond into giving her the only A she ever had had on a theme. Thinking of that proud achievement, Trillium raised her white skirt daintily above the grass and drifted along. This was not like the dream of the morning, when she had crossed the lawn to the guest house, but only the inevitable reaction of youth to the pleasure of the moment. Under it, pricking her, was the sharpness of what she knew. When she reached the soggy ground bordering the water, she turned to the right to stroll behind the contemplative's house. This was the least used part of the grounds. Farther over, directly behind the convent enclosure, were the farm buildings. No one came here except High Muckleroy cutting the grass. It was startling, then, for Trillium to have the impression that she was being watched. She stopped dead still, one foot forward for another step. Her eyes started over the lawn to the distant row of Glory Muckleroy sunflowers rooming her garden back to the solid wall. No one there, yet her scalp had needles dancing on it. Then to the swamp, and she saw the man standing precariously on a cypress knee, poised as if he mocked his own danger. He had watched her come clear across the lawn, and that, she thought, is how a spider sits watching a fly draw near its web. Mr. Eric did not appear in the least spiderish. There was a sleepy air about him, like that of an interrupted reverie, and Trillium caught herself wondering if his charming half-smile had been directed at the cypresses before she came along. Not wishing to appear frightened, she clasped her hands before her and gave a small nod. Mr. Eric, she said softly, Good evening, mademoiselle. I see you are not afraid of snakes, sir. The bayou is full of water moccasins. His eyebrows went up as if amused, but she was gratified to observe that he glanced somewhat apprehensively into the twilight under the trees. The fluted cypress trunks streaked high before the foliage began, 
and across the floor of the swamp were thick gray roots thrust up like knees above the water to allow the trees to breathe. That there was water at all was hard to see, for it was hidden under a bulbous tangle of hyacinths. Mr. Eric, Trillium thought, must have leaped from that last bit of solid shore to his perch on the knee. But even as she thought it, he stepped lightly off to the thickly woven plants, and then to the dry land. The frail blossoms were barely crushed. Trillium stared wide-eyed at Franz Eric. With pleasure he returned her inspection. In short-sleeved white, with a long skirt touching the grass, dark hair crowned with white flowers, and a childlike mingling of alarm and admiration banishing whatever sophistication she might have had, Trillium was lovely. "'You might have gone through,' she exclaimed. "'The hyacinths aren't solid enough to walk on.' "'I'll remember that next time,' said Franz. The child was entrancing. Something about her seemed familiar. His own young sister? He shook his head. Trillium, fearing that the conversation might take a personal turn, and he would ask her name, hurried into the first subject that crossed her mind. "'I'm glad you like Pirate Cove, Mr. Eric. It's named for a real pirate, Dominic Yu, one of the Lafitte gang from Grand Isle. There were no hyacinths in those days, of course. They were brought from Japan much later for an exposition, and some of the planters set them out in the bayous, and they ran wild. When Dominic and his men escaped up here in a skiff, the water was clear, and it was a perfect spot to elude capture. The men were given coffee in the convent kitchen, and Mother Adrian entertained Dominic in her own parlor. Really? Franz encouraged her. The same parlor where we were received, no doubt. Trillium let her hand steal up to cover her heart, for it was pounding so that the tiny white buttons on her dress quivered. Mr. Eric's scrutiny had become something she could not read, and her chin went up. The story is true, sir. Dominic Yu is a tradition with us. He was a very respectable pirate. He was the only one to go into business later in New Orleans and be buried in a tomb with his name on it. I've seen it myself. Franz bowed, hiding his smile. Sorry, mademoiselle, I don't doubt your veracity. I was merely picturing Mother Adrian, was it, serving her thick French coffee to the respectable pirate. If she resembled Mother Theodore, it would have been well worth seeing. Oh, said Trillium rather flatly. She must go. The speculative light in Mr. Eric's eye was growing by the minute. The bell in the convent garden clanged. Never had its insistence been more welcome. "'Good-bye, Mr. Eric,' she said with a second note of the bell, and turned to run across the lawn. "'But you haven't told me your name.' "'Sister Laurent will scold if I'm late for the procession. Good-bye.' Like Dominic you, Trillium fled, but where the pirate's pursuers had paddled swearing through the swamp, Trillium supposed one did not pursue at all. When she looked back from the corner of the convent, she saw that he was still standing watching her. Franz laughed aloud. He had hoped she would look back. The moment the white figure vanished, he was off around the back of the cloister toward the guest house. The white ranks were a refuge. Trillian caught up her candle and chrysanthemums from the table, where Sister Ignace was dealing them out, and chilling the flame with her hand, she took her place beside Helen. "'Where were you, Trill?' Mary Elizabeth, behind her, breathed down her neck. "'We can't talk now. We're starting.' The pitch-pipe wheezed, the singers began, and the procession moved slowly down the road to the big gates. In the village cemetery a half-mile away, the people heard the singing and saw the train of candle flames, and became as quiet as one person. When the procession came in among the tombs, even the unbelievers were impressed. As it wound along the paths that were the streets of this miniature city, one girl after another turned aside to place a burning candle and her flowers before the tomb of a friend or relative. Passing the place where Tolbertson, Franz, Eric, and Crispin Archer stood, many faces were shadowed, Trillium's among them, because she laid her memorial before the first neglected tomb she saw. Franz, watching for her, and Crispin, watching them all, did not see her, for as she passed them she looked quite naturally away toward a monument topped with angels spreading their wings. In the semi-darkness she had many twins. It's unearthly towards inside. No man could paint these young faces and do them justice. Trillium heard him. She held her head turned away, 
very still don't be afraid don't stumble don't draw their attention take one step then another was that how daniel forced himself to enter the lion's den End of chapter 3「4 of Murder Takes the Veil」by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 4 Sister Aloysius, who did errands in addition to her duties in the bookstore, trudged by the student's dining room, paused, and returned to write a message on the blackboard beside the door. Trillium, a delivery for you in the office not bothering to sign it because all the girls knew her square block writing she put down the chalk and tramped on her feet hurt and there were too many errands to be done up in the auditorium sister raymond sat watching the rehearsal of act one of mustard seed the annual play coming just before the christmas holidays was the cultural high point of winter so far as audience approval was concerned sister raymond had no doubt of the play's success let the doting relatives see their darlings walk across the stage without falling flat on their faces, and the universal verdict would be that it was all just lovely. But Sister Raymond was a perfectionist, not only for God, because she did his work, must everything be perfect, but to satisfy her own impeccable requirements. We'll get it right, we'll get it right, she kept assuring herself fighting back the bugbear which for the past half hour had been nipping ever larger mouthfuls out of her belief in mustard seed he was a silent bugbear the great tolwartson seated beside her with his chin in his hand his attention so profound that it could almost be drawn in straight lines to the stage like the obvious art of the funny paper but his silence was a threat like everyone else on the campus who had come in contact with him sister raymond was finding his great simplicity not at all simple to meet almost she reflected nervously it was a monstrous characteristic because it impelled him to say exactly what he thought kindly and sincerely but nevertheless with the stubbornness of complete conviction there was the matter of the studio sister remembered with a shudder she had heard the story direct from sister osmond whose graciousness had been ineffective for once the artist had taken one look at the cosy small room flooded with sunshine nicely curtained carpeted furnished with easy chairs and a polished mahogany table and was now installed at his own insistence over a barn-like storage room over the gymnasium in the wing jutting out into the convent garden no curtains cold north light no rugs an old pine top table and a collection of waste baskets across one unbroken wall of that studio sister raymond pondered a huge canvas was hung awaiting the artist's inspiration to become the backdrop for the last act of Mustard Seed. The other acts were being done against a sky drop with set pieces in the form of church spires, trees, and rocks. But the last act required something more, something to set off the climax of the play. But if Tolvoldsen didn't like the play, he would say so, in his magnificently simple way, and the result might be no backdrop. Sister Raymond shot a glance at him around her coif. He was so intent now that he was whistling through his nose. But her movement broke in upon his concentration. She shivered, reminding herself that his verdict would probably be an excellent furthering of her humility. "'Beautiful,' he murmured. "'Oh!' "'Not the play, no.' "'Oh.' "'No, the play is rather bad, but the girls cannot be anything but beautiful. Not because they act well, or speak well, or sing nicely, for some of them are atrocious. No, but because of what they are. Youth is a beautiful thing in itself. You'll know that, sister, when you are as old as I am. You see, they are not playing at acting, hope and faith. They hold those wonders in their youth. His eyes were upon the two girls who played the parts of hope and faith, Trillian Pierce and Helen Perry, coming hand in hand to downstage center in a challenge to their own destruction. They would not be destroyed, of course, Buffeted by all the wickedness the playwright could call up, they would persevere through two more acts and stand triumphant at the final curtain. Sister Raymond, rebellious over Tolwoodson's frankness, listened to the stilted, poetic lines the girls were speaking, 
and knew that he was right. The whole production, however, we chalked up as another success in St. Aurelian's endless repertoire of successes, because the audience would pay small heed to what their daughters said. That they spoke at all would be enough. Sister Raymond turned to Tolbertson with the idea of making some sort of apology for what she had been thinking, but the words never were spoken. The artist, his hair on end, was leaning forward, his gaze fastened on one of the girls so intently that the sister was struck with a curious sense of violence. Startled, she traced his attention to the stage, to Trillian Pierce, young Hope, who stood lilting her lines. Sister Raymond, rigid with surprised disapproval, made no movement. Yet the man swung around to look straight into her eyes. "'I do not know the girl,' he said softly. "'I am unacquainted with all but a few who attend my classes.' Sister Raymond's mouth opened and closed, but she could not speak. To her great relief, Tolvitson again turned his eyes to the stage with the mien of any interested observer. "'Now for the backdrop, sister. I believe in immensity of purple shadow.' He talked on in a low voice, Sister Raymond nodding at a few of the right times. The backdrop was now a matter of minor importance, pushed into obscurity by the burning question of whether or not she should report to Mother on Mr. Tolvitson's upsetting behavior. Was this the raising of the viper's head, which Mother had dreaded from the first moment? At his age— Sister Raymond realized that the stage manager had called Last Curtain several minutes ago, and she took advantage of the law to leave her place. I'll dismiss them and be right back, Mr. Tovoltson. I think your idea for the design is splendid. She hurried down the aisle. Now listen, girls. Sister Gaspard is ready for a costume fitting in the sewing room. The sister's mind went automatically along the well-known grooves, and behind them she came to a conclusion that had nothing to do with mustard seed. Since the Christmas season was always a rush, and hardly the time to bother Mother with vague assumptions, she would put Tolbertson on probation, a sort of parole under her own surveillance. So long as he behaved, she would say nothing. But let him make one misstep, and every lift of an eyebrow would be promptly recounted to Mother. Sister was so cheered by this resolution, that when the girls filed out, she went back to the discussion of the backdrop in a receptive frame of mind. And so gallantly did Mr. Tolvoltson behave, that when they parted some time later, she had forgotten about the probation. "'Trillium, I saw your name on the blackboard,' said Nerissa Brady, as the cast left the stage. Sister Laurent would have recognized the expression that tightened the girl's mouth. "'Was it—what was it, Nerissa?' I didn't notice. Something about the office. You'd better go see. Oh, I will, right away. But Trillium knew she couldn't. Her knees were shaking too badly, and she sank down on the stage steps. What could there be in the office to add to her burden of fear? Nothing, she told herself. Nothing. And yet the gaunt emptiness remained with her, as the manifestation of dread she had come to know so well during the days since all souls. They had been busy days, and that had helped. But there was always night when she lay wakeful, tired, and yet afraid to sleep because of the horrible dreams. She rubbed her forehead wearily. In a moment she would get up and go along to the sewing room where Sister Gaspard awaited them, and afterward she could see what the message read. That would be time enough. Listen, Gaspard hasn't got the patience of Job. Come on, said Helen Perry dragging Trillium to her feet. I'm just dead, but honestly dead. It takes so much out of one, doesn't it? I don't know whether I could go in for a career as an actress, but with a terrific impulse burning you, just actually burning you like a flame, it might be worse not to release it, don't you think, Trill? Helen sighed reverently. Then her butterfly thought flitted to a new blossom, as she caught Trillium's arm, laughing, her eyes glowing. Want to keep a secret with me? I've asked him to the play, and he's coming. Who's coming, Nell? Oh, honestly, Howard! Don't you remember that fascinating older man I danced with so much at the freshman mixer? Allison's brother? Trillium laughed. An older man? Howard Cooper is only about twenty-four. 
Twenty-five, and he's the most heavenly dancer. I happened to mention him in a letter to my mother, and she answered, By registered mail, imagine, that I'm not to see him any more during the school year. But my goodness, all I've ever been out with him is to one movie in Marysville, and it was the early show, too. That certainly can't distract me too much. But I promised, of course, and I'm not breaking my promise now, because everybody will be here at the play. And if he comes, well, I have to be careful, because I don't want my mother taking steps. I get what you mean, said Trillium. The whole of last year had been enlivened by the parade of Helen's boyfriends. Most of them young football players who became red-faced and speechless in the select confines of the visitor's parlor. Once toward mid-year, Helen had been caught almost in the act of eloping, and Mrs. Perry had indeed taken steps. No novice was more severely guarded now than the young Miss Perry. "'Howard is an older man,' she repeated with a pertness that her mother would have called spunky. "'I certainly have a right to lead my own life.' and I'm absolutely not going to tell him not to come. That would be too childish. After all, Mother Theodore is always urging us to make decisions for ourselves. Why, my own mother was married and had me when she was my age. But honestly, they all seem to forget that they were young once. It's the most disgusting. Good afternoon, sister. They were at the door of the sewing room, now filled with girls in their slips and girls already in their costumes. Above the noise, Sister Gaspar gave out orders and advice and reprimands. At the calmest of times, her voice was pitched to the stridency of a rescuer calling a ship in single-handed out of the fog, a trait which, in conjunction with her general brawn, had moved an imaginative girl to nickname her the Virgin Most Powerful. "'All right, girls, all right,' boomed Sister Gaspard. "'Helen and Trillium, your faith and hope? All right, Ivy, where are their dresses?' Ivy, a meek little sophomore, who daily considered changing her major from home economics to something that would not involve Sister Gaspard, scuttled to the long rack where drifts of chiffon and tulle hung. "'Oh, aren't they the most divinely yummy things?' Helen exclaimed, pulling off her sweater. "'And they're exactly alike. Which is mine, Ivy?' "'Your faith, aren't you? This one with the pink veil. Trillium's veil is blue.' Isn't that sweet? Hope and faith, wandering through the world in pink and blue. Such innocent colors. Sister sure let herself go this time, Mary Elizabeth said admiringly. She wasn't the only one, said Ivy. What well, we've gone through. I've sewed until I feel like the song of the shirt. But she does twice as much herself. Every time I decide to get out of home ec, I get kind of a vision of the most powerful tearing around, doing more than can be expected of mortal man, and I wind up with a rededication ceremony among my pots and pans. Doggone it, she added thoughtfully. Trillium, diverted by the Amazon accomplishments of Sister Gaspard, felt safe and secure. Safety in numbers was a cliché, because it was true. In the crowded, busy college life lay her perfect refuge. All right, girls, all right. Sister Gaspard in tone. Quiet, please. With one hand under her scapular, like Napoleon in the historic pose, she waited until Ivy wanted to drop a pin and hear the crash. All right, now. Your costumes are finished, girls. The sewing classes have done a beautiful piece of work, right down to the final pressing. Since the dress rehearsal is tomorrow afternoon at four, I'm turning the costumes over to you now, and each of you will be responsible for her own. And notice I say responsible. Her head turned deliberately so that in spite of the limited field of vision enforced by her coif, her inspection covered every young lady before her. The dressing rooms are crowded, but there are racks provided where you may hang the costumes. There will be no excuse for damage to any. Senior girls will use the dressing room to the right of the stage, juniors and all others on the left. Any questions? No, sir, the girls murmured. All right, then, you may go. Oh, one more word. If, I say if, there should be an accidental tear of any costume, bring it straight to me. That is all. The room filled again with chatter, and under cover of it, Ivy murmured, All right, girls, all right. 
but if you rip something i positively dare you to dump it in my lap to mend don't worry we'd drown ourselves in the bayou first helen assured her come on trill hurrying to the backstage dressing room then along the hall to the bulletin board trillium tried to keep down her apprehension it could be a perfectly meaningless message it could be but it wasn't she read it then read it again a delivery and she knew what the delivery would be i never thought of that she whispered huh trill you look like you're going to faint helen cried i'll get sister trillium grabbed the tail of her sweater i'm fine now too many rehearsals that's all i'll go to the office later but it's right on our way upstairs why don't we stop now i think something's wrong with you trill honestly you look scared no trillium said sharply and forced a laugh but it was not a success no i'm not scared i just know what the delivery is she paused took a long breath to steady herself and continued it's only my coat sent out from the furriers in marysville i stored it with him this summer only your coat that heavenly thing listen missus we're picking it up this very minute i'm dying to see it again and helen pulled her along so that trillium dared not hang back i've done the wrong thing again the frightened girl thought made a fuss over getting the coat and brought about the exact opposite of what i intended leave the coat where it was that had been her impulse take it up later when she could be alone and she could push it into the back of her closet without even opening the box no one would ask about it but now helen would go around gushing over it and if she told helen to keep quiet that would arouse suspicion and there would be talk about trillium's strange behavior and the coat must not be seen on the campus there was no time to think further already they were outside of the suite which consisted of outer office private office and mother's parlor helen threw back her shoulders head up my child radiate womanly vitality be a credit to st aurelians the door of the inner office was closed and from behind it came a voice in a masculine register on one of the well-polished uncomfortable chairs sister lawrence sat waiting good afternoon sister said helen the sister did not hear her in the doorway behind helen trillium stood listening in evident terror her eyes shadowed with it as they had been on the night of all souls what is it dear sister exclaimed the girl remained staring at the closed door and it was helen who answered we came for her package sister i see it here on the mail table maybe there's a letter for one of us to trail helen oblivious to the undercurrent rifled through the letters on the table sister laurent was genuinely concerned about trillium what in the world could it be that was so intolerable that could smudge circles under her eyes and drain her face of flesh and color helen would you mind sister began thinking to give the other girl an errand which would leave trillium alone with her but the door of mother's office opened and mother's low voice came out with mr archer mother herself stood in the doorway mr archer bowing with his usual deep respect sister laurent on her feet since it was as natural for helen to draw a man's attention as it was for her to breathe she caught up the box holding it against her smiling from mother to the gentleman whom she considered so romantic good afternoon mother good afternoon mr archer she said in a tremulous voice crispin bowed again gravely helen's performance being what it was it held mother and mr archer for divergent reasons but sister's eyes were on trillium no wider than she had been but that was impossible she lingered in the outer doorway i see you have your box trillium when trillium did not reply on the moment helen said yes mother thank you her nod dismissed the girls but trillium did not see it for her eyes were on the floor in unreasoning panic mr archer couldn't help hearing her name he might repeat it in the guest house and jim whoever he was would wonder if this could be dulcie's daughter trill wake up helen whispered 
nudging her companion into the hall with the box in her arms. She was in so exalted a state that she failed to notice Trillium's silence as they climbed the stairs. Don't you think older men have something, Trill? Hilaria says I'm madly missing half my life when I don't take Mr. Archer's creative writing course, but getting to know him outside of class, I mean, that's a tribute to your personality, Trill. He has to be nice to those other girls, but us, after all. Friendship is a selective thing, I mean. Trillium only nodded. Really, I don't think you're thrilled at all. Now, let's open the box and see what this marvelous hunk of mink looks like. It won't be any different than last year, now. But there was no shaking Helen. Thumping the box down on Trillium's bed, she cut the string and brought out the coat. Oh, Trill, would you, could you let me wear it the night of the play? I mean, when I meet Howard, he'd be super dazzled. It isn't every girl who has a fur coat. I mean, they're a luxury in the South, and sometimes I think I'd be willing to live in the North if I could honestly have one. Trillian watched Helen in the coat, twisting and turning before the small dressing table mirror. It was simplest now to let her think she could wear the coat, but no one, not even she herself, would appear in it. The soft fur rippled with Helen's posing. The sleeves fell away from her wrists luxuriously. This was a coat to dream about, timeless in fashion, because the designer had had in mind a woman rather than a style. Exactly when her mother had come into possession of that coat, Trillium did not know, but it had been some time before her father died. In that terrible, hurried packing, she had seen it, jammed into a trunk. Not again until Uncle Henry had shipped it to her the summer before last, when she celebrated her eighteenth birthday. It would be a perfect thing to identify her if Jim should see it. Mink, Helen breathed, stroking the silky sleeve. Trillium felt a wave of physical illness break over her. She had been so careful about her name, yet today it had come out. This is what could happen, without warning, at any hour of any day, some unexpected thing to trip her up in spite of every precaution. She jumped up, snatching the coat from Helen. She couldn't think, now, of what to do. Her mind was useless to her. But she would have to dispose of the coat before the night of the play. When Helen was gone, she hung it in the far end of her closet so that anyone opening the door would not see it. If only she could hang away her name. But how useless it was to worry. Mr. Archer's attention had been on Helen. In all probability, he had not even heard the name. Down in the office, Crispin Archer was answering Sister Lawrence's polite inquiry. The novel is doing famously, Sister. Whether the reviewers will see its merits, I don't know. But I'm enjoying my first attempt at fiction. It's an experience. So you do not find your teaching duties too time-consuming? Mother asked. Crispin Archer made the expected protest, then said casually, Trillium, isn't that what you call the girl? An odd name. I'm always on the hunt for names with individuality, and they're fiendishly hard to find. I'll ask her permission to use Trillium for my heroine. I've been calling her Hetty Rose, and she's a slob. As Trillium, she'd scintillate. Mother's mouth became firm. You need ask no permission, Mr. Archer. Names are not copyrightable. A trillium is a rather common woods flower. You might come across it anywhere. Archer's eyes danced, and it occurred to Sister Laurent that he was ripping Mother. One of the tools of his trade would be knowing what was in public domain and what was not. You relieve me of a pleasant chore, Mother, he said. Good afternoon, Mother, Sister. Although he really only nodded, he gave the impression of bowing from the waist then swung to the door with his queer walk, and was gone. "'I wonder if I like that man,' Mother said with unexpected frankness. "'I love thy neighbor,' Sister Laurent laughed. She had come on an errand concerning her work, but the happenings of the past few minutes erased it from her mind. She turned to Mother with a puzzled frown. "'Mother, what actually do we know about Trillian Pierce?' "'The name again?' "'No, Mother, the girl.' Very little, I believe. It's surprising how little, now that I consider it. How strange that you should bring it to my attention. Come into my office, please. 
They brought out Trillium's card from the files. Mother looked it over thoughtfully. We seem to have scant information, sister. Her father died when she was thirteen, I suppose from some illness, and about the same time the mother disappeared. Whether the mother died, or deserted her, I don't know. Her tuition has always been paid by an uncle in New Orleans, and he writes to her regularly. She spends her vacation there. Mother dropped the card back into the folder. And that's all. Then she couldn't be having family trouble, said Sister Laurent. She is coming along well in her studies, that is, well for her, but I've had the impression that she's worried about something. Perhaps it's because I'm so fond of her. Mother nodded. It's the same with all of us, sister. Trillium has a place of her own. Well, I'll wait a little longer and see if she comes to me. Quite often she does. But if she shouldn't, and her anxiety continues, I'll have a little talk with her. Thank you, mother, said Sister Laurent. Over in the guest house, Franz Eric was polishing golf clubs in the middle of the living room when Crispin Archer strolled in and flung himself into a chair. A week of existence under the same roof had weathered the three into Uncle Tor and the boys, and the boys had already come into that easy stage of companionship where silence is as friendly as speech. Crispin lighted his pipe, squinting at Franz through the smoke. After a long time, he observed, Some cute kids around here. So I've noticed. No one they call Trillium. The club slipped in Franz's hand, knocking over the jar of polish and he righted it before he replied. Can't say that I do. I teach badminton to Hilaria, tennis to Nerissa, but I have not a single trillium to call mine own. A little dark thing, enormous eyes. Scads of them, but they're only sets of uncoordinated muscles to me yet, Chris. Tender little shoots, all fenced in by mother's capable hands. Sometimes I wonder what that woman's past has been to make her so suspicious of the male. Lurid, hey? Maybe, or frustrated. It could add up to the same thing. Franz blew on the metal club and rubbed hard. Next time I'm going to get me a job in an old lady's home where I can show my true colors and proud to my heart's content. I'll be with you, laddie, said Crispin Archer. Franz saw his own pixie grin reflected on the surface of the niblick in his hand. Tomorrow morning, if all went as scheduled, he would be giving her first golf lesson to Miss Trillium Pierce. End of chapter 4、Chapter 5 of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 5 Sister Samuel was fascinated with Crispin Archer's playing. With her pretty, dreamy little face screened from him by her coif, she sat in his studio, in the main building, listening to his majestic rendition of the Finlandia. Through the great translation of the hopes of a people for freedom, the music had been demanding, rolling in thunderous swells that shook the piano, and Sister Samuel equally. But now the warriors were defeated, bringing home the dead and he played softly, as if death were the inexplicable, and even he dared not mock it. These were the only measures he treated with respect. Never had Sister Samuel heard a musician play like that, snapping his fingers in the face of the composer, turning a pianissimo into a giant fortissimo, and crashing chords into whispers. To one who always played carefully, reading the expression as minutely as the notes, it was an unforgettable experience. She was breathless when he finished, and his hands fell to the bench beside him. She didn't know at what point in the music she had risen to her feet. Yet there she stood, her back to the light, her face shadowed, dreading the moment when he would look over and expect her to say something. But Crispin Archer was in a mood to play, not to talk, and Sister Samuel was the perfect listener. Without even wiping his forehead, which she saw was a glitter, he began a seldom-heard theme from Chopin. Sister Samuel would have played it with a light, gentle touch, but this interpretation was without reverence, as if the player enjoyed the spectacle of sadness, which had led another to write such music. Oh, don't, don't, Sister Samuel wanted to cry out, but she didn't. 
With her lovely blue eyes on Crispin's stocky hands, she listened and said not a word. Through a haze of music, the great Tobolson tramped down the stairs from his studio, a beret cockily over one ear, and the sketch pad in his hand. He was a little late for his outdoor class, but Tor never had spoiled his students by being present to start them on a day's work. When he saw Mother Theodore in the hall, he paused, a smile wrinkling around his eyes. He had been at St. Aurelian's long enough now to become an accepted adjunct, a serious artist absorbed in translating onto canvas all he could of the world's beauty and the time left to him. Everyone thought of him as old, unconsciously responsive to his lead. This morning, considering, he had decided to wait a few days longer before speaking to Mother, but this casual moment might do better. The corridor was quiet, with feminine voices chanting Latin behind a closed door at his left, and Archer's music demanding to be heard on the upper floor. "'He's teasing someone,' Tolson chuckled to himself, as he changed his course to come up with Mother Theodore. At his greeting she halted, falling into the immediate repose so common to the sisterhood, and so seldom seen outside it. She was busy, as a superior always is, yet she gave the impression of having all the time in the world for Mr. Tolvitson, so long as he made good use of it. Chatting, they walked to the east door, and it was not until then that Mother was certain the artist had something on his mind. His red-brown eyes met hers and flashed away, returned and ran away again. Mother Theodore was amused. She had one infallible ruse with which to bring people to the point. "'Good-bye for the moment, Mr. Trevolson, she said, and turned to continue on down the stairs. "'Oh, Mother, one second, please.' Gravely she came back, and they stood looking out through the open door. "'Yes,' said Trevolson. "'Yes, well, Mother, I don't believe there is any necessity for mentioning this, but from certain remarks of the boys, er, Archer and Eric, I appreciate the obstacles. He broke off chuckling. I'm stammering like a schoolboy, mother. The educational atmosphere, no doubt. I've had no occasion to produce my ruler yet, sir. Tovutsen's mirth died. Ah, yes. Well, but to come to the matter, while I seem to have the health of a Titian and may live like him for most of a century, Still, I feel that I should not put off until tomorrow what I can produce today. And the fact, mother, is that I would be most proud to leave behind me here at St. Aurelian's a sample of my work, a sort of memorial to the sisters and myself at once. Do I put it badly? You put it very well, sir. If I may anticipate you, since you mentioned certain obstacles, I gather that you will need models for this project. Ah. In a nutshell, yes, mother, beautifully draped, of course, angels and children and such like. Mother Theodore stood for a moment in silence, looking out across the quiet scene. A simple request, as simple as Tobolson himself. He had taken the harmless pose of being old, perhaps to emphasize his fatherliness, but genuine enough was his love for St. Aurelian's. Although there had been no discussion of his financial status, it was plain to Mother that he never would have accepted her offer if he had been able to do otherwise. Few artists elect of their own free will to teach, and he loves us all, Mother thought, and in his gratitude he would leave behind him here the most personal gift he can make. Tobolson came nearer, and she could smell the turpentine and paint of his old smock. There is a beautiful wall in the auditorium, Mother, an invitation for a mural. If it would be agreeable to you, that is where I would place my picture. Mother nodded. Years ago, when I was a novice, there was talk of a mural, but an artist pointed out that in this damp climate the paint would peel, and the picture would have to be restored so often that in time there would be none of the original left. He must have planned to paint directly on the plaster, Mother. Now I would not do that. I would paint my picture on canvas. I don't say it would never need restoration, of course. All paint peels in this swamp region, but much less than the other way. Tolson talked on, Mother's enthusiasm taking fire from his. It was easy, he saw, to arouse her interest in anything which furthered the cultural and educational cause of St. Aurelian's. He spoke of line and color, 
even sketched a bit on the pad he held. And when finally he remembered his class and excused himself, the mural had become an accepted undertaking. Mother Theodore turned to go down the stairs, then stopped as if someone had stuck her with a pin. She stepped back to the door. Tolbertson was lumbering off toward the barnyard, where his art class, having an outdoor lesson in sketching, moved slowly around after a cow. Mother, watching the ungainly progress of the artist, smiled a little wryly. The first resolution she had made, when at last it was decided to add art to the college schedule, was that the artist should not be allowed to use the girls as models. Personalities were to play no part, but Tolvoldson had skirted that neatly. He couldn't be expected to paint an ambitious mural without models, and certainly the huge barn he had selected as a studio was not conducive to intimate friendships, and he was anything but the type to inspire hero worship. "'I've been too thoroughly imbued with the protective instinct for our southern bells,' Mother murmured aloud as she hurried down the stairs. "'Most of them are hardy little weeds, but I'll be careful. Now, if Sister Emery hasn't given up and left the linen room—' Tovoldson, pondering the same phase of his art as Mother Theodore, was well pleased with himself. He could approach any of the girls now without having to give a reason, and therefore his approach to the special one would go unremarked. Very good, he chuckled. Very good. He should do well at St. Aurelian's. In the barnyard the students picked up their three-legged stools, followed the cow until she stopped to graze again, and all sat down. Land sakes, what are they learning I couldn't say, said Glory Muckleroy, as she came out of the hen house and met her husband, High, who was tinkering up the lawnmower. Following that there cow all round the pasture, they been, and I bet a skin monkey there ain't one of em knows a soup bone from a rump roast. They ain't drawing soup bones, honey, High remarked. Now my idea of nothing is that there other young un whacking away at the little old golf ball. Ain't hit it yet far as I can make out. Trillium, at the practice tee between Pecan Grove and Pasture, rested her driver on the ground, while Franz Eric patiently repeated his instructions. She never would hit the ball, not with her hands shaking and her knees quivering, as if the very earth itself quaked beneath her. With Crisp and Archer's illogical music drifting over on the west wind, Franz Eric's hands touching hers as he explained the grip on the golf club, and his tone very formal when he called her Miss Pierce. Tolvoldson swinging across the lawn toward them like a Viking setting out for the new world. Trillium suddenly felt surrounded. "'I'm sorry, I don't feel well, Mr. Eric,' she said, and her pallor gave truth to her words. "'Will you excuse me, please?' She started toward the convent, encountered Tolvoldson, and streaked toward the barnyard. The artist quickened his step, realized he could not catch her without making a dash, which would probably be both undignified and unsuccessful, and strolled on. Franz laughed, slamming at the ball. "'You're doing okay, Erickson,' he said aloud. "'She's got to come back, sometime.' And he shouldered his clubs and meandered off to the tennis court, without bothering to follow his ball. "'Get away, get away!' that was Trillium's nightmare urge." but it was almost like running in a dream when you never quite escape and yet never are caught. In her vegetable garden, Glory Muckleroy leaned on her hoe. It was late to be working in a garden, but Glory never could get enough of it. Slowing to a walk in order not to excite comment, Trillian waved to Glory and went on toward the cloister. The woman couldn't help her, Trillian thought, because she never had known real trouble only the fussy trouble of raising five children on nothing. And now that she had come into good days, the old times were the soil out of which the new were growing. No help there, no help from anyone. Up in her room, Trillium shut the door and slid a chair against it under the knob. Crisp and Archer had stopped playing in his studio. Someone was practicing scales on a violin. She threw herself flat on the bed. The only sound other than the violin was the short, heavy breathing of a runner, someone who had sped upstairs and through halls until her lungs were bursting. Herself. Trillium jumped up and pushed at the chair again, making certain it was tight under the knob. The door had a lock, one that turned like a bolt on the inside, 
and which could be opened with a key from the outside, an arrangement to assure a small degree of privacy, but not planned for personal safety. Several people had keys, Mother Theodore, Sister Laurent, the refectory sister, Rendy, who did the cleaning. The chair, of course, was secure as any bolt, and no one could get in through the window. It was too high up. Trillium lay down again and closed her eyes. This running away couldn't go on, particularly when she was not running to anything, but only away. The thing to do was to think it out carefully, take her time, face her problem calmly, as she could do it now, with the autumn sunlight falling across her, and the girls all up and about in the building. There was the knowledge, first, that Mr. Archer had heard her name. Franz Eric had called her by it several times this morning, and Tolvoldsen had been determined to meet her, as she crossed the lawn. Each of the three knew her. The safe feeling of anonymity was gone. "'But they... he can't be sure,' she whispered. Still, how many girls named Trilly and Pierce would there be in the world? And to focus attention upon that strange name, there was the forthcoming publicity of mustard seed. She could be ill, she thought frantically. She could even eat soap or something to make herself sick, so she wouldn't have to stand up there before him. But that was impossible as well as foolish, for Mother Theodore would call the doctor, and he would say that her illness was brought on by herself and then they would all begin to ask why, and he would hear about it, and know for certain that she feared him. He might believe, even, that she knew him, could identify him, whenever she found an opportunity, and she would no longer have even the slim safety that was hers now. The spotlight of the play seemed infinitely preferable to such calamity. So there, at least, was one decision made. Under her clinging fingers, the bedspread was crumbled into two damp little volcanoes. She must think about the letter, next. Through the week since All Souls' Day, she had carried it pinned inside her blouse, but that was not secure enough. The paper might tear, the envelope fall, and she would never know where it went. To destroy the letter would be the most final, just as she had always destroyed the others. But not this one. It held too much precious information. If she could hide it where no one would think of looking. And there was the coat. She had to get rid of the coat. For a quarter of an hour, Trillium lay still. When she sat up, the sunshine showed her to be paler than ever. I won't hesitate. I won't think any longer. Because this is the only way out, she whispered. Come on, kid. Let's get it over. She slid off the bed and opened the closet door. Digging back through the dresses, her hand met soft fur and she dragged it out. Quickly, as if the touch must not be allowed to soften her resolve, she threw the coat on the bed and snatched her nail scissors. The beautiful matched back lay there, brown and rich. Separating the fur, she plunged the little scissors deep into the skin and worked it until a flap was loosened. Then she caught the torn place and pulled. The skin was soft. When she stopped, there was an arrow-shaped tear, six inches long, in the back of the coat. Well, that much is done, she said aloud. But her voice broke. She couldn't see to find a face tissue, so she wiped her eyes on the sleeve. Then she hung the coat back where it had been in the closet and pulled the chair away from the door. She had accomplished the first step. Now for the next. The lunch bell rang while she was putting on fresh lipstick. She wasn't hungry. It would be hash anyway. But she would have to go down. To miss lunch might invite questions, and there was only this afternoon in which to accomplish what she planned. Tomorrow, the day of the play, even the emergency she was about to bring on would not be enough to get her into Marysville. Joining the other girls in the hall, girls a twitter over the approach of dress rehearsal, Trillian was as natural as any of them, because none was quiet herself. Voices were too high, laughter too shrill, tempers a little short. For Trillium there was also the exhilaration of awaiting her opportunity, the old thrill of playing cops and robbers. When the crowd broke up after lunch, she escaped to the dressing room and went straight to the rack where she had hung her costume. There it was, misty white, the blue veil folded neatly over the inside of the hanger. Trillium hesitated then, more than she had over the coat. 
to destroy was horrible to her even as a child she had carefully leafed through the mail order catalogue and felt regret when at last her mother said it was worn enough to be cut up for paper dolls but there was no other way she had to get into town the costume drifted in her arms light with the chiffon artfully caught with a needle in exactly the right places to make it look free of all sewing sister gaspard was an artist hastily selecting a breath which was only a square chiffon hung diagonally from the shoulder trillian caught the middle of it in her teeth and pulled there was a rending tear and the square hung with a bulging ragged hole in the middle she had wept when she tore her coat but seeing the ruin of her costume shook her with apprehension what if she were mistaken and the material had not been bought at goldsmith's in maryville what if she couldn't replace it as she had planned for heaven's sake she groaned i didn't think of that but it has to be goldsmith's dear lord let it be goldsmith's it was late for such a prayer like the time helen set the declaration of independence in seventeen seventy eight on a history exam and then prayed the lord to make it that trillian pushed apart the other hanging costumes and thrust her own among them now she had to get into town and fast sister raymond luckily was puttering around the stage alone there was nothing to be done but she was too uneasy for meditation she was wandering around with a potted fern knowing she would put it back exactly where it had been when trillian burst out of the backstage shadows sister raymond had turned on only one overhead spot and outside its circle everything was hazy but there was illumination enough to show the girl's white face and flying hair and sister's heart fell clear to her cuban heels trillium dear now what oh sister i tore my costume you know those wing pieces that sort of float out when we dance well the left one a big horrible hole the fern was suddenly too heavy for sister and trillian caught it before it fell i'm just terribly sorry sister but i couldn't help it both statements were true trillian was terribly sorry and she couldn't help it because this was the only errand she could invent which would surely take her into town sister i still have some money from last month's allowance and i'll go into town and get a length myself there's no hem or anything and i can tack it in place and poor dear sister gaspar will never know the difference oh could you trillium did they buy it at goldsmith's do you think if they didn't all was lost trillium said truthfully if i could ask high muckleroy to run me in he's going for something else if you hurry you'll catch him you're sure you have the money yes sir trillium shoved the fern back into sister raymond's embrace and made off sister raymond recovering from the shock Listen to Trillium's quick step departing. Oh, and take Helen with you, dear, she called. She wasn't sure that Trillium heard, but it was Mother's policy never to allow the girls off the grounds alone. In the white glow of the spotlight she paused. Queer that Trillium, of all people, would have torn her costume. If it were Nerissa Braddy, with her red-headed temperament, it would be perfectly understandable. But Trillium... She turned her back to the light, the shadows clown black under her coif, and she stood that way a long time, holding the fern and patting its green-covered plot as if it might be lulled to sleep. Trillium had heard the sister's instruction, but she could easily pretend that she hadn't, if anything came of it. She couldn't take Helen, not when the whole idea was to get the coat away from that determined young lady. In her room she yanked the furrier's box from under her bed. What she had to do took her less than a minute. She ran with the box cover bulging and string flying. She was just in time to catch High Muckleroy. In the side yard by his house he was reviving the engine of the pickup truck, which was his care and joy, and only the lower, blue-jeaned half of him was visible. Trillium climbed up into the high rearing cab. Mother had been ready to junk the truck when High came to the farm, but his outraged protest had dissuaded her. Later Mother knew that High had the soul of a tinker, and that a shiny new truck would never have had the appeal of this ailing vehicle. He overhauled it weakly, painted it a liverish red, and assured Mother every time he saw her that it was in fine condition. "'Well, Miss Trillium,' he greeted her, folding his long legs into the cab. "'Coming into town with me, eh? Welcome. Ever hear a nicer engine? Purrs like a baby, she does.' 
Trillium giggled. There were other similes she could suggest, such as an earthquake in full swing. She liked Ty. He was tall and thin and had an air of always being delighted at finding himself in such pleasant surroundings, no matter what they were. And to keep up with his position at St. Aurelian's, he had taken to shaving and changing his shirt almost every day. Quite a bundle you got there, Miss Trillium. I shouted. I tore my costume, Trillium shouted back. Are you coming to the play tomorrow night? Say, now, I'd admire to, but Glory's going, and maybe she'll want me to stay with the kids. Oh, take them, Trillium urged. He hunched his shoulders. His cup of bliss would be running over, whether he sat entranced over mustard seed or hunkered on his back porch, listening to the swamp settle for the night. Marysville still had a baked appearance. The one street which was imposingly named St. Francis Boulevard was only a gasp away from summer indolence. But the furrier's shop was there, and goldsmiths with a display of shovels and thread and kerosene cans and eighty square per call in the window. When High stopped for her at the bank corner, having completed his errands, Trillium looked as if she had searched for the Holy Grail and found it. Her large box was gone, and in its place she carried a small flat paper sack with goldsmith's name across it. "'Get what you wanted, Miss Trillium?' he inquired, throwing the truck into gear. "'Everything,' Trillium sighed. It was true. The first step accomplished, the rest would be easy. Tomorrow night the convent grounds will be crowded, the road a steady stream of autos winding out to the gates, after the play, and almost any one of them would pick up a girl on foot. They wouldn't ask questions. She would be only another playgoer homeward bound. She would wear her brown wool and the dark red blanket coat, both inconspicuous in the dark, so when questions would be asked later, the motorist who gave her the ride would be hard put to remember what she looked like, and could only tell that he had given her a lift into Marysville. She had money enough, in spite of the expense of the chiffon. By the time anyone was actually worried, she would be in New Orleans. It was the only course to take, now that Jim knew her. Ahead, Casually crossing the parking lot was Tolbotson. At the moment Trillian caught sight of him, he observed the truck, and stopped, obviously intending to waylay his passenger, when she alighted at the east door. Trillian grasped High's arm. Listen, High, stop here. Right here. I'll run in the main entrance. Stop. She jerked his arm, and High, mystified, but chalking her excitement up to the queer notions of women in general, stepped on the brake. Leaning across her, he pushed open the door and Trillium jumped out. When High chugged through the parking area and onto the barnyard, he waved at Tolbotson, who was lingering on the steps at the east entrance. Nose a little out of joint, High considered, but what was he after, an old stiff like him? He shrugged and began to whistle. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Six. I wish I could believe it, Sister Raymond sighed. I suppose I have morning of the fatal day jitters, but she spread her hands helplessly. This, at last, was the day of the mustard seed presentation and she had no more faith in it than, than Tolvoldson. "'But it's true, sister,' cried Helen Perry, and Nerissa Braddy added gaily. "'It always happens. A bad dress rehearsal means a good performance. You'll see, sister. Honestly, we'll just act our hearts out tonight.' "'Well,' sister turned her head in order to see from end to end of the stage where they stood. Trillium, in the narrow corridor leading from stage to dressing-room, halted abruptly when she heard the next voice. "'I believe them, sister,' said Tolbotson, and Trillium knew he was standing with a brush poised, because he spoke musingly, as if his thoughts were only half on his words. If they had given their best yesterday at the dress rehearsal, they would be too assured to-night. They would see no necessity for trying harder. But knowing they didn't do well, they will be alert. They will use their minds as well as their voices. Perfection does not invite improvement.' but imperfection puts one on guard. So. The sister and the girls laughed, and Trillium heard Tolbotson's voice again. 
but i'm not joking see if my work had been perfect before i'd never have thought of strengthening the shadows but i lower the tone of the purple and the white becomes more brilliant although i have not touched it marvellous light voices answered trillium glanced into the dressing-room no one was there she went in and closed the door behind her this would be the time to write her note then she would have ample opportunity to deliver it seating herself at the built-in make-up shelf that ran the circumference of the room she took a small envelope and paper from her cardigan pocket and wrote hastily dear mother theodore please forgive me for going away there is nothing else i can do i have money enough and i can take care of myself i cannot explain because she stopped caution overcame her and she sat chewing the end of her pencil she should not have put in that last word since she dared not set down what ought to follow the voices on the stage were growing louder trillian would not much longer be alone quickly she erased because and put a period after explain then she added it is nothing that has happened at the convent please don't worry about me with love trillium she had just written mother's name on the envelope when the door flew open a crowd of girls entered and began polishing the square mirrors laying out makeup and talking in a dozen assorted keys sister raymond trillium saw was quietly inspecting the costumes on the rack all were in order even sister gaspar could not have told that one bore a new width of chiffon you haven't anything laid out trill helen exclaimed pushing her own kit onto trillium's section while she covered hers with a clean towel i know but i'm going to do it right now trillium said she licked the flap of her little envelope and tucked it into one of the deep pockets of her sweater then she took off the sweater hung it over the back of her chair and began to sort her makeup oh darn i forgot my towels for tonight helen complained use mine trillium offered no sister says we each have to have our own sanitary or something come on to the linen room with me why take your sweater you don't need it trillium hesitated hardly a fraction of a second no one would touch the sweater and she didn't need it she had worn it to mass this morning but the early chill of the buildings was gone the auditorium and the adjoining dressing rooms were in the center wing and at the leisurely pace trillium and helen set it was a long stroll to the linen room clear to the end of the west wing on the main floor then down the stairs and into the tunnel which bore away toward the contemplative's house a tunnel lay under each of the cloister walks forming an underground square connecting the convent buildings as the walks did above ground this place is a regular fort trillian whispered it makes me feel spooky where's the light trill finding the switch trillian said well wasn't it a fort in the early days indians and things that's what i've always heard everybody used to pile down here when the indians went on the warpath think how comanche would sound under this vaulted ceiling woo a long woo woo echoed her shrill cry for goodness sake come on helen demanded and she dragged trillium into one of the small rooms under the main building here the first sisters had lived but now the rooms were used for storage and laundry. Grabbing towels, Helen sped to the stairs. Time was of no consequence today. Mother had dismissed all classes in order that the girls would be rested and fresh for the night's performance, and Trillium and Helen stepped out into the cool shade by the west door. They dallied so long that the crowd in the dressing room finished their undertakings and struggled away. Trillium's sweater fell on the floor. Someone picked it up by the tail, and the note fell out. But the girl didn't notice a hurrying foot kicked the small envelope far to one side when the sweater hung again over the back of trillium's chair the note lay across the room there was no reason then to connect the sweater with the note when another girl spied the envelope on the floor who lost this kids she asked waving it but no one claimed it and she passed it to sister raymond mother theodore's name is on it sister said I'll leave it with her mail when I go by the office. So the note went away in Sister Raymond's pocket. When Trillium and Helen came back to the dressing room, everyone had left. From the high windows, the light fell on all the neat makeup arrangements and upon Trillium's sweater, brilliant green. She took it 
and with it swinging over her shoulder went with Helen to the dining room. It was not until after lunch that Trillian felt again in the sweater pocket. The note was not there. She had made a mistake, felt in the wrong pocket, but the other was empty also. Frantically she searched again, but the sweater had only two pockets, and both were empty. "'Lose something, Trill?' asked Mary Elizabeth across the table. "'I... no, just my hanky.' "'You look awfully worried for just a hanky.' Trillian was too panicky to dissemble now. She tipped under the table, but there was no small white envelope. Excusing herself, she left the other girl staring after her. She was not acting naturally now, but she couldn't help it. I shouldn't have written the note so soon, she thought wildly, running along the old corridors. I should have waited. I needn't have written it at all. If someone had picked it up and read it, that person would wonder if Trillium had gone crazy. But St. Aurelian's personnel was too well-mannered to tear open a note addressed to another. "'Of course no one has opened it,' Trillian panted and forced herself to walk. But suppose the note was already in Mother Theodore's hands. Suppose she sat in her office this very minute, reading the bungling excuse of a girl who intended to run away. Without thinking of what she could say to Mother to undo the damage to her plan, Trillian ran until she reached the office door. The door of the inner office was open, showing a neat, empty interior, and on the mail table most of the letters from the morning post still lay. Hastily the girl scattered the pile sorted for Mother Theodore. Bills, personal letters, advertisements, but no small white envelope without a postmark. The other letters on the table were for Torvaldson, Archer, and Eric. The girls and sisters had already taken theirs. Relief made Trillium giddy and she leaned against the table, stacking Mother's letters again neatly. Mother would not have picked up the least important looking of the lot and carried it away without taking the rest. So she had not read that scrawled little message. That was the inevitable, comforting conclusion. Trillium's forehead was damp, but she laughed as she topped Mother's heap with a violent pink envelope, bearing almost illegible writing in green ink. No wonder Nerissa Braddy was flighty, with a mother like that. Trillium could think about something as inconsequential as Nerissa's mother stationary, because now her fright was over, and she would run down to the dressing room and find the envelope somewhere on the floor. That was where it would be, since no one had delivered it. When she came into the dressing room, however, she saw immediately that she was wrong. The floor must have been swept during the lunch hour, for she distinctly remembered a cloud of sawdust in one corner, where something had been unpacked. And Rindy would have done the sweeping. Randy drooping through the halls with her curly white mop. So certain was Trillian this time, that when she found Randy plodding along outside the visitor's parlor, she began without preamble. Give it to me, Randy, please. The African brown face showed no surprise. Give you all what, Miss Trillium? The note. You found it. When the girl shook her head, Trillium cried out in a frenzy. I know you did. Don't lie. A plain envelope addressed to Mother Theodore. I lost it out of my sweater pocket. Rindy's head dropped, and her lips bulged in a pout. I didn't find no envelope. I ain't seen nothing like that. But you swept the dressing room, didn't you? That where you lose it? Yes'm, sawdust all over. But I didn't see no letter. No, ma'am. Trillium tried to fight down her alarm. Of course Rindy had found the note. She was just waiting to be bribed, a business transaction, like her acceptance of Helen's red bandana in exchange for services and mailing notes to Howard Cooper. Listen, Rindy, Trillian began confidentially. Listen, you've seen my new scarf, the aqua with the yellow roses? I'll give it to you if you'll tell me. When Rindy shook her head, Trillian wanted to slap her, but she dropped her voice coaxingly. Then my anklets that match the scarf? I'll give you those too, Rindy. You see, if I knew the note had been delivered to Mother already, I wouldn't mind a bit. I'd just ask her about it, and she'd tell me. Did you meet her in the hall and give it to her? I ain't seen your note, Randy insisted, and although her eyes remained on the mop, she was shoving aimlessly. Trillian believed her. Randy had been a last hope. Where shall I turn now? The girl's benumbed brain demanded. Her despair must have touched Randy for the maid added. 
must be something powerful important miss trillium you all looks like somebody's walking on your grave trillium shuddered cover up her caution warned her no rendy it's not very important but if you should find this little plain white envelope with mother's name on it you'll bring it straight to me won't you i'll keep my eyes poppin honey trillium left her and rendy went on with her everlasting mop pushing the floors were of beautiful wide cypress boards polished and waxed until they shone and they were rendy's pride she pressed the soft mop tight against the door to get every particle of dust slipping it into the recess which accommodated the door to the visitor's parlor the door was standing slightly ajar and yet the pressure of the mop did not push it farther open must be something behind it maybe the rug curled up rendy decided the parlor was a concern only on thursdays and she went on by sister raymond entering mother's office met rendy outside the door and spoke to her sister had not until this moment thought of delivering the note she had picked up she took it from her pocket and laid it with mother's other letters remarking to herself that Marissa Brady's mother must be undergoing another period of concern for her only daughter. No one else used such raucous pink stationery in green ink. And sister hurried away, and Rendy went on with her work. She was at the far west end of the hall going steadily on, when the door of the visitor's parlor opened, and someone came quickly out and crossed to the office. Mother Theodore, coming in, just before prayers, glanced at her letters, saw the pink envelope, and sighed. She did not know, of course, that there had been a white envelope on top of the pink. There was none then. Trillium ran to her room, but there was nowhere she could go to escape from her terror. No use now regretting that she had written the message. It was done, and it was possible, more than probable, that the letter was mislaid, stuck off under a cupboard, kicked under a davenport lying in a waste-basket. For a freakish instant she considered tearing through all the waste-baskets in the building, through the cloister, then over into the contemplative's house, with a blizzard of paper flying behind her, and the sisters would look up with that other world peace, and see her like a witch without a broomstick. Throwing herself on the bed, she fought off hysteria. There was no danger, really. Whoever Jim was, he could not be in the convent building, where she had been this morning, in the dressing-room, but Tolfotson was on the stage, not fifty feet away. Trillium jumped up, pulling the chair over to the door as she had done before, and wedging it under the knob. I'll stay here, right here, she planned desperately, and then I'll go with Helen and Mary Liz down to supper, and to the dressing room. During the performance I'll be either on stage or in the wings, always with a crowd, and afterward, when the otters would be sliding down to the gates, she could get away. It should be infinitely easier than what she had done yesterday, to get rid of her coat. And once away she could breathe again. She would be safe. The only possible obstacle now was that someone still might find the note and give it to Mother. But there was nothing to be gained in speculating about that, and Trillium sat down to wait. Below, in the cloister wing, old Sister Atene had just put on her new habit in a clean coif. It was very early to be preparing for the evening's excitement, but she knew the Lord would not mind her expanding to its full this harmless little glow of pleasure. The Lord was very good to her. He had almost taken away her sight, but that was only so that she might look inward the better. She had no complaint. Her age and her partial blindness had actually brought her a deep contentment she had never known when she was young and busy. And now she was ready, and she had nothing to do until Vespers. They were having vespers early, and added little delight to upset the routine, but there was still plenty of time for a visit to Tom and Banty. Moving carefully, she left the cloister and went out along the walk. Getting a pan of sour milk from the dairy, Sister Atene carried it into the barnyard. She never stumbled carrying the milk. She knew the way too well, and she could see a little. She could see Tom fanning his tail and drooping his wings like a veteran gobbler his royal head violet as he strutted before her, and Banty, the tiny chicken, jumping toward the pan of milk, even before she set it down. Tom always had been a pig about sour milk. Not only would he plunge his face into it, but he had to stand in the pan while Banty drank around him, 
and none of Sister Teen's scoldings made any improvement in him. Squatted down beside them, stroking their firm backs, the old sister was in a daze of happiness. She didn't notice that Tom, on his frequent trips out of the milk pan, planted his large feet on the skirt of her habit, where it lay around her on the ground. In the fall sunshine, the trio made a picture most pleasing to the two men strolling beside the bayou. "'Speaking of rural atmosphere, Chris, look,' said Franz Eric. "'Put the famous archer sarcasm to work on that if you can.' "'I don't know the meaning of the word,' returned Crispin. "'I'm in a mellow mood. I feel benevolent and kindly. Let's mosey over.' When Sister Atene heard the strange footsteps and arose, they saw that the whole side of the habit was splashed with milk. Franz immediately understood. Neatness was a part of a sister's godliness. He was so sorry for her that for a moment he couldn't speak, and Crispin made the first remark. "'I've seen you often here, sister, but I hesitated to intrude. I'm Crispin Archer.' The sister smiled. "'Of course, sir. I know your voice, and I can still distinguish faces a little. It was such a pleasure for me to be in the assembly when you were all presented.' "'And Mr. Eric is with you? Good afternoon, sir.' Franz murmured, "'Good afternoon, sister,' as he used to do in school. Tom drooped his wings and gobbled, and they all laughed. "'Tom is not used to gentlemen,' said sister. "'My little banty raised him from an egg. She and I have spoiled him.' She stooped, putting out her hand to the hen, and her eyes fell directly on the sloped folds of her skirt." Not trusting her sight, she felt the wet, white patches, her fingers swift. When she straightened, her cheeks were pink. I'm afraid there is no end to Tom's bad manners. You can sponge it out, sister, Franz said quickly, so quickly that she knew he had noticed, and been thinking out a solution. Hang it in your drying yard over there, and nobody will ever know the difference. You won't mind a little dampness, will you? His eyes traveled over the cloister. Tolvoltson had come from somewhere and stood busy with a pencil and a sketch pad at the far west end of the lawn. Sister Atene was quite flustered. How kind the gentlemen were, taking such an interest in an untidy old nun. She stammered an apology, excused herself, and departed with what haste she could. Tom's bad behavior was well worth while, since it had resulted in such a nice little conversation. Back in the cloister she took off the habit, put on a plain black gown like a long-sleeved apron, and carried the habit into the sister's laundry. It didn't take long to sponge the soil places, although she did a good deal more than necessary just to make sure. She couldn't sit through the play smelling a sour milk. When she hung it in the drying yard, which was screened by a vine-covered fence, she liked the idea of having a freshly aired habit. If the evening happened to be cool, she would take her shawl to wear when she stood outside, listening to the conversation of the departing people. And then it seemed proper to air the shawl also, and she brought it out and hung it on the line with the habit. Old Sister Atene was very tired by that time. She would lie down, she planned, for a few minutes before Vespers. If the good habit wasn't dry, she could put on her old one, the one that had almost disintegrated, before it was her turn for a new one. The moment her head touched the pillow, the old sister was sound asleep. It was dark black in her room when Sister Atina woke. A minute went by before she realized she had slept through vespers and supper. Horrified, she started up. The play would begin. In a rush she remembered the habit and shawl on the line, and everything fell into place. She went out into the lighted hall and threw open the door to the drying yard. At this distance the lines appeared to be empty. She stepped out, feeling her way in the darkness that was her own in the nights. Funny, she thought she had hung the habit on the first line, but that was empty. The second, also, and the third and fourth. Sister Teen couldn't believe her own discovery. The habit couldn't be gone. She slid her fingers along the lines for the third time before it occurred to her that someone must have brought it in out of the evening damp. Her name was in it. Whoever had taken the habit off the line had put it in her room. The old sister trotted back to her small chamber. Even her dim sight told her that the habit was not there, not in the closet, not on the bed. What had become of it? Had she not put it on the line? But she had. 
She could remember. Sitting on the side of her bed, she began to cry. She understood now. God was punishing her for taking too much pleasure in the play. The music was drifting down from the auditorium, and the play was beginning. She could put on the ragged old habit and go. But it seemed like a defiance to do it. Perhaps if she missed the first act, that would be restitution enough. She hurried into the old habit, then went down on her knees and prayed earnestly for guidance. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Seven. Trill, he's here, Helen gushed in an exultant whisper. Who's here? Trillium asked, dabbing on rouge. The dressing room was a babble of excited voices, nervous shrieks of laughter, writing over Sister Raymond's earnest assurances that there was no reason to be nervous. "'Who's here? Honestly, Trill. Howard! I saw him just now. I sneaked around front, and he's here.' "'Your folks are, too, aren't they?' "'Naturally. But I'm going to duck out and meet Howard right away after the performance, down by Pirate Cove. Mom won't know. She'll have to give me time to get dressed, and that'll be it.' "'Does Howard know you're doing that?' "'He'll be there.' Helen said confidently. He's like a pup after a bone where I'm concerned. Did you bring down your coat? I forgot. Oh, Trill, you didn't. After you promised, run up and get it now. Trillian pushed back her stool and arose as if she were going to obey. No one ever could argue with Helen, and not feel that a spider web of nylon had been gently woven around them. Trillium, you're sure you're not nervous? Sister Raymond quavered. The audience wants to like you. Remember, they're your friends. With the others, Trillium listened to the pep talk Sister Raymond always gave before a performance. She was not nervous. She had come into a center of calm, knowing the maelstrom that whirled around her. But the make-believe of the play had nothing to do with it. Places, called the stage manager. There was a final scurrying, and Mustard Seed was under way. The play was a beautiful fantasy that might well have drawn snickers from an audience who had lived through two world wars and come out of them to wonder what had become of faith and hope. But in the convent surroundings, the message was right. By the end of the second act, businessmen fathers tottered on the brink of realizing there was something more important than the dollar, and mothers became so misty-eyed they could barely follow the actors. "'And I told sister the play was bad,' Tolson murmured in the intermission but low enough so that no parent heard him. With Franz and Crispin, he sat well to the front near a side exit, the only seating arrangement Mr. Archer would tolerate, since he expected to be afflicted with acute boredom. But it isn't, Tolson added in naive astonishment. With their interpretation, their youth, the convent setting, it's perfect. Crispin shook his head. You were right the first time, Tor. This is farce, pure and simple. What do these kids know about delusionment? Wait until they're older and get slapped around a little. Then they'll find out that the destruction of hope and faith isn't just a cute trick to act out in blue lights with soft music. Faith and hope won't be destroyed, Chris, Franz said, amused. Going to put some of these kids in a novel? Fit them all out with complexes? Crispin grunted rudely, and Franz laughed. I wouldn't put it past you. But what's wrong with being cute? What a cure for a hangover that young Trillium would be. Which one's she? Faith. Crispin's program sailed to the floor. Let it go. I never read him anyway. Tobolson on the aisle retrieved it and came up with his face very red. I'll have to leave before the last act is over. I want to be in the parlor before the first visitors arrive to view my pictures. Lucky stiff, murmured Crispin. The curtain opened. The last act was, naturally, the culmination of the first and second. It left nothing to be desired. But Mr. Archer and Mr. Eric had not stayed until the end, either. When the curtain closed and the house lights came up, all three chairs were empty. Glory Muckleroy, in the next row behind, looked over to High. It had all been too perfect. 
the baby in glory's arms was sound asleep but the others sat between her and high as if they could sit for the rest of the night that's just the way things happen said glory you wonder and hope and keep your faith growin till you're fit to bust and next thing you know it's all come out like in the play and good gettin the upper hand you can't get away from it nohow high who never could imitate his wife's ease of expression only nodded Addie Pearl had a question. Wasn't it funny, Ma, them men not staying for it all? Wouldn't you a thought they'd want to see the end? What men, honey? That Mr. Eric and that Mr. Archer and the artist man. They was right ahead there. I didn't even miss him, said her mother. Behind the blue velvet curtains, the stage was dimly lighted and deserted, for everyone from the leading actors to the stage manager was eager to receive the congratulations of the audience, now clotted in the halls. All but Trillium. She had no one whose special pleasure it would be to praise her performance. But that was not what kept her on the stage. Slipping in behind the steps upon which Faith and Hope had posed for the final tableau, she sat down and rested her back against the network of braces. It was very quiet. If anyone came along, she would say she had a headache, and was waiting until the dressing-room would be a little less congested. But no one would come. The far-off noise made by a couple of hundred voices was soothing at this distance, and Trillium closed her eyes. She couldn't afford the time she was spending here, but she couldn't meet Helen again. "'Honestly, where is she?' she heard Helen's petulant demand. Half a dozen excitement-pitched answers came, none the right one. No one had seen Trillium. Helen would go in another minute, fuming, but without the coat, because she would not delay long enough to run up to Trillium's room to get it herself. Oh, honestly! Helen's exasperation carried plainly into Trillium under the steps. That would probably be her last remark. It was. It was the last remark Helen was ever to make within Trillium's hearing. A cautious two minutes later, Trillium hurried into the dressing room and flung herself down at her makeup place as if she were rushing to a fascinating rendezvous and didn't have a minute to spare. Slapping cold cream on her face, she noted that Helen's things were exactly as she had left them at the beginning of the third act. So she had gone, as she promised, in her costume and makeup to meet Howard at Pirate Cove. You must have a heavy date on, said Lucille Thomas who had portrayed vanity in a pair of false eyelashes, which she hated to give up. "'Oh, I have,' Trillian replied. "'But don't tell anybody.' Lucille blinked the lashes, watching them dreamily in the mirror. Trillian took off her costume carefully, loving it because it represented her last hour at St. Aurelian's. "'Hope is a dream, but a waking dream, wherein lies the beggar's wealth and the king's salvation.' and the schoolgirl's refuge. Without the hope of escape, she would have died of fear tonight. Swiftly she hung the costume on the rack and caught up her brown wool. She was nearly ready. The dressing room was empty except for herself and Lucille, and the eyelashes, and Pansy Dodd pulling on her stockings wrong side out. Trillium's spirit rose. Everything was going to be beautifully simple. Buckle her gold belt, swish the comb through her hair, and then she could go. She knew hardly anyone in the crowd outside. No one would stop her now. Her heart hammering under the brown wool, Trillium opened the door and closed it quickly behind her. As she had imagined, the small corridor immediately in front of the door was empty, but the wide hallway was jam-packed. She started through, elbowing politely, smiling her apologies for pushing. She was making excellent progress. An open space was ahead of her, she must not cross it too quickly. Trying to appear as if she were taking her time, Trillium stepped into the vacant spot. She was conspicuous, both because she was so pretty and because she stood apart from the crowd. Only a small mob ahead, she saw. Once through it, she would be away and free. She couldn't help quickening her steps. But before she was across the open space, a hand was laid on her arm. Trillium stopped, dead still and in that second she wondered how she could have been so certain that she would escape tonight. Helen was mad at Trillium, 
boiling mad. Promise to do a friendly turn and then welsh on it. Honestly. And it wasn't as if she'd hurt the coat, just wearing it for half an hour. Some people, Helen raged. She was glad she was in a temper, because it made her feel quite brave, and she needed to be brave, standing here at the foot of the west stairs and facing the rounded void that was the tunnel. Honestly, she said aloud. The sound did nothing for her courage, because of the echoes whispering back out of the dense blackness. She was silly to think she had to come this way, but if she ran across the lawn to Pirate Cove, someone would be sure to see her, and with her chiffon draperies fluttering white in the moonlight, and it would be reported to all the powers that be, and she would be ordered in like any kindergartner, and Howard would think her nothing but a child. In a dark sheath of Trillium's coat, she could have crossed the lawn unnoticeably. And so it was Trillium's fault that Helen stood quaking, all by herself in the dim reflection of light from the upper hall, fumbling for the light switch. That there was a light switch she knew, because Trillium had turned it on this morning, and she had seen far down the tunnel, almost into the funny little room under the contemplative's house. The button was under her hand. She pressed it, and the tunnel arch leaped into view, as if it had just been built by some magic architect. There, what's so bad about that? Her voice, however, sounded flat, and she took a long breath before she entered the tunnel. It was like a very large sewer, well built to keep out swamp seepage the floor of it worn dark from nearly two centuries of use. The girls were expressly forbidden to come here. Laughing to herself, her mad forgotten, Helen flitted along. Her only regret was that she would have so little time to spend with Howard. The little octagonal room was just as she had seen it the day she and Nerissa Brady had sneaked over for a peek. One of the right-hand angles was another arch, the opening of the tunnel, leading off to the chapel, and of course under the chapel there was another room exactly like this, with another passage turning back to the convent. In the twilight that filled the place, there was a brooding quality, as if this might have been the scene of an inquisition, and held instruments of torture in its shadows. Glory be! Of all the creepy joints! Helen shuddered. She must find the door to the outside. Trembling, she groped along the wall, and her hand fell upon cold metal. She jerked away, but when she felt it again, she knew it was an old-fashioned wrought-iron latch. She lifted it, and the door swung open. The moonlight flooded the steps going up, and cold night air drifted around her. The luck of the Perrys, she whispered through chattering teeth. She should have worn a wrap, but the costume was so lovely with the floating wings and the pink veil, she couldn't consider covering it with anything less than Trillium's coat. Howard would just have to put his arms around her to keep her warm. Helen laughed and floated up the steps. Howard was no doubt already watching from the cove, although she hadn't told him she would be here quite so early. But a devoted admirer would not wait until the last minute to arrive. She would be surprised to see him, naturally, and he would hear her lovely little cry and see her run across the grass with her chiffon wings drifting. She laughed again, glancing toward the black trees that hid the cove. And then, like Trillium back in the crowded hallway, she stood dead still. Only a few feet away was an enormous sister, motionless as Helen herself, her back to the moonlight, so that she was all one towering shadow. From her position it almost seemed that she had come from the direction of the cove. But that couldn't be. And why was she out so late, here in the solitude of the night? Helen did not realize that her own elfin emergence, apparently from nowhere, was quite as startling to the other person. There was something horrible about the sister, as Helen stood watching her. So horrible that the girl could not think clearly. Was it because the figure was so tall and powerful looking, because it seemed to have no face? Or was it because it stood so rigid that it had no pliant, human quality of life at all? Something about this strange creature hypnotized her so that she couldn't run or scream. The wind flipped a corner of the sister's garment, and Helen's eyes fell. Then she saw why the sister was so terrifyingly unreal. Under the habit, which was far too short, there showed a pair of trouser legs and a large pair of man's shoes. "'You're not—not not a sister?' Helen gasped. But her throat was constricted, the words a mere whisper. The figure must have heard, for suddenly it began to move forward, 
a slow advance straight toward the fairy-like girl. The head was muffled in a shawl. That was why it appeared to have no face, and the hands were invisible, thrust up the sleeves of the habit. But the feet were coming on, step by step, the distance lessening with a dreadful steadiness that was more frightening than any swift action. Helen had no doubt whatever as to what the man was about to do. He was going to kill her. Why? she breathed. Still she couldn't move. She couldn't scream. She could only wait while those big feet carried him inexorably toward her. It was when the arm came up for the blow that Helen's terror broke. She almost started for the steps, but the door might stick and she would be trapped. The man was looming over her. With every bit of strength in her slight body, she pushed under the arm and ran. Howard was at the bayou. He would save her. But the thought was not coherent. She ran toward the cove, because that was where she had been going. Her wings flying. She seemed hardly to touch the ground. Ahead of her the cypresses were stark and unleafed, each with a black shadow laid like a plank upon a crazy pattern. Howard! Howard! she sobbed. But she could not see him. She looked back over her shoulder. The big sister was almost upon her. And now she knew that she couldn't save herself. She had to keep running. She had to run out onto the hyacinths. In the moonlight they looked like a solid floor. Howard had known nothing of Helen's resolve to meet him so early. Howard was a nice young man, who did all things methodically, and because his friendship with Helen was unpredictable, he found it fascinating. No whisper of Mrs. Perry's disapproval had come to his ears, for he had never met Mrs. Perry, and Helen was resolved that he shouldn't. He hadn't minded, thus far. But as he worked his way in a leisurely manner out of the crowd, thinking of Helen's performance in more ways than one, he came to a decision. Helen was the girl for him. He would put it up squarely to her tonight, demand to meet her folks, and get their approval, or else. Well, or else he'd go on meeting her down by Pirate Cove, and he might as well admit it. It would take her at least a quarter of an hour to dress, he decided, or nearly a half hour. He stood a while on the steps of the central entrance, smoking and wondering idly which of these smartly dressed forty-ish women might be Helen's mother. His own folks would be inside, pampering Allison. The kid deserved it. She'd set her line so you could hear him, anyhow. When Howard had finished his cigarette, he strolled around to the west door. Still plenty of time. The wide west lawn was so deserted, the swamp a dark somberness beyond. He glanced over toward the contemplative's house. No movement around it, no light in the window, only the moonlight brushing the walls with pallor and shade. Gloomy spot. Might as well wait here a while. He had sat for twenty minutes watching the automobiles snake down toward the gate, when he began to wonder if Helen might have reached the cove without his knowledge. Helen loved romantic secrets. It would be like her to go by some sequestered circuit and surprise him. If she had done that, the surprise had certainly gone flat when he was not there. He stepped on his cigarette and sprinted across to the cove. From a distance, however, he could see that the place was deserted. Helen had not come. He breathed a thankful sigh. Probably tied up with her folks. You never knew. He'd wait a while, and then if she didn't come, he would go back to the auditorium and see if he could find her. The cypresses stood black and in the moonlight the hyacinths looked like a solid floor. End of chapter 7Trillium knew her face had gone white when the hand touched her holding her still. She could see her own dread blossoming as astonishment in the eyes turned upon her from the crowd. Why, those people wondered, why did she cringe because Mother Theodore had laid a hand on her arm? But they don't know, Trillium thought in panic, they don't know that she is keeping me from running away to save my mother's life. For the girl had no doubt whatever that Mother had finally seen the note. The reaction, then, was overpowering when Mother said quietly, did I startle you, dear? I'm sorry. 
I know you have no relatives here tonight, and these friends of mine have never seen the convent. Would you mind showing them around? Trillium could only nod. Mother Theodore's hand pressed her arm. No, I'll not ask you, dear. I can see that you don't feel well. Oh, but I do. Trillium cut in quickly. She must dissipate all that alarmed attention. I'll be very happy to show your friends around, Mother. Well, just the library and the tunnel. Don't bother with the chapel, then. It's too late for that. Mother Theodore turned, smiling, to introduce a serenely middle-aged couple who loved Trillium on sight. But Mother watched them move away with the girl, and wondered how long they would detain her. This very night, she decided definitely, she would have her talk with Trillium. Mr. Penworthy was in the potato business in Nebraska, he told Trillium, buying, not raising, and his wife had been a schoolmate of Mother Theodore. The potatoes had necessitated the trip east, and Mrs. Penworthy's school memories had brought them to St. Aurelian's. Trillium, answering politely, managed to look at her watch. Nearly eleven o'clock. The play had ended half an hour ago. People were lingering. There was still time. Show the tunnel, Mother had said. The west, leading to the contemplative's house, would do, since they were only going to look into it. She led the way down the stairs, past the west entrance. Someone had turned on the lights in the tunnel and left them. Answering the Penworthy's questions, Trillium toyed with the idea of asking for a ride down to Marysville. "'Are you staying in a hotel here, Mrs. Penworthy?' she asked. "'A motor court, a quaint little place, but they do seem to have hot water. My dear, you couldn't imagine how nice it is to have—' So that was out. Mother would telephone the Penworthys the first thing after the prefect discovered Trillium's empty room. She could hear Mr. Penworthy saying cheerily, "'Oh, yes, gave her a ride down to town, fine little girl. Showed us every cranny in that old rock pile of yours.' That was how Mr. Penworthy would be. Speedily, then, she delivered the pair back to Mother Theodore, who still hovered in the hall, endlessly discussing other people's children. "'Thank you, dear,' Mother said. "'Run along to bed now. I may drop in for a minute a little later.' Again that strange fear blanched the girl's face, and she stammered, "'Tonight? Oh, Mother!' "'Let's make it tomorrow morning,' Mother suggested, genuinely concerned. Come to my office whenever you're free. Good night, dear. Trillium turned and almost ran through the hall. It was startling to realize how much she loved Mother Theodore, with her kind eyes and slow smile. Mother had strength. She never would go chasing off into the night to escape from anything. The one a.m. milk train would never be the solution for her. But I'm not brave, Trillium admitted, or strong or sensible. I'm just plain scared. She paused at a window. A reassuring number of red tail lights still slipped down toward the gates. She could make it if she hurried. Mother wouldn't be proud of her any more, nor of Helen, for Helen was drawing out her minutes with Howard into scandalous length. Trillium had seen Mrs. Perry talking brightly with a sister while she watched the dressing room door for Helen and tried to keep Mr. Perry from saying something. Trillium snatched her dark red coat from the closet, pushed her hat and gloves into the big pockets, opened the drawer of her dressing table for the last time, and took out her purse. For the last time. She wanted to cry, overcome my memories of the three safe years she had spent in this room. Safe? she whispered. That was funny enough to cry about. Brushing away her tears, she put out her hand to turn off the light. No, leave it on. Then Sister Laurent would think she was coming back. Shutting the door softly behind her, she hurried to the east stairs and down. No one saw her. In the parking space, a car was just starting up. With her red coat flying, Trillium sped after it into the night. A quarter of an hour later, the east door opened again, and in that short time the scene had changed. Where the last bits of praise had fluttered around sisters and girls, there followed a strangely apprehensive silence. In her office door, Sister Osmond lingered, her gracious air very much askew. The prefects had herded the girls to their rooms, except for the few who still clung to their parents' company in the parlor, and the light-hushed voices made the only disturbance of the quiet. On the floor of the deserted hall, a single cigarette stub was an impudent reminder that there had been company. Sheriff Thatcher still believed that there was nothing amiss. 
but his young daughter, Kathy, could have told him that the atmosphere was supercharged. Behind closed doors the question ran. What had Helen Perry done this time? Had she finally eloped? Giggling, excited quite as highly over the retribution awaiting her, as they were over her flagrant absence, the girls whispered about Helen in the play, and wondered when they had had so much fun. At the moment the east door opened to admit a frightened girl in a red coat, Sheriff Thatcher was seated in Mother Theodore's office, his mind divided equally between two preoccupations. The fact that he dared not smoke in this holy place, and impatience with Mother's anxiety. Girls didn't leave their foolishness at the gates when they entered St. Aurelian's. In fact, the restrictions of convent life might well intensify a kid's natural yearning for the forbidden. Like his own longing for a cigar, the sheriff pondered. Never in his life had he wanted a stogie so badly as now, when he couldn't have it. This young Helen was a high flyer, boy crazy and rattle-brained into the bargain, if half of what Kathy said was true. She was kicking up her heels, and would be back in her own sweet time. A theory also held by Mrs. Perry, who was expounding it with an eye to doing as little damage as possible to Helen's chances for remaining at St. Aurelian's. The sheriff pursed his lips under his neat gray mustache, and nodded sagely, without giving much thought to it. Like Mrs. Penworthy, Jarvis Thatcher had been a schoolmate of Mother Theodore, and, since his motherless daughter was a sophomore at St. Aurelian's, he had attended the performance of Mustard Seed, and added his proud beaming to the universal glow. That was how he had come to be on hand when Helen's little escapade was discovered, and Mother had commandeered him, in spite of his protest, that the situation hardly merited a share of services. It was one of those times when a disinterested person would give anything to be somewhere else. Across from the sheriff, Helen's expensively handsome parents sat, her mother being gay to cover the strain, her father striving for nonchalance and failing. Behind her desk, Mother Theodore was too erect in her chair, stern, burning with righteous anger. St. Aurelian's was not a reformatory or a house of detention. When Helen returned, of her own free will, since it appeared they would never find her, she would be expelled for conduct unbecoming a member of the college body. Mother was about to deliver this pronouncement, when a soft tap came at the door. All eyes but Mother's flared with instant hope. Hers remained like granite. Come in. Sister Laurent poked her head around the door. Mother, excuse me. Trillian Pierce insists on seeing you. She says she has something to tell about Helen. Mrs. Perry gasped. Her husband said a low word to her, and the tension broke in the room. At Mother's nod, the sister disappeared, and Trillian entered, pausing unhappily when she saw the strangers. The pretty, eager woman, the tall man in tweeds, the second man who stood rolling an unlighted cigar in his fingers, his gray eyes studying her. He was large-boned and heavy, his face broody and pleasant, with the expected guilelessness of a fat man, and yet his bulk was not excess weight, because he was never designed for thinness. Without seeing him move, Trillium knew he would walk lightly, swiftly, to wherever he was going. He would turn up where one least expected to see him. Like here, what was he doing in Mother's office? She had met the sheriff at another school affair. Was it something concerning her, or her mother? Did he know why she had tried to get away? Trillium, you have something to tell us about Helen. Mother Theodore asked quietly. Of course, the sheriff's presence had nothing to do with herself. Fear, in these days, needed neither stimulus nor reason. Yes, Mother, Trillium answered. Do you know where Helen has gone? I think so, Mother. The simple words had an amazing effect. The Perrys came to their feet, Mr. Perry quickly sorting through the emotions which crowded him and resuming the role of an angry father. The sheriff bit the end off his cigar. And then, abruptly, Trillium was angry. Helen, with her silly behavior, had ruined more than the rules of St. Aurelian's. She deserves whatever punishment she gets, the girl decided wrathfully. She wrecked the only chance I might ever have to get away from here. She made me get rid of my coat. Now I'll tell what I know, and she can take the consequences for once. She went to Pirate Cove to meet Howard Cooper, Allison's brother, Trillium said, determined to crush any excuses Helen might try to make. He came to the play tonight on her invitation. She told me she meant to meet him after the performance, and she did. 
not Howard Cooper, Mrs. Perry wailed. Oh, she wouldn't. We have forbidden her to see him, or anyone. Helen's not a child to disobey. Her husband made an impatient gesture, and she subsided. Where is this pirate cove? he demanded, implying that he himself would track it down personally if no one replied. It borders our grounds on the west, sir, said Mother Theodore. The girls always regard it as a romantic spot. Then it's the place to look for Helen. Come on, Sheriff. Oh, Henry, not you, Mrs. Perry begged, and with reason, for her husband was plainly in a mood to turn Helen over his knee. Let the Sheriff go with Trillium, please. They'll bring her here. Have you anything more to tell us, Trillium? Mother asked, cool as if she were gathering facts in examination. No, not really, Mother. Helen said she was going, and I know she went, because I heard her asking for me in the dressing room. But before I came, she was gone. That was the truth. Mr. Perry began what Helen would call the outraged parent routine, and Mother cut him short. The sheriff ushered Trillium out. At another time, the girl might have found it amusing to see Mother handling a business tycoon, as if he were a freshman. But now, hastening down the long hall and out along the west cloister walk, her fear for herself slid over her in fragments, like the shadows cast by the moon through the old stone arches. "'I wouldn't be too much concerned over Helen, if I were you,' the sheriff said in the light tenor that somehow suited his size. "'Some kids manage to wriggle out of things, you know. She'll be scolded, probably confined to the campus for the rest of the year, but she won't be permanently dented. This isn't her last secret date, by a long shot. Say, looky here.' The sheriff paused at the end of the cloister walk. Beside them was the door of the contemplative's house, and in the wall, sunken below stone steps, was the curious little door to the tunnel, all good solid masonry that in the moonlight took on ethereal beauty. Yeah, like old ramparts, the sheriff said softly, kind of bulwarks thrown up against the evils of the world. Only in the moonlight the world doesn't look so evil, does it? Trillian was uncertain and as the sheriff started out across the lawn, she tucked her hand into his arm and kept close. The cove was not far, not more than a good sprint away, but in the quiet night there was an earthly quality about it. The bayou was not a river, because it had no current. It was too thickly overgrown to be called a lake, and yet it lacked the permanence of land. In the night, however, the highest sense looked like a solid floor. It took only a minute for them to see that the shore of Pirate Cove was bleak and deserted. A hoot owl gave a ghastly shriek, and Trillium shuddered. Helen, the sheriff called. Helen, are you here? The flutter of wings was the only answer. She's gone, Trillium whispered. Yeah, that's for sure. Say, what are you shaking about, little lady? You aren't scared, with me here, are you? I, no... Of course not, Mr. Thatcher, but I'd like to know what's become of Helen. Well, I'd say that's easy. If Howard has a car, wouldn't they have gone joyriding? Trillium laughed, and they walked quickly back through the shadowed cloister. Seated in the outer office, listening to the ominous rumblings of Mr. Perry, which greeted the sheriff's news, Trillium had her first leisure to think. She was alone. The door of the inner office closed. Helen's senseless dilemma preoccupied her no longer. One single inescapable fact absorbed all her thinking powers. Her own opportunity had gone by. There would be no further chance to get away tonight. What, then? Trillium, Mother said in the open doorway. The girl jumped. Trillium, will you send Alice and Cooper down, please? Even if she has gone to bed, have her dress and come down. And then go to bed yourself, dear. You look worn out. Trillium hurried away. It was permissible to hurry, during an errand for Mother. Outside Allison's door she stopped. Allison had three roommates, all chatterboxes, and with such news as Helen's brazen conduct to make them feel virtuous, Trillium's knock was buried fourfold. Opening the door she peeked around it. Hey, kids, message for Mother. In a sudden silence Trillium picked out Allison, the only one still dressed. She wants to see you, Miss Cooper. What about? She didn't confide in me, but I imagine it's about Howard and Helen. My goodness, I don't know a thing. A big brother never lets you in on anything like that. Tell it to Mother, Allison, 
Trillium suggested, and I'd get down there fast. She shut herself out into the hall, thinking that Allison would make more haste when there were no answers to be had. Immediately, however, the door flew open. Trillium, he's not with Helen. How do you know? Well, Hallie was disgusted because he waited and waited and she didn't come, and he said she'd stood him up. He was sitting in the car when I went out with Mother and Dad, and he was so mad he wouldn't even speak to me. Oh, said Trillium. It came out in a hoarse whisper. Helen beside the cove, waiting, too early for Howard, and the black shadows around her. What had happened to her? Maybe she didn't think she'd better, Allison suggested. Trillian gave her a push. Go on, Al. Mother's in a tizzy already. Allison flew down the hall, wondering why she should be frightened. Trillian went on into her own room, dropped her coat on the bed, and snapped off the light to look out of the window. The scene was peaceful as ever, the guest house showing yellow squares against the blackness of the pecan grove. She wondered if Jim was really there, probably discussing the play with his two companions, unaware that his quarry had almost escaped. And so long as he doesn't know, I can try again. Trillium thought and there will be no note to lose this time, nothing to give me away too soon. The flurry over Helen would claim all attention, and no one would notice if another girl acted a little off-key. Why, it's my golden opportunity, and I didn't even know it, she reflected. Trill, you hear? Mary Elizabeth whispered from the door. Trillium turned, feeling that she had just partaken of a reviving drink. Sure, come on in. You were super in the play, Liz. I haven't had a chance to tell you. Mary Elizabeth squealed. Oh, Trill, cover up that window. Hurry. Well, honestly, Trillium said, accustomed as she had become to Liz's imaginative scares, this one, nevertheless, impressed her with a different quality. Mary Elizabeth's blue eyes were almost black in spite of the glare from the two study lamps, the overhead light, and the dressing table lady with the umbrella shade. And when she plumped down on the foot of the bed, her face was deathly pale, and she clutched her old orchid house coat around her as if for protection. Trillium, being the handmaiden of fear herself these days, recognized Mary Elizabeth's state too well. Quickly she shut the door and sat down on the bed, knee to knee with her frightened visitor. This, what's wrong? I think I saw her, Trill. You, what? Saw Helen over by the cove. Well, naturally, that's where she went to meet Howard. I know, Trill, but... Mary Elizabeth's breath caught fearfully. When I saw her, there was a sister with her. A sister? Oh, now, Liz. I did. I saw her plain as day. She was looming over Helen. Only I thought the girl was you, Trill. You and Helen looked exactly alike in your costumes. You're so much alike anyway. A black spangled darkness broke over Trillium, cold moisture coming out of her forehead, and she lost the sense of Mary Elizabeth's explanation. In her costumes we looked exactly alike. That was why we were chosen for the parts. We were to portray the twin virtues of faith and hope. And with the moonlight to deceive further, Helen could easily be mistaken for me. Has something happened to her because she looks like me? Mary Elizabeth had not seen a sister. That was pure imagination. But she has seen someone. Jem? What would he be doing over beside the cove? I wasn't going out with Nettie tonight. We were just making a date for Saturday, Mary Elizabeth rattled on. And I still had my costume on, and Nettie was. Well, anyway, I saw this girl in white, and then this tall, muffled sister standing at the far corner of the cloister, and I wondered who you were meeting, Trill. And then I turned to talk to Nettie for a while, and when I looked again, the figure had grown to a giant, and its hands were extended like great claws, and the face stood out like a death skull. Liz, stop it! Trillium choked, but she could not halt the unrolling of the monstrous tail. In a soft, tense voice, Mary Elizabeth continued to weave her spell. When that horrible thing looked across at me, even at that distance, I felt my soul shrink. Inside I was jelly. I know I'd have died if Nettie hadn't been there. Did Nettie see her? Trillian whispered. Are you kidding? With me there? No, he didn't, and I... Oh, I didn't mention it. 
I know you stand in well with the sisters, so I wasn't worried even if you were getting caught. Suddenly Mary Elizabeth seemed to realize what she had been describing, and her eyes widened in horror, and she clapped her hand over her mouth. Trill, where did she go? It wasn't you. It was Helen, and she's still gone. What did that terrible sister do to her? Why, maybe she's punishing Helen for... The door opened at the same moment that a tapping sounded upon the panel, and Sister Osmond stood in the aperture. Mary Elizabeth, it's much too late for visiting. The two girls stood up from force of habit, and Mary Elizabeth said, I was just leaving, Sister. We were talking about the lovely evening, you know. Sister Osmond smiled. She knew, indeed, that the subject was the missing girl and not mustard seed. Of course, dear, now run along to your own room. Sister, please, couldn't she sleep with me tonight? Trillian begged. Sister Osmond merely smiled again and turned off all the lights but one. I think not. Helen will be back at any moment. It is much better that we keep to our regular routine. Good night, Trillian. The sister terminated her tour gracefully in the doorway, and all Trillian could manage was to whisper to Mary Elizabeth, Don't say anything. Before the door closed behind the two, the girl stepped over swiftly and laid her ear against the crack. They were gone. The hall was settling to quiet. She turned the lock and pushed the chair with its back under the knob. Then she sat down at her dressing table, staring at her image in the mirror. So the dread danger had not been imagined, Trillium admitted to herself, and knew then that there had always been a faint hope that she was wrong. The hope had been silly, baseless. The billikin belonged to Jim. In no other way could it have reached the campus. After all, who would make another person a gift of a broken statue, which had been of small value when it was whole? But what was Jem doing at the bayou? He had worn a cloak of some sort that made Mary Elizabeth see him as a nun. But that was not worth a second thought. Liz in the moonlight, in the distance from the west entrance to the cove, all were responsible for the deception. Jem's reasons for being there, that was what she must consider. Even a long time later, Trillium had but one answer. Jim had come into possession of the note she had written to Mother Theodore. He knew she was trying to run away. Why he should think she would go up by the bayou was a problem, but no more of a problem than his own presence there. He must have said something to Helen to frighten her off, so that she, instead of Trillium, had run down the long road and hitched a ride in a car. When she comes back, I'll have to talk to her, persuade her not to tell, Trillium decided. Exactly how she would manage to see Helen first, before the girl would be questioned by the sheriff, she did not try to work out. She would stay awake, listening, waiting. Outside on the grounds, flashlights bounded in long arcs, and men called, searching, their unbelief veering to dismay, as the groups parted and met, parted and met, always with the same news. No trace. Through her open window, Trillium heard them. Helen was gone, and whatever had happened to Helen was meant for Trillium herself. In some of the other wings, girls slept, but uneasily. At every window facing the front lawn, a watcher sat, her attention glued to the square of light laid on the grass from Mother's office. There were other squares as well from the long main corridor, but none with the fascination of that single one. It would go out, the girls knew, when Helen was found. Well, the sun came up and pushed the shadows back into the bayou, and the watchers yawned and went for a shower to wake them up. Down in Mother's office, someone finally remembered to turn out the light. In the morning softness, Mrs. Perry's face looked a little less ghastly. But when Sheriff Thatcher came in and made a bungling, compassionate attempt to tell her what they had found, she fainted. He was able to tell her because Chris Archer and Franz Eric, having kept with the search party all night, had come back again to Pirate Cove. The place was still in twilight, but the twilight of early morning is revealing, and then they saw that it was only the moon that had given solidity to the hyacinths. The delicate bowls were crushed in a wide swath, and just under a gap in the trailing roots there floated a brown soaked fragment of chiffon. End of chapter 8
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 9 I'll have to question her, Mother, you know that, the sheriff insisted. I have a feeling Trillium knows a little more than she volunteered last night, when she popped in here from her walk. And young Cooper, too. He was too broken up when I got hold of him this morning. Couldn't arrive at a coherent story at all. He kept insisting he hadn't seen anything of Helen, or anyone else. But he must have seen something. That trampled place at the edge of the bayou tells its own tale. Either she struggled, or he stamped around afterward. Oh, sorry, you don't need the details. Mother Theodore closed her eyes, as if to shut out some terrible sight, then crossed the room and looked down at the breakfast tray. You didn't eat much, Jarvis. Will you get Trillium down here for me, Emmy? Mother seated herself in a small rocker and began to rock gently, her hands under her scapular. Sunshine filled at the visitor's parlor, brightening the rug laying a high polish on the andirons, and on the silver vase filled with chrysanthemums. But its touch upon the sheriff's face was most unkind. A fat man does not easily look haggard, but Jarvis Thatcher, unshaven, red-eyed from lack of sleep, depressed by the torturing search, and the scene with the Perrys, was haggard in the morning light. His neat blue suit and the shoes he had carefully cleaned before coming into the building still bore splashes of swamp mud and when he leaned forward, rubbing his forehead wearily, Mother saw that his hands were scratched from swamp thorns. And yet, in spite of the fatigue that aged him, regardless of the must gray hair and his general air of being completely beaten down, Jarvis was more like the boy she had known than she had seen him in years. Mother's rocking slowed and stopped. There was a long hiatus, of course, in the time she had known Jarvis, the years of her novitiate and his own early climb in politics and business, coming finally to the death of his wife and Kathy's entrance into St. Aurelian's. But the very young school days were nearer now than that, the days when she had sat in front of him and listened to his sniffling all winter because he never had a handkerchief, when he had passed over greasy pork sandwiches as presents to her and she had stuffed them down a gopher hole going home. At the basketball games he had smelled like a sheep in the high excitement of the rooting section. In the night of the senior prom, when she told him she was going into the convent, he had cried and begged her to wait just a little while. She was so young, she knew nothing about life. Curiously comforted, Mother began to rock again. Why she thought of such things just now, she did not know, unless it was because Jarvis had called her Emmy, as he used to do. The parlor was quiet. It was wonderfully peaceful here, rocking, forgetting for the moment the awful hours just passed, and not yet thinking of the other hours, perhaps quite as awful, to come. Jarvis did not immediately repeat his request to see Trillium. Leaning forward, cracking his knuckles, he kept his eyes on the rug. After an interval he spoke. I wouldn't have said a time like this would ever come for you, Emmy, not with you choosing the sheltered life. It's something you don't expect, violent death in a convent. Mother Theodore smiled, not at the mention of violent death, but because Jarvis, like countless others, regarded the cloister as a sheltered place. Sheltered, yes, from family cares and from the day-to-day -day struggle for a livelihood, now that the convent was well established. But sheltered from pride, jealousy, anger, small bickerings? Oh, no. Sheltered only to be closed in with them, to recognize and overcome them. But for all the graces showered upon their state in life, sisters are none the less human. I'm glad I'm here, Emmy. I'll try to handle this thing as gently as possible. But I can't get around without slopping the puddle a little. I'll have to talk to the sisters, see if they heard Helen say anything about, almost anything, and I'll have to question the girls. Helen didn't kill herself. There's a footprint, pretty shapeless in that soft muck, but it's a man's, and in a place where the searchers swear they didn't step. He paused, and his eyes came to Mother's in sick appeal. Emmy, they all know, don't they? The sisters and the girls. I don't have to tell them. Some of them saw the disturbance around the bayou, Mother said quietly. We didn't try to keep it from them, but they think it was accidental. Mother Theodore sat a moment longer, but she took no comfort in it now. 
postponing the answers to all that the sheriff must find out would make it no better. I'm glad you're here, too, Jarvis, she said, and left the parlor. A few moments later, Mother returned with Trillium. The breakfast tray was gone. The sheriff had combed his hair and, in spite of the whiskers, assumed a competence that was reassuring. With a glance, he requested Mother to remain. Yet when she was seated again in her rocker, and Trillium on the edge of a love seat, he kept rifling through his little notebook, wetting his thumb to turn a page, apparently at a loss as to how to begin. Or, thought Mother, he might be using this ruse to excite Trillium, to let her think over whatever it was she concealed. The girl was at her wit's end. Mother Theodore's compassion burned high, as her sudden resentment against Jarvis. He had no right to inflict such misery upon an already panic-stricken girl. She opened her lips to protest, but the sheriff spoke before her. "'I'm sorry I had to call you in, Trillium. The little Perry girl was one of your chums, I understand. But you see, that's the reason why I think you can do something for her now. I think it's possible that you'll be able to help me find out uh, who killed her. Who killed her? But I thought... The girl's terror was in her eyes, and her hands clenched in her lap, in the stifled whisper that was all she could make of her words. I thought it was an accident. That was what she had been about to say, but she didn't think it at all. From the first dreadful minute, when Hilaria Toms had burst into her room, screaming that they were pulling Helen out of the bayou, she had known it was not an accident. Jem had killed her, because he thought she was Trillium Pierce. "'Don't be nervous, dear,' Mother said, and her pretense of naturalness was so good that neither the sheriff nor Trillium even glanced at her. The sheriff, seeming to hesitate often, went over the story of Helen's last visit to the dressing room, leading Trillium on without haste. But that quiet manner was deceptive. Behind his apparent leisure he was thinking— putting together pieces of the puzzle, pieces fitting into the outer rim, perhaps, but nevertheless important. And in time, days from now, possibly weeks, he would have worked it into the center, and the picture would be complete. Mother Theodore, listening to the slow, somewhat aimless questioning, knew it was not aimless, but driving straight to a point that had thus far remained invisible. "'So you suddenly decided you must talk to Mother last night,' the sheriff continued. And when you came in, you went to the office to find her. That right? The girl nodded. Where had you been, Trillium? She answered, too pat for it to be anywhere near the truth. I had gone for a little walk. I was too tired to sleep, and I had a headache. So when I went to my room and heard how noisy the girls were, I took my coat and went out. By which door? The east. I didn't leave the grounds. Trillium let her gaze meet the sheriff's. She could do it because that small bit happened to be the truth. And you didn't see Helen while you were outside? No, sir. She was out on the west lawn. I was on the east. There were cars still leaving. I just walked around a little and watched them. Well, then I believe that's all, Trillium. The girl sat still as a watched woods thing that knows its danger. If only she dared tell this kind, fatherly man— but their mother's letter had said plainly, Don't tell, no matter what happens. Breaking that trust could not help Helen. She could not be brought back. Behind the warning was everything her mother feared. And if he killed Helen because he thought she was me, then he thinks I know him, and I can identify him, and I can't. Is there something more, Trillium? The sheriff asked. She sprang up. Oh, no, sir. A second later, the door closed behind her. Mother Theodore walked to the window. To distract him, the sheriff wondered. But hardly that. Emmy was incapable of slyness. The assembly is waiting for us, Jarvis, she said. All right, Mother. He stood up obediently, but Mother still remained with her back to him. They are very young, Jarvis. We show them as much. Too young to be in terror, Emmy. And one of them is... She just went out of here. Mother whirled on him, and Jarvis knew that her mask of impatience was fright, rather, because she also had seen that Trillium was in terror. Educate them to stand on their own feet, to be self-reliant. But one learns by doing, 
and in the convent there was little to call up a show of independence. Let a situation require an important decision, and they would flounder like trillium, blinded by emotion, incapable of sensible thought. I'll help her, myself, today, Mother determined. But aloud she said, She is concealing something, I know, Jarvis, but it's nothing of value to you. She broke a rule or two last night, probably, and she doesn't want me to find out. Trillium is not given to untruths. Good, good, the sheriff answered. All right, we'll go along to the assembly. Oh, and mother, wouldn't it be well to resume classes as usual today? There's something settling about routine, seems to me. And seems to me, mother agreed. Routine was the backbone of life in the convent. A bell call for prayers, a bell summoning mother, a bell for dinner and supper and lights out. Always bells, and although sometimes to a tired sister the compelling tones were the lash of the devil himself, she also could reflect that people climbed to heaven to the tune of bells. The sheriff, acutely conscious of his whiskered appearance, stood before the assembled staff and student body, and depended upon his gentle father attitude to reassure where words might fail. The case, he said, was not closed, and would not be until it was solved. There was no explanation for what had happened. The building was open last night. Strangers were everywhere. Someone must have lurked in the grounds. But there was nothing more to happen now. Deputies were investigating. It was over. Mention it only as an accident in your letters home until more is known. The papers were being very discreet. Very little publicity. Trillium, sitting carefully and clenching her hands whenever she could remember, kept her eyes on the back of Mary Elizabeth's neck and wondered what she should do. Not merely wondered, but ached with the emptiness of indecision. She would not be permitted to leave, she knew that now. Even though she might be able to elude the sheriff's men, there was the one who would be watching, following. He had found and read her letter to Mother Theodore, and it had led him to act. He had killed an heir. He would have to make another attempt. And flight would only make the attempt more necessary. Then he would be certain of what he suspects now, that I know him. If only I did. Many of the girls were crying, touched by Mother's tribute to Helen. Deliberately, Trillium did not listen. Except for a strange quirk, Mother might have been saying these things about Trillium Pierce instead of Helen Perry. But I'll go crazy if I think about that, the girl cautioned herself desperately. I'll think about what to do. If I could only know. If I could talk with Uncle Henry. I can, she breathed, and Hilaria Toms, beside her, turned. Trillium, however, sat dry-eyed and oblivious to her surroundings. She could telephone to Uncle Henry, not from the convent building, where Sister Osmond would have to note the call, in order to make the charges to the proper person, not from Marysville, for the sheriff's men would allow no one to leave the grounds. There was one telephone on the campus, unconnected with the switchboard, one she dared not use. The girls were rising, the group breaking up on the stage. As Trillian moved out into the aisle, Mary Elizabeth caught her by the arm. Trill, look! Where? Sister Atene. She's like, like the one I saw, you know? Trillium stared at the old sister, who was humping slowly along, feeling for the backs of the seats to guide her, her shoulders swathed in a black shawl, which was bunched to the top of her head in the back. Liz, don't be silly. Old Atene isn't as tall as I am, and you're a spook with a giantess, remember? She wasn't a spook, and I might have been mistaken about the size. You could have been mistaken about the whole thing, Trillium said sensibly. She reached the hall and in the crowd slipped away from Mary Elizabeth. She would have to watch a chance to use that one available telephone, and now, for no apparent reason, it seemed not so impossible. Sister Teen made her feeble way out of the auditorium. Sudden death did not impress her as it did some. She was too near to the gates herself. And she had another preoccupation far more disturbing. She still had not found her missing habit. Under the shawl, the neck of the old one, worn through to the white lining, was hidden, but it was a nuisance to be hugging something around her. Secretly, because she was ashamed to think she might have stuck the habit off somewhere and forgotten about it, or even not have put it out on the line at all, she hunted through the cloister. In the following days, the sisters would come upon her at odd times, going through the linen closets, burrowing in dresser drawers, 
and soon the word went around that poor old Atene was really losing her grip. Everyone was kinder than ever. The younger sisters remembered the times they had treated her slightingly, and now made a point of keeping her company whenever they could snatch a moment. And so Atene's searchings for the lost habit were to become even more secret, and more of a worry to her, because the sister's kindness left her so little time. It would indeed be miserable days for Sister Atene. Leaving the auditorium after the assembly, Franz Eric and Crispin Archer came out of the commons east door and paused for a cigarette. Neither had a class the next hour, and they had fallen into the way of being together when no duties interfered. Since they had stood beside the bayou in the early morning and seen what lay under the trailing roots of the hyacinths, they had talked of nothing else. But now, looking out from the parking lot to the grand vista of lawn and pecan grove, they were silent. So, said Crispin at last, having eulogized the dear departed and enshrined her silly little life among the immortals of the old school, we now take up the traditional hunt for the golden fleece. And what in the name of heaven that is, I'd admire to know. From the buzz following Mother's announcement in assembly, I say it's another of the lovely old traditions, no doubt also taking place in a cemetery. They all seem to have the same locale. Franz was not in a mood for levity. Arms folded, mouth grim, he glared at the gentle countryside. It was impossible for him to appear unattractive. Certain young ladies would even have maintained, even that his glowering held more enchantment than most men's gallantry. The sheriff came out at the top of the steps and stood lighting a cigar. Whether Franz saw him was a question, but Crispin did, and quietly turned his back. A galling waste of it, Franz muttered, and even before he continued, Archer knew he had gone back to the subject of Helen Perry. Look at all that little kid had to live for. She hadn't done anything yet. She hadn't had time. What was she, nineteen, twenty? And now she's nothing but a heartache for her mother. Why did she have to live if she had to die like that? Crispin blew out a cloud of smoke. Behind the sheriff, the door opened, and young Kathy Thatcher danced out in the company of Tolvetson. As if he were startled, Franz swung around. No, don't leave, Crispin said quickly, too low for anyone else to hear. Thatcher questioned us this morning, most thoroughly. He's probably homeward bound for a shave if the kid ever lets him go. Kathy, in a bright red dress, was a wonderful antidote for somberness. I didn't think we'd have it, anyway not on the traditional date. She chattered to her father in Tolvotson, but the seniors are to have their class meeting and elect a chairman. This very afternoon, Mother says, and the chairman is always the most popular girl in school. Then it will be you, pet, said the sheriff. But I'm only a sophomore, Daddy. And what is this golden fleece? Tolvotson asked, beaming on Kathy like the fairy tale uncle. Oh, it's something different every year, and we hide it. I mean, the seniors will hide it this year because they found it last year, and then all the rest of us hunt for it, and whatever class finds it can keep it for another year. End of chapter, the sheriff said firmly. Run along now, honey, and I'll see you soon. He kissed her, and Kathy ran inside. The sheriff and Tolvoltson joined Franz and Crispin in the parking lot. The world is perfect, and only man is vile, said the artist, indicating the peaceful landscape. My, my, trouble is very foreign to St. Aurelian's this morning. You weren't with us at the bayou, Franz said shortly. True, I was not, but Mother Theodore put it rather well, I thought, the young girl completing her journey with a little more swiftness than has been granted to us. Nice. It places the happy emphasis on reaching the goal, not upon the journey itself. Crispin dropped a cigarette and stepped on it. She'd lived through the only happy part of life, tore her childhood. I'd say she's better off. She'd have to hit the ball when she left here, probably marry some louse that would beat her every time he hiccuped. And then the immortal words of Mother Theodore, we all have to go sometime, so... He ended with an expressive shrug. Franz, glowering at the ground, said nothing. Tolvoltson took off his beret and stood tall and powerful, as if he offered another private tribute to the dead. The sheriff sighed. Well, whatever the reason or lack of it, I have to find out why it happened. If I could be the Almighty for a few minutes and look into some of the silent partners in this business. Yeah, I'd like to be the Lord and solve it quick. And what, for instance, would you like to know, Lord? Archer asked with a quizzical smile. 
Where everybody was, for instance. If I knew that, I'd know everything. The sheriff's gaze slid carelessly over the three faces, and came to rest on a far-off point in the pecan grove. Franz, he noted, registered exasperation with this thick-headed minion of the law. Tobolson was mildly hurt. Archer shrugged, found another cigarette, and gave it his amused attention. "'Well, we've accounted for our own whereabouts, Sheriff,' Chris said. "'As I explained this morning, I left the auditorium during the last act of the play. I can only stand so much sweetness and light, and I wanted to be at least normally alert, to meet a battery of admirers. So I came out here for a smoke.' As if he were well satisfied, Mr. Thatcher nodded. "'Franz left with me,' Archer added, without even a glance at his impatient colleague. "'I did, but we didn't stay together. I went to my office in the gym wing,' Franz muttered. "'Eric likes his public in small portions,' Crispin explained. "'Quality rather than quantity. The trek into that wing discouraged the faint-hearted. Franz growled something that was seldom heard at St. Aurelian's and Tolvetson said in the pause, I need not repeat my alibi, should we call it, Sheriff? Oh, alibis are not called for yet, Jarvis said with quick friendliness. No, indeed. You were showing your paintings until how late? Eleven? When Tolvetson spread his hands as if he turned time loose on its own, the Sheriff resumed. See, you're all in the clear. Now there's another thing I'd like to know, and that is, where did Trillium Pierce go last night when she left the convent? Trillium? Oh, the little dark one. Hope in the play. Crispin grinned. She looks guileless enough. Don't tell me she's holding out on you, Thatcher. I'm afraid so. She put on her coat, she says, and went out for a breath of air because she had a headache. But when she came back after that breath of air, she ran to the office, geared silly, and volunteered to tell us all she knew about Helen. His listeners received the news equably, each intent upon some point in the really lovely view. She didn't leave the grounds, the sheriff went on. I think she was telling the truth there, but what she did in that time. He let his eyes travel to the guest house and roam over it speculatively. It was a very short distance from the convent door to the guest house, short enough for a girl to run. He began to whistle through his teeth softly. I can tell you how she went, Sheriff, but not where, Tobolson remarked, with every appearance of frankness. I attached no importance to it at the time, which is why it happened to slip my mind when we talked this morning. I see, but this how business? She went in a car. Rather, she came back in one. I was crossing the parking lot here when this car drove up and stopped, and the girl jumped out and ran into the building. I didn't speak to her. In fact, she didn't see me at all. I thought nothing of it, beyond wondering whether she would be caught in her little escapade. Apparently she wasn't. Did you get a look at who was in the car? No, the light was dim, and I wasn't paying much attention. I was tired out with questions about the pictures on display, and of course at that time I didn't know that Helen was missing. There was no commotion about her then. Could you describe the car, Tobolson? Anything about it you remember, the make, the color... I recollect the color, a beautiful shade, sort of translucent blue. It was a wonderful car. Ah, uh, you're pretty sure of that? I don't forget colors, Mr. Thatcher. Well, say, that's really a help. Takes an artist to observe what the rest of us might pass up. Do you know who owns that car, Sheriff? Archer asked, idly. Oh, yes, only one like that in Marysville. Well, good day, gentlemen. See you later. With his light step more nimble than ever, the sheriff crossed to his car and climbed in. So Tobolson had been showing his pictures until eleven o'clock, but at a quarter before eleven, Trillium had come panic-stricken into Mother's office. His mamma certainly had a bouncing boy, didn't he? Crispin observed, watching the sheriff's departure. Funny to see a fat man so light on his feet, like he's inflated. Tobolson, appreciating the description, chuckled. But Franz made an irritable noise and strode off toward the golf tee. Crispin's eyes followed him, but when he spoke, his remark did not concern Franz. I'd be interested to know why you mentioned the little girl's adventure, Tor. We must be truthful, Chris. If we fail to be frank, and these incidents and our knowledge of them is found out afterward, well, we must remember our curious position here. 
Strangers, we have nothing but our reputation to back up our innocence. Good heavens, Tor, Thatcher doesn't suspect us. Not of murder, I hope, but he was playing with the idea that Trillium had paid a short visit to the guest house. Not that I would blame her in view of the provocation. I do look out for you boys, you see. Chris grinned. Very thoughtful, thanks. Maybe I can do the same for you sometime. Tor sighed. I am too old, but I appreciate the insinuation. A bell rang inside, and the two men went their separate ways. The same bell was a summons to Trillium to consider the history of civilization. Instead of pattering dutifully off to Sister Enfoy's class, she remained where she was, inside the east door, peeking out at the two men who stood talking at the edge of the parking lot. There had been three. When the bell parted the two, Trillian's vigil became a breathless, intense weariness. As the door opened under Archer's hand, she crept down the steps that led to the tunnels. It was very shadowy here. She heard Archer's step go up, along the corridor, and fade. Whether he had a class, she did not know, but at least he was in the building. Dear Lord, I almost wish you'd make Tobolson go along to the guest house. Trillian whispered as she looked out again. But Tobolson, striding mightily, was bound for his class of sketchers, who today were doing pecan trees. So now there was no reason why she should not go. Trillian let herself out into the warm sunshine, wondering how anyone could catch a glimpse of her and not know that fear was riding her like an old man of the sea. No one, apparently, saw her. As she had done a week ago, she walked across the lawn. The dream of that other morning never even entered her head. I look important, she thought, as if I had a message for one of the gentlemen. I'm the only one who thinks I'm out of place. She stepped up on the stoop as she had before, knocked, waited, and again as before there was no answer. Turning the knob, Trillian went inside. The small house was so silent that the clock tick sounded like a sledgehammer. She would not look for the billikin, but she had to enter the living room to hunt for the telephone, and her eyes went straight to the mantel. The strange little god of things as they ought to be was gone. So he has packed it away, Trillium thought numbly, and Billikin's absence confirms what I knew. It belongs to Jim. When the clock struck, she crossed the room and took up the telephone. She was not afraid now. She was acting wisely. The call would be charged to this number, but probably each of the tenants would have made calls to New Orleans, and one more would never be remarked. The operator in Marysville answered. Trillian gave the number, heard a series of clicks, and then the familiar voice of her uncle's housekeeper. Miss Alvard's residence, long distance. Yes'm, go ahead. May I speak to, to Mr. Alvard, please? Trillium asked, pitching her voice low. No, ma'am, he ain't home, not now. Miss Alvard, she's here. You want to talk to her? No, Trillium said, too sharply, and she repeated, No, thank you. When will Mr. Alvard be in? Couldn't say, ma'am. He been gone since yesterday. Won't be back for a long time. Gone on a business trip. Trillium stood stiffly, the receiver pressed so tight that her ear felt brittle. So Uncle Henry was gone on a business trip to see her mother? You there, miss? the voice asked. You sound like Miss Trillium. No, no, I... I'm a secretary calling from Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge? Didn't the operator say Marysville? You're mistaken, I'm afraid. Goodbye, and thank you very much. She dropped the receiver before the anxious old woman could inquire again. Her heart was beating so loudly that she had to stand for a moment, leaning against the wall, steadying herself. The housekeeper might be puzzled enough to report the call to Aunt Agnes, but her investigation would go no farther. Aunt Agnes was a clubwoman, with too many interests to waste much time on a college niece. When Uncle Henry returned, he might hear about the call, and come. But for now, for the immediate dangerous now, there was nothing to do but wait. A step sounded outside the front door. Trillian was instantly alerted to her predicament. This was a phase she had not planned, that she might be caught in the guest house. She darted across to a wide arch leading into a hallway. It has to go somewhere, she thought, and turned into a small kitchen. And the kitchen, naturally, had an outside door. Someone had come into the living room, whistling, dropping something on the floor. 
in her haste to get away trillium lost her hold on the screen door and the snap brought an instant response from the unseen man chris is that you franz eric's voice trillium tiptoed to the edge of the porch behind her she heard franz moving into the little hall into the kitchen then pausing before he pushed open the door and came out his delight was evident trillium sidled toward the steps oh don't go i haven't a thing to do for the next hour but i have mr eric i'm very late for history right now history we're making it ourselves he folded his arms looking down at her in a way that she found most disconcerting feeling her cheeks grow pink trillium tilted her chin high i wanted to see someone i mean i have a message oh for me yes i've sprained my wrist rather badly so i must give up fencing and golf for a long long time that long Surely it's not so bad as it might be. I know that it hasn't been bandaged. Well, I just did it. Oh, how sad. On our front door, no doubt. Let me see it. I'm good at sprains. He took her right hand, moving the fingers and feeling the tendons. Trillium knew he was laughing at her, knew he felt the trembling of her hand, and most likely took it to be the shuddering of ecstasy at his touch. The conceit of him. And yet she did not pull away. Backed against the wall, her eyes on his handsome face, she saw a remarkable change come over him. The amusement faded, even the delight, and when he looked up it seemed to her that he understood her misery and shared it. Trillium, what's the matter? he asked quietly. Helen, that's over, and still you're afraid. Don't be. He took her other hand, laid in it the one he held, and stepped back. We couldn't be friends, I don't suppose, could we? Could they? Could she confide in him? Trillian wondered. Tell him what she feared? Oh, no, she gasped. No. I didn't think so, Franz sighed. Then his pixie smile flashed out. But it would be more flattering if you weren't so sure. The smile lasted only for the second it took for Trillian to be gone around the corner of the house. He never had floundered before, and the knowledge that he could, even as others, kept him staring gloomily off into the beacons, until the clock struck the next hour. "'Lord, what a waste!' he grumbled, as he leaped off the porch. Ten little maidens will be awaiting him on the tennis court. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Murder Takes the Veil》by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Ten. Jarvis Thatcher stopped at home in Marysville only long enough to make himself presentable, before driving across town to an old white house on the outskirts. It was a genial place its grounds rambling in a leisurely expanse from the street to the gardens at the back. Beneath it, among the blocks which elevated the house above the dampness, a few chickens lay dusting themselves. As the sheriff came up the path, a brown hen stalked out from under the house, walked solemnly up the steps to the porch, eyed him, and hopped solemnly down. The performance was so prim that Jarvis laughed, and immediately a hammock stopped swinging on the porch. "'Jarvis Thatcher, of all people!' a woman exclaimed, struggling up out of the hammock. She was younger than the sheriff, sleek and well-groomed, even after an hour of laziness. Her slightly gray hair cut close like a man's, and her makeup so light it gave only vitality to her face. "'I've been trying to reach you, Jarvis. Come into the house. I was just thinking about a cup of coffee. You're working on the Perry case, of course.' The sheriff followed her into the house answered her questions, and wondered why it was that he never stopped of dropping in on Ermine Wagner. She was the sort to enjoy a chat without expecting a proposal of marriage. She brought the sheriff out to the kitchen and seated him in her upholstered breakfast nook while she made the coffee. He felt decidedly restful. Ermine's green linen slenderness was pleasant to look at. Listening more than he talked, Jarvis pondered matters that had nothing whatever to do with the tragedy at St. Aurelian's until Ermine sat down opposite him and poured the coffee. "'Now, Jarvis, you want to know about the girl I picked up. Did she tell you what she was afraid of?' 
the sheriff pouring cream into his coffee was surprised into slopping oh i'm not clairvoyant jarvie ermine smiled anyone with an eye in their head could see that girl was scared when i heard about helen perry this morning i wondered if well if they had been afraid of the same thing possibly and that i'd brought the other one back to more than she'd bargained for it bothered me jarvis the girl might have known what she was doing running away the breakfast nook was not made for any one of his bulk, but by shifting strategically, the sheriff was able to lean forward. Suppose you tell me what happened, Ermine. Oh, I will. Not that I think this is so important, but it isn't up to me to judge. I went to the play alone, since I was unable to find anyone willing to face the talents of St. Aurelians, and I wasn't in any hurry to leave. I talked to the sisters, stopped to look at Tolbertson's paintings. And by the way, Jarve... How did Mother Theodore ever snare a man of his genius? Is he a genius? The sheriff twinkled. Certainly, and he's a personage, not merely an artist. And then you started home? Yes, just as I was leaving the parking lot, this girl ran out and started down the road, and I picked her up. I thought at first she was the one they had been asking about, Helen Perry. There was quite a bit of whispering about how she had scampered off on a date, and I didn't want to be an accessory to anything clandestine. When I told her, she denied it so vehemently I had to believe her. And then, I suppose, to convince me, she said she knew where Helen was. Yes, Trillium even led me out to the cove to look. And Helen, was she, then? I'm afraid so, Ermine. She'd been in the water a long time when we found her, at least seven hours, the coroner said. Yeah, I'm afraid she was there when Trillium and I went out. Ermine was not the woman to burst into tears, but she did take a moment to recover. I made the girl go back. She didn't want to. She almost jumped out of a car when I insisted. But I know Helen's mother, and I didn't see any point in prolonging her worry. Jarvis, this hardly makes sense now, does it? It made so little difference that I brought Trillium back. It didn't help you to find Helen in time. But if she feared something herself, don't you understand what I did? She paused, bewildered. Only I don't see what there could be in a quiet place like St. Aurelian's to frighten a girl as she was frightened. When I went there, the most ungodly thing that happened was a bat in a dormitory. The Trillium is so afraid that she can't even tell what's the matter. The only answer she could find was to run away. The sheriff swilled the dregs of his coffee slowly around the cup. Trillium's strange conduct was his only lead. It could be something unconnected with the murder. But the two girls were friends, and trouble was so foreign to St. Aurelian's that it was hardly possible for two unrelated forces to be at work, one resulting in a girl fleeing in terror and the other murdered. It couldn't happen. "'They're tied together in some way,' Jarvis said, unaware that he spoke aloud. Ermine was one of those people with whom silence could be broken or kept.' I'll have to find that tie, and without Trillium's help. But where to begin? Ermine let him think for a minute. Would it be something Trillium saw last night that made her panicky? The sheriff's jaw dropped. I hope not, Ermine. So do I, and it might not be, if you only knew when she began to be afraid. She left the words to trail through the sheriff's mind, hoping he would pick them up. The same idea, Jarvis realized, had been in the back of his head all the time. That's something I can find out, Ermine, and if some new circumstance transpired at about the time that Trillium began to be afraid. Their glances met and slipped apart. The only new circumstance, they both remembered, was the advent of the three occupants of the guest house. The sheriff left soon after, going straight to the telegraph office. It would take some time to unravel the past but it could be done. At four o'clock, Mother Theodore, smiling rather wanly in answer to their excitement, shut the seniors into the auditorium for their class meeting, and walked in deep meditation back to her office. Ever since Jarvis Thatcher left, Mother had been disturbed, not by any specific thing, but intuitively, as any woman can be disturbed without reason. She was irritated with herself. The superior of an institution like St. Aurelian's had no business being bothered by intuition. Perhaps it was because Mother was so annoyed with herself that she spoke sharply to Rendy, who was lingering in the corridor gloom outside the office. 
Rindy's back was turned to Mother, and to one approaching it seemed that Rindy was observing something she had no call to see, for she was leaning forward, tense, her attention so completely upon whatever she saw inside that she heard nothing of Mother's advent. It was not until Mother Theodore was beside her that Rindy jumped, murmured something about giving this here little old door a good polishing, and flew to work. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Archer,' said Mother Theodore. Crispin Archer glanced casually at the letter he held, and slipped it into his pocket. "'Good afternoon, Mother.' "'Has the last mail come?' "'I believe so.' He gave her his most captivating smile. "'Would you have any idea of what might have become of Mercy Harding? We were to come to grips with misplaced modifiers this afternoon.' "'Mercy is a senior, Mr. Archer. I'm afraid you'll have to excuse her today.' Mother Theodore was not in the habit of making excuses for the girls. Normally she would have rung for Sister Osmond, who would locate the recalcitrant Miss Harding, and forwarding her with all speed to her appointment. But Mother was in a mood to enjoy the sight of Mr. Archer being miffed. It was good for him to be forgotten by a lady, even a very young one. The hunt for the Golden Fleece is one of the high points of our year, sir, and only an act of God can keep a senior from this meeting today. They elect the chairman of the committee, you see, and no one would miss the voting. To be elected chairman is the greatest honor a senior can be given. How charming, said Crispin, but the implication was the exact opposite. Oh, well, we too once were young and gay. The hunt has, of course, driven all else from their girlish minds. I trust so, Mr. Archer. Mother nodded coldly, she considered, and went on into her office and closed the door. I should have gone the whole way and been a contemplative, she thought, and said a swift prayer for forgiveness for the uncharitable reflection she was entertaining toward Mr. Archer. At that moment, Trillium stood among her milling classmates, her thoughts in as dizzy a whirl as the scene. She had never for a minute expected it to be chairman. Even when Mary Elizabeth, the inventive member of the class, suggested a baby muskrat to be the fleece this year, she had made no objection. She would have nothing to do with the muskrat. It couldn't seem like a throwback to the past. But in the landslide vote she had been elected chairman, and now she would have to creep through darkened halls with the muskrat in her arms. And if Jim should know... Trillium swayed, and a girl pushed a chair under her, and the joy mounted because of having elected a chairman who took the honor so to heart that she nearly fainted. And in the chair Trillium sat, smiling, drinking the water Hilaria brought, and all the time remembering that on the night the fleece was hidden, there was never a light showing, and the halls were black as outer darkness itself. If only she dared tell Mother or the Sheriff how she had tried to get in touch with Uncle Henry, how Helen had been mistaken for her, and it was no use to keep looking for a tramp who might be guilty of the murder. But her mother's letter had said, No matter what happens, say nothing. But did that what include killing? The girls were quieting down, waiting expectantly for her speech of acceptance, and Trillian made it. Thanking her classmates for the honor they had conferred upon her, she remembered under her conscious thoughts that this was the day for her weekly letter from her mother. It always came on the same day. Uncle Henry would have sent it on. She would go immediately after this meeting to get it. Rindy, polishing, was still in the hall when Trillium sped to the office. Rindy was very happy. Good luck had come her way today, and how easily she might have missed it. If she had just been working even at the other end of the hall, she would never have seen those three nice gentlemen come for their letters, or had them stop to speak to her. One asked if she would give his room in the guest house a special cleaning. Another wanted something pressed. And the third? Rindy giggled. Oh, ain't he the one? She muttered aloud. And all the time he know like I know that mother don't want him mixing up with the young ladies. Were you speaking to me, Rindy? Trillium asked, pausing breathless at the office door. No, sure ain't, Rindy answered. She couldn't help giggling again. In her pocket was a five-dollar bill dampened slightly from all the time she had felt of it with her scrub-water hands. Easy money, the first that had ever come her way. Trillium heard the laughter in the girl's voice, but she did not respond. The letter from New Orleans was not on the table. Rindy, she began. But what was the use in asking Rindy? 
She had nothing to do with the students' letters. You look happy, Randy. Santa Claus good to you already? Yes'm, and that's the truth. Trillium, is that you? Mother Theodore called from the inner office. Trillium was startled. She had not noticed the door standing ajar. She stepped forward, pushing it open. Mother was seated at her desk, her pen in hand. I have a message for you from Mr. Tovaldson. He asked me this morning for permission to have you pose for him. You may refuse if you wish. The room spun around Trillium. Franz had tried the friendly approach. Tovaldson wanted to get her up in that horrible bare studio. Trillium, I think I must insist that you tell me what is troubling you. The girl's face turned even whiter, and involuntarily Mother arose. With the desks between them, they confronted one another, and each knew that this was as far as the conference would go. I want to help you, dear, Mother urged, but the sealed, secret look in Trillium's eyes warned her that it was a vain attempt. I know you are worried, and I know that the very fact of telling someone would ease your mind. It need not be me. Wouldn't you like to talk with Father Michael? Trillium's gaze fell to her own hands, gripping the edge of the desk. I would like to, yes, Mother, but not just now. Mother Theodore waited a moment, then seated herself again, and took up her pen. Tobolson is doing a mural for us, she said briskly, several large portrait figures with a number of others grouped around them, possibly angels. He seems a little vague about it yet, but I understand these things grow from the original sketches. She smiled. It's an honor, dear. The girl managed to smile back. Two honors in one day, and both so deceptive, like the hyacinths blooming delicately with their roots hidden in slime. Has he asked some of the other girls to pose for him, mother? Yes, and they're both thrilled to be immortalized. Nervista Braddy and Little Minna Marsh. I'm sure posing must be tiresome, but they don't seem to think of that. I have to answer, Trillium thought, and it will have to be yes. Someone came into the outer office, and she said quickly, I'll do it, of course, and thank you, mother. She laid her hand on the knob, but instead of opening the door, she pushed it shut. Mother Theodore, I didn't mean to hurt you. It isn't you. It's just that I can't tell anyone. The girl's misery was so touching that the sight of it blurred for mother. It's perfectly all right, dear, she said. Trillium flung open the door and ran out, almost colliding with Sister Enfoy, because her tears made it impossible for her to see where she was going. Down in the guest house, Crispin Archer sat at the piano. For a half hour he had been playing the same theme with his own improvisations, each more weirdly minor than the last. Franz, sunk in a big chair with his head resting on one arm of it, his knees hung over the other, stared at the ceiling. Since the young ladies of St. Aurelian's had temporarily forsaken education due to the hunt for the Golden Fleece, there was nothing for either of them to do. "'Are you going to play that tune all night?' Franz grunted at last. "'I am seeing pink spiders on the ceiling.' "'I'll quit when they turn purple.' Chris glanced at the picturesque black head in the chair, and a smile that was not quite amused played over his face. His square hands hit the keys with clumsy power as if he had a greater strength than he dared use. But the harmony that resulted was a dance of capricious daintiness. Suddenly, Franz sat up, sniffing. Crispin continued to play. Without being deliberate enough to have a motive, Franz rose, stretched, and sauntered out into the little back hall from which opened the kitchen and bedrooms. Once out of sight, he became alert, sniffing again. The tainted smoke, here, was unmistakable. Noiseless on the carpet, he advanced to Tolson's door. Perhaps the artist believed his door to be closed, because only a crack remained open. But through that crack, Franz saw Tolson, intent on what he was doing. He was tearing up a letter and burning it, bit by bit, in an ashtray. End of chapter 10《ハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッピーのハッ
have a beautiful throat, my dear, exquisitely slender, and you carry your head well. You would think that all American women would stand proudly. They have everything in the world to inspire them. But no, they slouch and sag. In Europe, where sometimes a woman carries all her worldly goods in a basket on her head, that's where you see the beautiful postures. Torvaldsen laid aside a brush and carefully selected a clean one. Trillium, seated on the dais, did not attempt a reply. The pulse beat hard in her throat. Perhaps he had noticed. He could require her to sit there under his minute observation, conscious of every heartbeat and change of expression, but she would neither make conversation nor pretend to enjoy it. He had asked her advice many times in the draping of the white material around her, explaining how she would be the main figure of the central group, the personification of the spiritual. And Trillium's acknowledgment had been small. Now, she thought, let him talk to himself if he finds the silence too oppressive. For her own, she had other preoccupations. The part she must play in the hunt tonight, the dark halls, and the stealthy journey to the hiding place, with the object they had selected as the golden fleece. There could be no possible danger, she told herself, for the hundredth time. The halls would be crowded, even though the crowd remained invisible in the darkness, and there was added safety in the secrecy surrounding the chairman's identity. When the bell rang, Trillium shed her white draperies and emerging in blouse and skirt, stepped down from the dais. "'Tomorrow, then, at the same time?' Tobolson asked as she left. "'Yes, sir.' said Trillium, and slipped past Nurse Brady, who was entering. Nerissa had no objection to posing. Dropping her books on a chair, she hurried over to look at the first sketch of Trillium resting on the easel. It was blocked in highlights and shadows, broadly done, but the eyes, gazing up at something far beyond the border of the picture, were so expressive of fear and sadness that even Nerissa was shocked. This was a Trillium she did not know, a stranger with familiar features. Tolwitzen was sitting back in the armchair against the wall, brooding over his work, the girl forgotten. And Uncle Tor, Nerissa saw, had upon him the same sadness as the painted face. Instead of questioning, as she would have liked to do, she stepped back quietly, afraid to interrupt the artist's reverie. It was not Nerissa's way to be still when she wanted to talk, but Tor's mood discouraged conversation. In the strong north light, Surrounded by the bare studio setting, there was a starkness about him, a stripping away of all pretense, the genial uncle character gone. Nerissa was frightened. She was just deciding to move noiselessly to the door and leave him to his lonely musings, when he spoke, deep in his throat, as if it made no difference whether anyone heard but himself. I've had to bring myself to believe that everyone must be somewhat selfish in his determination to succeed. That too great generosity spreads the faculties too wide, that one's powers must be concentrated into more or less selfish service. But when I see her... He paused, shaking his head. She looks afraid there, Nerissa said, barely above her breath. Yes, she is. Nerissa's green eyes grew round. Oh, please, don't paint me like that. To her embarrassment, he laughed. I won't have to, my dear. You aren't afraid of anything. Nerissa smiled and went back to the portrait. If I were going to be as scared as she is, I'd have refused to be chairman. I'd have said I was afraid of the dark and told them to elect someone else. Tovoltson picked up a tube of paint and squeezed a long white worm out onto his palette. Is she afraid of the dark, Nerissa? Well, of course. What else is there? We hide the fleece tonight. I mean, Trillium and whoever she chooses to go with her will hide it, and I'll bet a nickel will be Mary Liz, because she's Trill's best friend now that Helen... Oh. The artist seemed to be far more interested in his paints than in Nerissa's chatter. He inspected the palette, grunted, and went into an explanation of her position in the group. When Crispin Archer wandered in a quarter of an hour later, Tor was engrossed in his sketching but Nerissa saw that the visitor stopped in amazement when he caught his first glimpse of Trillian's portrait, and he was still studying it when the bell rang and the model had to take a reluctant departure. "'That's good, Tor,' Crispin said. "'Too bad it's only a sketch, but you made it on canvas, I see. Planning to do something with it?' 
Nerissa's sketch was done on board, like all preliminary studies. Trust Archer to notice that the other one was aimed at permanence. Tolson laughed, gathering up his brushes. You resisted the temptation to make a siren out of the green-eyed redhead. I see, Crispin added. You're well advised, Tor. I try. You'll have to excuse me a minute, Chris. Have to wash these before the paint cakes. Be right back. Tovoltson, his hands bristling with brushes, departed. But when his footsteps had died away in the hall, he came quietly back and peered in through the crack of the door. Archer was sitting where he himself had been, arms folded, contemplating the dark, painted eyes of Trillium's portrait. When light steps began to climb the stairs, Tor hurried along to his destination, unsmiling, his expression remote and thoughtful, as Nerissa had seen it. He took his time with the brushes, and when he re-entered the studio, Archer was gone, and little Minna Marsh, the blonde of the mural trio, popped up from the edge of the chair where she had been seated. Mr. Tovoldson, did you ever see a churn man? A real one? The artist dropped his brushes into their jar. What a very young question. No, Minna, never have I seen a churn man. Why? Because there's one down in the barnyard now and everybody's out there, just everybody. Everybody but us, eh? Yes, sir. Tobolson sighed. The mood of the model was important to him, and for all Minna's heaven-blue eyes and golden curls, she could not assume an angelic expression while her thoughts twiddled around some sort of three-ring circus going on in the barnyard. Ah, well, tomorrow then, Minna, he said. Yes, sir. The girl was a streak of blue in the doorway, then the thumping of saddle shoes on the stairs, and Tovoltson was alone. He sat down in his armchair, but he could not stay where he had to look at Trillium's portrait. And the sun was bright, the day beautiful, as Indian summer in the north. I shouldn't go to the barnyard, he thought. I should keep at work. But if everyone else was there, his absence might be noted more readily than his presence. Taking a sketch pad and pushing a pencil up under his beret, he tramped down the stairs. It had been a case of love at first sight between Sister Atene and the charm man's dog. With his master, who was small and quick and wizened like a monkey on a stick, the great creature paused to gaze across the barnyard to where old sister sat on an upturned bucket in the sun-warm shelter of glorious sunflowers. No one had challenged their walk up the long road from the gate, and the charm man was confident. He knew all about convents. If he could once get inside, get talking to one of the sisters. The battle was half over. My personality, he he, was how he would explain it. But the dog broke the ice here. Lifting his huge paws, precisely, he padded across to the old sister, stepped neatly around the milk pan in which Tom was soaking his feet, and laid his enormous head gently in her lap. Banty cackled, and Tom fanned his tail in majestic hatred. But Sister Atene put her hand on the big smooth head, and looked down into the beautiful eyes, and lost her heart completely. Name's Taffy. He's a Newfoundland, fine strain, maybe part St. Bernard. Ha <laughs> ha, said the charm man, and his little eyes darted around the farm buildings and over to the cloister. Everything's solid, good financial state. Ought to be able to talk them into a churn. The man began a sly sales line, which was lost on Sister Atene, because the dog's tongue had fluttered against her cheek and when he lay down he was so big that his shoulder touched her knee, and his head, which he placed immediately again in her lap, was so heavy it was like holding a whole animal. Through the misery of the past week, forsaken, worried, weary from the continual searching for her lost habit, Sister Hattine had relinquished the thought of ever regaining contentment, much less happiness. Then, suddenly, across the barnyard, this marvelous trusting creature had come, and a teen's anxieties rolled away. "'Is he for sale, sir?' she asked. "'Foolish, of course. No one would sell such a dog.' But surprisingly enough, the chairman replied, "'Oh, sure, right enough, ma'am. With the churn, that is.' "'The churn?' Sister Teen peered around, and saw nothing but a hazy little man before her. "'Nothing to it. If I could give a demonstration, it'd all be an open book, yeah. Oh, how do, ma'am?' This last was to Glory Muckleroy, who had come out to lean on her fence, where the sunflowers had been pruned for exactly such a purpose. 
"'My, is that a dog, mister?' she asked. Without turning her head, she shouted, "'Addie Pearl, bring the kids and come see.' The Muckleroys, Munro, Hattie Bell, Manessa, and Addie Pearl, with Palmer on her hip, responded with a slam of the kitchen door behind them. "'Havin' a bite of lunch we was,' Glory said by way of explanation for the presence of the entire brood. She was drowned out by the shouts of the children crowding around Taffy, who wagged his tail and accepted their homage with dignity, but continued to love old Ateen. "'Like I was saying,' said the charm man, who knew an opportunity when he saw one, "'I could give you a demonstration easy. Got my kit right down at the gate. Didn't feel like I'd ought to drive in till I'd spoke to somebody. I never was one to horn in where I ain't wanted.' "'I can see you got real nice manners,' said Glory. The churn man winked at her. "'How about a demonstration, lady?' "'What of?' "'Ha, ha, my churn.' "'Oh, well, I guess we got one.' "'Dash or kind?' "'Electric.' "'No good,' said the man with a fine wave of his hand. "'Storm comes up. Off goes the power. No churnin'. "'Now this here dog churn.' "'Dog churn?' A chorus repeated. Right ho, you wait, just you wait here, ladies, that's all I ask, and prepare to be amazed. With another wink at Glory and a promising grin, the churn man patted Manessa on the head and departed with such speed that he had reached the barnyard gate before Glory found her tongue. I reckon the dog's the best part of this outfit, she said, and I don't hold with strange men winking. Mercy me, did he wink? Sister Teen murmured, I wonder if we shouldn't have had permission from Mother before we allow him to demonstrate. Weren't much allowin' to it, seems if. But I was the one. Give in, sister. You didn't have nothing to do with it. Whatever uneasiness the two might have felt was dispatched in the general wonder at the churn man's equipment. His old truck was painted yellow with churn with burns, blaring across it in red. That's my name, Burns, he said, and winked again at Glory. There seemed to be a great deal to the churn. When Mother Theodore discerned the unusual activity in the barnyard and decided to investigate, she came upon a scene of medieval proportions. In the center of a circle composed of the Muckleroys, Sister Ateen, all the college girls, several of the farmhands, and most of the faculty, the churn man's demonstration was taking place. Upon a large slanted treadmill, the dog was walking, shut into a stall, so that he never progressed forward, but simply turned the table as he walked. The turning set in motion a great contrivance of machinery underneath. The machinery manipulated a long arm which ran out to a large barrel churn, and the barrel rolled on its axis, end over end. Far at the back stood a silent line of contemplative sisters. A little removed from them was fat sister Emery from the kitchen, in her stiff white bonnet, which she wore during working hours. At a good distance, for perspective, the artist stood sketching. And holding forth beside the churn with every eye upon him was the churn man himself, declaiming the merits of his equipage. That he had already been over his routine several times was no deterrent for such an orator. With so attentive an audience, he felt that he could go on for hours. The churn worked superbly. The great golden dog performed with endless patience and the churn man wiped his forehead on the sleeve of his red shirt, and brought out every adjective known to the language. Unexpectedly, however, he ran down like a toy in need of winding. Oh, oh, murmured Franz Eric. Yes, indeedy, said Chris beside him. For Mother Theodore, in all her vast respectability, had emerged in an opening beside the truck and into the churn man's line of vision. Mother was the personification of authority, quiet, inflexible authority, and the churn man's facility of expression suddenly ran dry. The dog raised his head and slowed his pace until the treadmill stopped, whereupon the churn halted its sprightly tumbling. The whole wide entranced circle looked at Mother, and the only movement was the flutter of a sister's veil and the flip of Mr. Archer's yellow tie in the wind. Mother Theodore was not quite pleased. Everyone expected her to smash this pretty bubble of amusement with a word, and so, because she had both a contrary streak in her and a sense of humor, she smiled at the charm man. 
I seem to have missed entertainment, sir. Will you not continue for my pleasure? Mother decided not to hear the universal gasp. The charm man bowed, and, realizing he had gotten off easy, bowed again. Burns is a name, ma'am. Theophilus Burns. Yes, ma'am. Now you see before you my invention. He was off on another oration. His invention, my eye, said Crispin Archer. If I'm not mistaken, my grandmother had one of these contraptions. She wasn't sold on it. The dog always got sick, and she had a dickens of a time till she trained my grandfather to walk the mill. About all the old boy was good for. Trillium, entranced as every one, had gradually worked her way in to get a good view of the dog, and she had not noticed who were her neighbors in the crowd. Crispin Archer's voice startled her, but she didn't turn. She was learning not to respond to surprise. Franz Eric would be with them. The two were always together. Keeping her eyes ahead, she moved slowly away to the far side of the circle, then unobtrusively left it. The charm man, always sensitive to goings and comings among his audience, saw Trillium's departure, and, without interrupting so much as a comma of his discourse, scanned the crowd. There was a familiar face among them, and the charm man lifted his hand in friendly salute. Always best to recognize an acquaintance, even though, because of his extensive contacts with the public, he couldn't place this face immediately and give it a name. The one to whom he waved made no response, and the charm man thought absently that he must have been mistaken, and went on with his harangue. Glory McElroy heard Mr. Archer's remark about the grandfather. She liked Mr. Archer with his comical way of putting things. Tossing her laughter over her shoulder to him, she wished she could think of a good answer. Talk back plenty to high, she could, put him in stitches. But Mr. Archer was the deep kind, like something in a dictionary that had a dozen different meanings you'd never think of. Glory, came Mary Elizabeth's guarded whisper beside her. Did I get it all right? Sure thing, Miss Mary Elizabeth. It's right in my kitchen. Shh, the girl warned. But seeing no enemies within hearing, she continued audibly, We have the cage already, and we'll ring it over after dark. You be looking for us. But don't put on your porch light. It has to be a secret, remember. I'll watch out. Fine. Bye now. Mary Elizabeth moved away, and Glory, looking after her with a smile, saw that Mr. Archer was doing the same. My, you're only young once, ain't you, Mr. Archer, she said. Mr. Archer patted Palmer on the back and received a display of two teeth in return. In the autumn breeze, his tie stuck its tongue out, and in his eyes there was a distinct gleam of amusement. The charm man finished going through his paces without much heart. The minute I set eyes on her, I knowed she was no easy mark, he said to High Muckleroy when he came back from an extremely short conclave with Mother Theodore. Hard-headed all them dames is, at the head of convents. They gotta be, said High. Running a shebang like this is big business. Something like a flywheel you got under there, ain't it? The churn man dived half under the treadmill to point out the wonders of his invention, but before he quite disappeared, he sent one more glare of rather disgusted admiration after Mother. Well, I ain't sorry I done the settin' up. Best crowd I've had in a coon's age. She offered me open house in the barn, too. Asked me to stay the night. A free night's lodging is money in the pocket, High observed. Glory and me, we be proud to have you eat with us. Now about this here flywheel. Seems to me like you ought to run another band. The churn man followed high in under the machinery, since by that time the crowd had dwindled to two freshmen, Sister Ateen, the Muckeroy children, and Tom and Banty, all poor prospects. At an ordinary time at St. Aurelian's, fame would not have been so fleeting for the churn man. Girls would have paid visits all through the evening to the yellow truck, where they would have petted Taffy and listened to his master tell his stupendous adventures. The charm man expected it. He was entitled to hold court in the barnyard. But twilight straggled in from the swamp, and the churn man stood on the Muckleroy's back porch with High, awaiting Glory's call to supper, and saw not a single candidate upon whom to exercise his powers of narration. "'Awful quiet,' he said. "'Lock em up, do they, come the gloaming?' "'Not as a reg their thing,' High grinned. "'They'll be doings inside them old walls tonight.' "'Do tell.' said Theophilus Burns. 
Hi did. He knew from other years, when he had seen this strange knight observed upon the campus, that the hiding of the Golden Fleece was like no other undertaking in the world. There would be no appointed hour. At any minute, from sunset to dawn, a girl might sneak out of a darkened room, slip to the hiding place with the trophy, and back again to the darkened room. All unknown because on this night there would be no lights in the building. No prefect would challenge her, for every sister except the portress in her little office would withdraw to the cloister and leave the way free for the hiding of the fleece. But there would be spies, watching and waiting, freshmen, sophomore, and junior spies and sneakers in blue jeans, who would glide through the halls following her. The seniors would thoughtfully provide decoys, of course, to lead them astray. But if by chance someone did follow the right one, and guess where she hid the trophy, it would mean ignominious defeat for the defenders, even before the hunt opened, an unparalleled triumph for the hunters. In any event, the hunters had only thirty-six hours in which to find the fleece. Trillium, already in blue jeans, sweater, and gym shoes, sat on her bed and watched her door. In the two days since the letter from New Orleans had been due and had not come, she had haunted Mother's office. Uncle Henry was out of town on business. He could not forward the letter when he was not there. But his secretary could have done so. Never before had her mother's letter been late. Always the distinctive long envelope would be on the mail table with the other, unopened, inside it. Possibly moving to new quarters had delayed the writing. But as time passed and she kept tracing the weary circle around, it became less than ever possible for Trillium to believe that the letter had not arrived. It did come, she whispered through stiff lips, her eyes on the darkening hall outside her open door. It did come, and he took it, and now he knows where my mother is, and he knows that I know he is threatening her. So I might be the only witness against him if he found her. He can't leave me alone any longer, and all I'm sure of is that he is one of three. What would Mother Theodore have told me if I had dared confide in her? But I couldn't no matter what happens. A soft shuffling approached her door, and she sprang up. You ready? Mary Elizabeth whispered. Then come on. Trillian went softly out after her. When you don't know what else to do, do anything. There might not be safety in it, but at least you wouldn't go crazy with thinking. Mother Theodore was in a light frame of mind. She could not remain quietly in her room, or in the office, or in the common room, where the sisters gathered in the evening. She walked through all the halls of the first floor, past the auditorium, over to the west stairs. All was hushed, waiting, the silence punctuated with giggles, and once in a while the swift closing of a door. The moment darkness fell, the giggles and the expeditions from room to room would cease. With no motive in mind, Mother descended the old stairs leading to the tunnels, thinking to find the passages black dark. Halfway along the corridor that ran under the building, the door of a room was open and light streamed out. For a long, hesitant minute, Mother stood on the stairs, apprehensive, wondering why she should not go forward and speak to whoever was in the storeroom. The general ghostliness of the ancient place, coupled with her dread of the night ahead, that was what held her on the stairs. It had nothing whatever to do with the presence of someone in the storeroom. Ashamed of herself, Mother went resolutely toward that open door. Now she could hear the short scrape of a box being pushed along the stone floor, a rustle of paper. And then she saw into the room. In the brilliant light of the unshaded overhead bulb, a sister was working with her back to the door, bent half into the large packing case she had pushed a moment earlier. Mother smiled. After all, who had she expected to find here in the basement depths? And who was it? Even the sisters themselves could not always be sure of another's identity from a back view. Sister? The packer almost toppled into the big box, and the hand she put out to steady herself was familiar. Oh, Sister Raymond, Mother exclaimed, forgive me for startling you. What are you doing so busy at this time of night? Sister Raymond laughed, catching her breath. I'm putting away the mustard seed costumes. We just piled them all in here, helter-skelter, after the play, and I thought this would be a good time to sort them. I'd like to do it myself, then I know where everything is. She held up what had been a drift of white chiffon, now flattened and wrinkled from its sojourn under a dozen others. 
It's still lovely, isn't it, Mother? But Mother Theodore stared at it in horror. When Sister Raymond heard a strangled sound and turned to see her superior's face, she was terrified. Mother, what's the matter? Mother's lip opened twice before her voice came. The costume. I didn't know you kept Helen's. Helen's? The sister's veil fluttered. So instantly did she turn to make certain of what she held. Helen's? Oh, no, Mother, this is Trillium's. Sister Raymond shook out the delicate folds, as if she must demonstrate beyond a doubt that they were neither stained nor torn. And Mother Theodore smiled, more than a little disgusted with herself. Of course, I might have known you wouldn't. I have forgotten how very much alike the two costumes were, Sister. Exactly alike, only for the color of the veils, pink and blue. The girls looked like twins. I'll never forget it. Never. The sister's hand lay gently upon the chiffon, lay until it went up to wipe away a tear that crept down under her glasses. Then she bent and dropped the costume into the box. Mother Theodore slowly nodded. You could pack away the one remaining garment, but not the remembrance of its twin. Sister, could you leave this until another time? If you wish me to, Mother. No, it was merely a suggestion. You may continue if you desire, Sister. Thank you, Mother. The Superior looked back from the doorway. Trillium and Helen, what should she remember about them? Something tapped at her consciousness. Walking through the dark hall, wondering what the tantalizing thing could be, worrying a little about Sister Raymond down there alone with her quiet tears, Mother failed to awaken memory. She opened the big front door and came out on the main steps, then strolled on down to the drive where she loved to walk back and forth in the evening. Tonight she had many thoughts to keep her company. Trillium's haunting of the office for the letter that had not been there. Trillium's fear. Always Trillium. Mother's slow patrol halted abruptly. The tantalizing thing had ceased to tantalize and had popped full-blown into her mind. The terrible realization held her still. Her face turned to the west where the sun had already set, and she shivered under her warm cloak, because her heart had stopped beating life through her body. She was certain of what she believed, sure she was right. Jarvis would have to know. At the thought of Jarvis, she felt warmth beat through her again. He was only as far away as her own office telephone. She had reached the steps when she heard someone behind her, someone who walked with a steady, light tread, and swiftly. Mother wheeled, not realizing that her position on the step gave her the height of a giantess, that the twilight muffled her figure, until she appeared to be a twin to Mary Elizabeth's phantom nun. She was amazed, then, at the strange expression upon the face of the young man who confronted her, stupefaction, incredulity. "'Good evening, mother,' said Franz Eric. "'I didn't see you in the dark. I hope I didn't startle you.' "'No.' He glanced around, and his eyes fell on the village lights twinkling a mile away. I am going into town to a movie. It's a perfect night for a walk. Yes, said Mother. Franz hesitated, then smiled and saluted her. Good night, Mother. Good night, Mr. Eric. He strode away, a bareheaded, slight young man, without a care for anything other than his own entertainment but he could have cut across the lawn to the gates from the guest house without making this long circle up to the convent. And the last show, as Mother knew from various young ladies, started at eight. The clock in the tower had just struck a quarter past. She stood watching until Franz was only a light speck well outside the gates. Over in the guest house, a lamp glowed behind a window with an undrawn shade. Mother Theodore went straight up the steps and into the main hall. The light from Sister Osmond's office was enough to show her the way. Without turning on any other, she hurried quietly to her own office. She had suddenly remembered that there was also a strange man in the barnyard tonight. The strange man, however, was not at the moment in the barnyard, but in Muckleroy's kitchen, watching the transfer of a young muskrat from a makeshift cage to a gaudy red one, equipped with all the animal comforts of home. With Glory and the children kneeling around them, and advised by High and the churn man, Trillium and Mary Elizabeth coaxed while the little muskrat stared with beady eyes. "'Had quite a time getting him,' High said importantly, 
and pressing the churn man. Don't know as anybody but me could have done it. Them trappers is pretty persnickety about their mushquash. Even just borrowing, like. Glory looked up proudly at her husband, and Mary Elizabeth sighed. He's just perfect, hi. He's the most beautiful golden fleece we've ever had. The little muskrat crouched in the bedecked cage. He was young, half-grown, and he was scared. With his pale belly fur clean and soft, his back shining dark with the guard hairs that make a coat so durable, his little round ears giving him the air of a defenseless baby, he stared into the circle of faces. I don't believe he appreciates all we've done for him, observed Mary Elizabeth. Hi making the cage, Mercy Harding painting it with all these fuddy-duddies, and the crown sparkling like the king's jewels. She touched the little pin which was tied to the cage with a ribbon. I reckon he'd rather have a nice mud hole said Glory. It was Trillium who remembered the urgency of the hour, the dark run to be made when Glory's door went shut behind them. Tonight there was no moon to hang like a witch's lantern over the swamp and make palisades of the convent walls and turn the hyacinths into a solid floor. Mary Elizabeth was telling the Muckleroys how the fleece would be hidden. The hunters, of course, expected them to make a good many fake expeditions first, and then— when the spies were occupied on false trails, to make a break to hide the treasure. And so, since that was what the hunters looked to happen, the committee planned to turn the tables on them. We'll hide the fleece first, and then lead them a merry chase afterward, Mary Elizabeth confided. Isn't that cute of us? Liz, come on, Trillian broke in. I'll take the little scamp, and you lead the way. Turn off the lights high. Glory led the two out into the night from the dark kitchen, and when they left the porch they were in a sea of blackness. The swamp was as still as it ever is. A short distance away, on the road leading out from town, an engine chugged. Even the guest house was dark. Over between the chapel and the opaque mass of the convent, the cloister walk arched blacker than the night. Come on, Trillian whispered. We'll cut over to the cloister. No one can see us there. Mary Elizabeth shuddered. Her imagination peopled the night with little dreads as they walked slowly across unseen grass, crept through a barely visible cloister walk, entering a building where familiar objects had assumed unfamiliar places in the pitch darkness. Trillium, holding the cage in both arms so it would not bump against some undiscernible object, trying to match her steps to Mary Elizabeth's, was grimly certain that every inch of their progress was being followed. Once Trillium, on the stairs, halted, and Mary Elizabeth, instantly aware, stopped also. Neither of the girls breathed audibly. If there were a third presence anywhere on the stairs, it bided its time, and the time was not yet. When the girls moved on, the darkness stirred behind them. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Murder Takes the Veil》by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Twelve. I don't hold with murder," said the churn man sententiously. The door was closed upon the dark night, and the children were disposed on the wood box and in front of the kitchen range with taffy. The pipe smoking of high and Theophilus Burns was infinitely peaceful. Glory was rocking the baby to sleep. I don't hold with murder, because it ain't never finished, the churn man further expounded. Take a feller I once knew, when I was a mushquash trapper. Oh, you trapped mushquash in your time? Hi inquired politely. At different points in the narrative, Burns had mentioned many avocations and careers, all lawful, all extremely vague as to time. But now he pinned himself down. I did some six, seven, maybe eight years ago, down in the bayou country. Funny thing, I've always figured nothing would have happened if that there norther hadn't blown it up. Regular stickeroo, she was, ice and sleet and cold. The charman paused, reminiscing. After a moment, High asked, They freeze this feller to death? That how they done it? Oh, no, no, the storm caught him in the swamp, see? One of these dudes out on a hunting trip. 
got separated from his outfit and had to lay up at this here trapper's houseboat. And the trapper had a good-looking missus. The charman's eyes met High's knowingly. Seen her once myself. Settling in his chair, he drew on his pipe. Well, sir, this hunter jigger didn't get enough of it in them two, three days of the storm. He kept coming back, and pretty soon the husband tumbled to what was the attraction and raised right smart of a fuss. Well, like I said, the feller kept coming back, and one night he come once too often. Bright moonlight it was. The trapper met the guy out in the swamp, and pretty soon there was a shot, and the dude scun out quick. The charman looked at his pipe stem, as if suddenly he hated the taste of it. Peculiar, ain't it? How blood looks black in the moonlight. There was a horrified silence. The children staring, glory and high aghast. The only natural sound was Taffy licking his paws. Never did know what became of the feller's wife and kid, the charman added. The kitchen was very still, the wood popping in the stove. Burns went on puffing at his pipe, so the sentences were curiously broken. The murderer can't quit with them two alive, not and be safe. He wasn't never caught, never suspected. Suicide, they said. The story ain't never come out. How'd he get away, that night, I mean? High asked. Easy in the swamp. Why, a man could hide out in them back bayous for elephant's lifetime. Bloodhounds can't track there. Too much water. Take a feller don't know them back bayous. He'd be lost inside a day. But if you know him, you can stay in or make your way out another direction, easy as you please. No, this guy got away at the time, but he ain't safe till he's fixed them too so they can't talk. Might be the ain't of a mind to talk, but he can never be sure. That's why I said murder ain't never done up clean. There's always tag ends. The muckeroys listened, fascinated and horrified. To Glory, one terrible question stood out. Why had the churn man chosen to tell this weird tale tonight? If only she dared ask him. Sounds like you might be a witness yourself, Mr. Burns, she ventured. Heard about it, that's all, he said shortly, forgetting his nice manners. Oh, said Glory. The charm man arose hurriedly, turning only when he was halfway out of the door. Oh, excuse me, I gotta see to something. Thanks for the eats, and all. Taffy. Well, you come in and have breakfast with us, Mr. Burns, Glory reminded him. We'd be proud to have you, added High. The big dog ambled to the door, and an instant later the charm man was gone leaving behind him the rank smell of his pipe and a strange, quivering sensation in every one of the Muckleroys except Palmer, who was asleep. "'I didn't like him, Ma,' whimpered Addie Pearl. "'Now don't you kids go getting worked up,' Glory cautioned. "'Hi, you look through the doors and the windows, too, and don't one of you mention a word o' this crazy yarn to anybody, you hear me? Land sakes, I'll be glad when this night's over with.' Carrying Palmer into the bedroom, she looked out toward the convent. Not a light showed anywhere. Trillium, crouched with the muskrat cage in the recess behind the prefect's desk in the dormitory hall, concentrated all her attention on her sense of hearing. Thus must be how it felt to be blind, inky darkness around you, nothing to compensate for the visual pictures of sight, no way to tell when someone came and stood near you. But there was a compensation in quickened listening for with no eyes to offer diversion, her ears were picking up sounds ordinarily unnoticeable. There was Mary Elizabeth at the entrance to this little hall recess, her blue jeans brushing once in a while against the wall. There were footsteps, once so padded they were only a thinning of the closed silence as they passed, and also, once, there was the rustle of a sister's skirts, impossible to mistake for any other sound, when a girl had listened for it through three years of little midnight snacks and visits. Straight by then, and through the corridor, unhurried, deliberate, the slow sounds passed along and out of hearing. "'The old sneak,' Mary Elizabeth whispered. "'She isn't supposed to be up here tonight.' "'Who was it?' Trillian breathed. "'The bouncer. Who else?' "'Osmond wouldn't do that.' The muskrat began a scrabbling in the cage, his tiny claws scratching holes in the silence. "'Can't you keep him quiet, Trill?' Mary Elizabeth begged. 
Rock him or something. Maybe he'll think you're his mother. Trillium rocked, and the little animal forgot his terror. Surely they had been in the alcove more than fifteen minutes. What if the juniors had somehow deduced the striking of the clock was to be the signal, and had stopped its old works? They could proceed without the signal, of course, because they were almost beside the hiding place right now. Around the corner, into the hall, and there was the funny little door opening into the old chapel tower. Not far to go, nothing to fear in the tower. The secret of the hiding place had been well kept. This afternoon, when Trillium had come with Mary Elizabeth to do a little practicing in the tower, they had met Rindy in the hall outside. But Rindy would never give them away. In the clock tower, the old hammer struck four notes. Excelsior! Onward and upward! Mary Elizabeth whispered. Come on, Trill! With Liz leading her by the front of her shirt, Trillium moved soundlessly into the hall, around the corner, past the broom closet, halted at the door leading to the tower. From other hiding places, decoys would be slipping out, carefully carrying empty shoe boxes to lead the spies astray, but there was no noise anywhere in the building. Trillium quivered in every muscle as they stood, barely breathing, straining for any indication from the enemy. This was the most critical moment of the hiding process, when the door must be opened and the ascent made up the ancient steps. When Trillium had practiced it early in the day with her eyes shut, there had been the unconscious knowledge that she could open her eyes, and several times she had peeked. But there was no cheating in this utter blackness. Even with keeping her eyes so wide that the lids were stiff, she was a blind girl in a black world. She knew when Mary Elizabeth opened the door, because fresh air swam around her. Everything, then, must be just as they had left it in the middle of the afternoon, the small trapdoor propped wide at the top of the old tower stairs. For the first time since she had known she was chairman of the fleece, Trillium was not afraid. It might have been the stimulus of the night air from the tower, or Mary Elizabeth's competent guardianship, or the practical thought that the deed was so nearly completed. Whatever the reason, she was elated, light-hearted as a girl of twenty should be. Take it easy, Trill. Mary Elizabeth breathed in her ear, and Trillium realized she had been fairly bounding around in the dark. She laughed, but inside herself, and moved into the cramped space of the tower. Mary Elizabeth would remain here, inside, the hall door closed, listening, while Trillium ascended to the bell chamber. Even the muskrat was behaving well now. Confidently, she put out her hand to steady herself against the wall and with the other arm tight around the cage began the perilous climb. The sisters, when the tower was planned, had not foreseen that it would be used for any purpose other than the accommodation of the clockworks. The tower room itself was wide enough only to allow the pendulum to swing free, and over in a corner they had erected a steep flight of steps, which had been hacked by an Indian out of a single cypress log. In the daytime, if the climber minded the business at hand, there was no danger of missing a step. But at night it was quite another matter to cling to the narrow log and lean hard against the wall to maintain balance. Another matter, also, to hold a muskrat cage suspended out over nothing so it wouldn't bump and make a noise. Slowly, taking her time, Trillium crept up toward the opening above her head. The sky was shut away by the faces of the clock which walled the tower, but the west side, which had no face since the sisters considered thriftily it would be wasted on the swamp, was fit with louver boards. Feeling the cold air against her face, Trillium knew she was near the top and pulled out her flashlight. In the little room, the clock was busy. The bells were like plum puddings of different sizes set out to cool. I suppose you'll get scared when the clock strikes, honey, but try to bear up, Trillium whispered, laying down the cage. You have plenty to eat, and this can't last forever. She would have liked to sit there a while with the muskrat for company, and breathe the fresh night air, and enjoy the awe certainty that her troubles were not any more insurmountable than the hiding of the fleece. But Mary Liz waited below. The convent was crawling with spies, and back in her room she would be quite as well able to think as here. "'Goodbye, Junior,' she whispered. The jeweled crown on its ribbon sparkled no brighter than the muskrat's eyes." Trillium snapped off her flash and edged backward on her knees to the yawning hatch. Working her way slowly, feeling for every inch of the steps, 
she reached the third and stood erect. Now she would have to pull the trapdoor into place after her. It was heavier than she expected, and she barely saved it from falling with a thud. She lay for a few moments against the old steps, smothering her breathing until the blood pounded in her head. I mustn't make any noise, she warned herself. No noise. And there was none other than her own drumming heart. Suddenly taut, she realized that there should be some slight movement down there below. Mary Elizabeth, safe in here with the door closed, could flash on her light. She could whisper some cautious word to know whether all was well with Trillium. But she didn't. No sound came from below. She couldn't speak herself. Mary Elizabeth was the guard, the one to make the initial move. Had something happened down there in that very basement of the night? Could the door be open and Liz gone? Am I alone? Trillium's thoughts rushed on, for now all her foolish confidence was swallowed up in terror. And then, in her intense listening, she caught a sound. Below her on the steps, someone was creeping up, slowly, feeling the way as she herself had done with a hand on the rough old wall, breathing carefully, taking endless time. And the hall door was open. The tower smelled of dust and age and fresh air, but the outer hall held sweeping compound and the dinner-time roast beef, and there was no way for it to seep in except through the open door, and these homely odors were swirling into the tower. Crouching on the steps, hearing faintly that creeping approach, Trillium sensed that this was not the hide-and-seek alarm of being caught with the golden fleece. In that moment she forgot the treasure hunt. Nothing was real but the open hall door and the appalling, slow advance below her on the stairs. Trillium did not think out what she did next. Perhaps because she had used it a few minutes before, she jerked out her flashlight and pressed the button. The little tower room leaped into being, one segment of it very bright, and in that circle of light, Mary Elizabeth crouched on the steps, her head on a level with Trillium's feet. She threw up an arm to shield her eyes, but she did not look up to where Trillium cowered. She looked back, to the open door of the hallway, where the outer nimbus of light did not quite reach. There, beyond that nimbus, shadowy but quite distinguishable, stood a giant sister with her head muffled in black. Her habit was not quite long enough. Underneath it showed a pair of man's trouser legs, ending in large, heavy boots. No! Mary Elizabeth gasped, as if someone were choking her. For an eternity the tableau held, the sister simply standing with face hidden, hands hidden, an aura of evil emanating from her. Trillium wanted to swing the light up to that hidden face, over the whole muffled figure, but her arm wouldn't move. Her thumb fell away from the button, the flashlight snapped off. Blackness again, but a blackness in which there were sounds, a series of bumps, a groan, the pop of a flashlight hitting the floor and in the underworld black of the hall there was a soft rustle of a sister's skirts, exactly the sound that had gone so deliberately past the alcove so short a time before. Mother Theodore, reading her bravery in her office, stiffened to attention. Within the close little room she heard nothing, but her nerves were tuned tonight to vibrate in the faintest breeze of trouble. For a moment she listened, straining, Suddenly she dropped the breviary and was around her desk and over to the door, out into the hall where the only light came from behind her, and another patch down the hall where Sister Osmond was framed like a portrait of alarm. For both the sisters had heard the same sound, a high, piercing scream. Then silence, ominous, unnatural silence, as if no one moved in the whole building. Mother Theodore grasped the door behind her helpless against this net of silence that was far more dreadful than any screaming. For she knew, without knowing, that the scream and the blank quiet had nothing to do with the hunt for the golden fleece. Something had happened again. And I don't know where Jarvis is, she thought dazedly. I couldn't find him earlier. In that moment, the superior of St. Aurelian's was as near to fainting as she had ever had come in her life. End of chapter 12
by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 13 The convent building burned with light when the sheriff swooped up the drive in his big car. A dark red convertible was already in the parking lot, and the sheriff, seeing it, sprinted for the main entrance. That sporty beauty belonged to young Dr. Chapman. And on the one night I'd get romantic-minded and take Ermine to the movies, the sheriff muttered. His thoughts fled ahead to Kathy in her snug little room with Ivy Montgomery. Or was it so snug? Was something even now happening to terrify her, to make her remember that other night? The halls were as quiet as they had been a half hour earlier, when the girls were divided into the hunters and the hunted, but with several differences. The sisters were once again on duty in full numbers. Each girl was in her proper room, and light was everywhere. Nothing was known, actually, of what had happened. A scout had stumbled upon Trillium and Mary Elizabeth in the hall near their own rooms, and the scout, who was Allison Cooper, had taken rightful alarm when she heard Stifle crying. In the glow of her flashlight, Allison saw Mary Elizabeth drooping limply, supported by Trillium, who appeared to be half-fainting herself, and both of them with their shirts smeared with blood. "'Turn it off!' Trillium begged, trying to shield her face from the light as Allison screamed. "'Mary Liz is murdered!' a girl whispered, and the words sped in a matter of seconds all through the black halls. Allison, as Mother told her afterward, was the only one who kept her head. With her flashlight pointing the way for her, she flew straight to where Mother Theodore stood at her office door, and Mother called the doctor and the sheriff. "'Now what else, Emmy?' Jarvis asked quietly. No reprimands, no blame for having allowed the hunt to go on, not even the obvious suggestion that the whole enterprise should have been explained to him beforehand, and his approval sought. Mother Theodore was grateful, so grateful that her throat tightened, and she stood with her hands tightly clasped under her scapular, her eyes on the floor like any one of her own charges called on the carpet. "'There is something more, Emmy,' the sheriff prodded, his voice still gentle. "'Tell me.' When she did look up, her distress was so intense that he added quickly, "'Oh, it can't be that bad.' I saw Trillium's costume tonight, Jarvis. Sister Raymond was packing it away with the others. Quickly now the words tumbled out. I thought it was Helen's. Trillium and Helen were both dressed exactly alike that night. It wasn't a tramp who killed Helen. It was someone who knew her, who thought she was Trillium. And I know I'm right, Jarvis. I couldn't be wrong, because there is no other explanation for Trillium's fear." For a long minute the two were silent, as if the room still echoed with the terrible truth. "'Yes, you're right, Emmy,' the sheriff said firmly. "'Trillium is the bull's eye, not Helen, who looked like her, nor Mary Elizabeth, who got in the way. In here I've been trying to solve it from the wrong angle. I've dug into every friendship Helen ever made. I've questioned young Cooper till the poor guy's nearly nuts. I've rounded up more panhandlers than I thought we had in the whole state of Louisiana.' His voice dropped. But tonight there were no panhandlers around. Emmy, when did you first notice that Trillium was afraid of something? Mother Theodore could not face what she believed. Her mouth tight, she walked around her desk, seated herself, and folded her hands upon the blotter. Jarvis leaned toward her upon the opposite side of the desk. Both knew the answer. She tried to run away on the night of the play, Emmy. We know that. Ermine Wagner insists that Trillian was deathly afraid when she made her come back. And what had happened shortly before that? His voice dropped even lower. The three geniuses had arrived upon the campus. She would tell me if... Mother hesitated. Trillian had not told her, even with urging. She asked desperately, Jarvis... Why is she too much afraid to talk about it? What could be so dreadful that her life is in danger, and still she can't ask for help? The sheriff straightened and took a long breath. I don't know. I've been investigating those three very interesting pasts. 
but so far there is no indication of any one doing anything but minding his own business. Tor spent the summer painting in the French Quarter in New Orleans. Archer was up in the Evangeline country, Eric hanging his hat someplace in N.O. All perfectly natural. Mother Theodore glanced toward the door. Here's the doctor now, Jarvis, she said. The young Marysville doctor stood in the doorway. Oh, hello, Sheriff. Well, I've looked them over, Mother, and they're both all right. Mary Elizabeth had a regular flood of a nosebleed and dripped over the two of them. Must have whacked her nose against that door she ran into. She has a broken rib, too, but it will mend. The other girl has nothing wrong with her that a couple of sleeping pills won't cure. I left something for them with the sister up there. So they ran into a door, did they? the sheriff queried. That's what they said. The door must have had a punch like Joe Lewis to do all that damage. Okay to go up and talk to them now, Doc? Oh, sure. I told the sister to hold the medicine till you'd seen the kids. I'll tell you, though, they aren't in a mood to talk. Oh, yes, they are, the sheriff declared. But when he and Mother Theodore stood beside Mary Elizabeth's bed and saw her lying like another young corpse, her lashes dark on her white cheeks and her breathing imperceptible, the stern sheriff melted into Kathy's father. On the other bed, which had been Helen's, Trillian was curled up, her eyes shattered with more than weariness, and her cheeks pink as if she had a fever. She had changed her gory shirt for pajamas and a pink housecoat, and to Mother Theodore she looked fragile, certainly not the possessor of guilty knowledge. Mother nodded to Sister Laurent, who had been sitting with them, and the sister went quietly out. The sheriff sat down on the bed beside Trillium, but he glanced at Mary Elizabeth. She's awake, said Trillium. She, I suppose she doesn't feel much like talking, but I'll tell you what happened, Sheriff. Fine, just let me ask you first where you were when this tangle with the door took place. In the clock tower, Trillium whispered. The hunters haven't the slightest idea of where we hid the fleece, because we were almost back here when Allison discovered us. So if you do have to go and look at it, Please, will you be terribly careful and not give away the hiding place? We'll lose the hunt if they find it. The sheriff seemed to be thinking this over. Mother knows I'm covering up, Trillium thought. She looked like the Sphinx, sitting there on that straight, steady chair. But even she couldn't know the reason. What are you afraid of, Trillium? He asked the question so quietly that Trillium very nearly answered. That was how easily she might give herself away. Her eyes fell to his hand, fuzzy, blue vein, close to hers on the spread. If only she could grasp it, cling to it, and pour out the story. But no, no matter what happened. The whole thing was scary, Sheriff, sneaking through the dark with nobody knew how many people after you, and we didn't want them to catch us, particularly this year, when it's our last hunt. All right, you didn't want to be discovered, Jarvis said patiently. Young girls were far too clever, leading one briskly up to a blank wall, and then frisking blithely away. Trillium, he would have sworn on the Bible, was not afraid of the dark, and he was equally certain that she would never tell him. Now, what did you do? Where did you go? What did you hear? You know, everything. Trillium wanted nothing in the world less than to relive that awful time in the hall. The slow approach to the tower, the long ascent into the bell chamber. But it had to be done, and as she recounted it, she became certain that the awful presence of the sister had stalked there every step, pausing when they paused, so keenly foreseeing their movements that the ghostly progress was an echo of their own. Except for one time, when she and Liz had been in the alcove and heard the deliberate passing. What do you remember? the sheriff prompted. Trillian felt the quiet gray gaze upon her. The man was almost reading her mind. Nothing. It's all so confused. I mean, I was frightened, but who wouldn't be? I reached the bell chamber, and I set down the muskrat cage, and started back down the steps, and that's all, sheriff. That's all? Didn't you hear any sound on the steps below you? Why... Liz dropped a flashlight, and we couldn't see where we were going, and we banged into the door. 
that is liz did and her nose began to bleed that's all trillium waited desperately hoping he would believe her she had not mentioned liz crawling up the stairs if he could guess so much might he not also guess that something stood in the doorway cutting off their exit there was one escape and trillium took it lying back upon helen's pillow she sobbed i can't tell you anything more liz thought she heard a spy in the hall and she started to crawl up the steps to warn me and i turned on the flashlight and then then she tumbled down the steps and we ran the rest was a mumbled sobbing into the pillow sheriff thatcher recognizing the withdrawal tactics employed at times by his daughter stood up shaking his head helplessly his mouth grim mother theodore was displeased this was not like trillium this pillow burying crying childish scene yet mother couldn't find it in her heart to reproach the girl mother mary elizabeth said suddenly opening her eyes yes dear how do you feel i'm all right mother and it's just the way trillium said i thought i heard somebody in the hall and i started up the stairs to warn her and then she turned on her light and i fell i guess that's when i broke my rib and then you ran into the door the sheriff asked yes sir had you left it open when you went into the tower no sir mary elizabeth's eyes widened and she choked back her reply i don't remember whether i had left it open or not but it was open when you hid it yes sir who was in the hall i don't know mr thatcher said mary elizabeth truthfully together mother theodore and jarvis thatcher stood at the foot of the bed disarmed by trillium's nervous state and mary elizabeth's guilelessness there was nothing to do but leave and they left the moment the door closed trillium sat up they're gone mary elizabeth whispered after an interval yes but laurent will be back i know mary elizabeth pushed herself up on her elbow gasped and lay down holy smoke that hurt trill you didn't mention i mean did you see what i saw in the door of the tower room trillium nodded it wasn't a team was it no i knew it wasn't i was just hoping she was so bundled up and she trill didn't she have man's trousers under her habit mary elizabeth paused but she needed no reply to that i know she did so it's the same one i saw by the bayou hush liz trillian bounded across the small space between the beds oh listen liz please don't tell about it well i didn't did i i had promised to keep mom and didn't i just get through keeping that promise i know you were wonderful liz and sometime i'll explain jiggers mary elizabeth exclaimed sister laurent came competently in with two medicine glasses just as trillian's bed spring stopped bouncing under the sudden return of its occupant at the foot of the stairs the sheriff and mother theodore paused she's got to tell me mother jarvis insisted the formality of the title meant that he was displeased and i can't blame him mother admitted silently i am shielding that girl perhaps foolishly but I can't help it. I'm too fond of her. If it was anything less important than saving her own life, I'd give in. But I can't let this unholy killer go on with all the protection of secrecy. I'll leave her alone tonight. But tomorrow... Tomorrow you may have a different lead, Jarvis. Mother interrupted calmly. I don't question your responsibility in the matter. It's simply that I know what kind of girl Trillium is. I honestly believe you couldn't break her down she has a great sense of honor and loyalty if the danger was to herself alone i think she'd tell you in fact i think she'd have told me before now and since she hasn't my guess is that she is protecting someone very dear to her and who would that be i don't know an uncle seems to be her guardian the sheriff sighed for a long wistful moment mother waited all right emmy he said. I'll see if I can come in by the back door. Heaven knows I don't want to torture that poor kid, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. 
I am going to get a woman to nurse that young Mary Elizabeth, and I want Trillium to move in with her and stay there. Or maybe you'd better put both the girls in Trillium's room. That way they wouldn't think so much about Helen. Anyway, in she goes. The woman keeps an eye on the two of them, understand? Mother Theodore winced. Never had she felt unsafe in St. Aurelian's. Sister Osmond will remain on duty. Sister Osmond, I could march a whole deputation of men in here in broad daylight, singing the anvil chorus, and none of you would ever know it. Sister Osmond's fine for legal entrances, but anybody could get in at any time. No, I'm going to take a few precautions, Emmy, quite a few. Who will the woman be, Jarvis? Glory Muckleroy. She won't want to leave her children. I'll talk her into it. The sheriff wheeled and started off along the hall, to Sister Osmond's office. From her he would get the uncle's address. In a few minutes a call would be put through to New Orleans, and the thorough fingers of the law would begin to root into Trillium's secret. Mother Theodore walked slowly after the sheriff, past her own office, past the closed doors leading to the cloister. When she came to the west stairs, she went down into the tunnel and through it to the chapel. The red sanctuary light was the only illumination in the beautiful, vaulted place. It was enough, for Mother did not need to see. Jarvis Thatcher, having secured the information he needed from Sister Osmond, and passed it on to a deputy in Marysville, strode up the stairs again and along to the clock tower. Nothing there, naturally, but a flashlight lying on the floor. Sometimes, he ruminated as he searched, he would like to take Mother by the veil and shake her. But that, of course, was a purely defensive reaction. Not so darn funny, either. If it hadn't been for the fact that he believed her to be right about Trillium's unshakable loyalty, he would never have agreed to a roundabout stalking of his problems. When he left the tower, he did not pause again until he came out at the east door. The night air felt good on his face. Pausing for a long breath of it, the sheriff glanced down to the guest house. It had been dark, he was fairly certain, when he drove up. But now, late as it was, a lamp glowed behind a window with an undrawn shade. Archer, Eric, and Tobaltson, like a firm of lawyers, a writer, an athlete, and an artist. What were they? Into the office at Marysville had come a good many telegrams, one leading to another, but all leaving gaps in the information he needed. At least one of the gentlemen, it appeared, had not been doing what his public assumed at a certain time in his past. One, and possibly another. But, of course, there would have to be proof. Standing there, looking over at the lamp in the window, the sheriff felt his forehead grow clammy in the cold night, and his pulse began to race unevenly, beating out a little Morris coat of its own. The three had come to St. Aurelian's at the same time, and shortly after their arrival, one girl had begun to look as if doom stared back at her, and another had been frightened to her death. No proof for it, nothing even to indicate it except that soggy footprint. Helen had been frightened to death, yet in her life there was no basis for fright like that, fright that could send her running out onto the hyacinths, because even their treachery was better than what she ran from, and so the only conclusion could be that the thing she ran from was so terrifying she knew it would be her death, the threat in its appearance rather than its meaning, and who or what could it have been? And what? The question followed naturally. What would be so horrible to Helen that she would run from it into the bayou, and that would also be so terrible to Trillium, who had not seen it? Or had she seen it? Not on the night Helen died, because Ermine Wagner had given her an alibi, but tonight? And why, above all, did Trillium conceal the reason for her fear? Glory be, the sheriff muttered aloud, dazed as if he had just received a blow in the midriff. But now he had it. Each time the killer had struck, he had come a little nearer to Trillium. Tonight he had almost reached her. The first time he had mistaken Helen for her. Tonight Mary Elizabeth had been in the way. Even should he kill mistakenly again, it would make no difference. He would try again. Jarvis wheeled the stair frantically back at the stone hulk behind him, 
at the dim arched cloister walk, the hidden garden, the chapel spire, pointing up to where the stars ought to be. Inside that old pile was Cathy, eighty-two Cathys, all infinitely precious, and their safety lay in his hands. What good would it do to install Glory Muckleroy as an unofficial guard? Anyone with the audacity to walk in among the hunters, even in the inky darkness of the halls, would not be turned back by a single watcher, or by a dozen. And the killer had knowledge that apparently could be pried out of no one. He knew exactly where Trillium and Mary Elizabeth were to be at a given time. The sheriff crossed the lawn, and his knock on the Muckleroy's kitchen door was peremptory. He paid scant attention to High's apologies about how he had locked up extra tight tonight, on account of the woman and kids being nervous over some wild tale that that there churn man had told. It took a good deal of persuasion to convince Glory that the children would survive the rest of the night without her. "'Listen, what are you afraid of, Glory?' Jarvis asked finally. "'Did something scare you tonight? Somebody around the house, outside, prowling?' "'Oh, nothing like that, Sheriff. Just a notion, I guess, seeing all the goings-on over at the convent. Makes you feel spooky, it does. But if you need somebody to sit with that girl that was hurt, well, I guess I can make out alone. The sheriff, engrossed in his own mission, did not notice that Glory had given in almost too abruptly, and also he thought nothing of it when she called High into the pantry, ostensibly to tell him where to find the things for breakfast. But what she whispered out of the sheriff's hearing was a caution to High. Don't you go spillin' no part o' what that there churn man said. He saw a killin', mark my words, and maybe even now he's sorry he told us, and we don't want no part of him gettin' into trouble. He's a mean customer, with his winkin' and all. You keep a still tongue in your head, High Muckleroy. You hear me? I hear you, Glory, honey. He kissed her. There, now don't worry none about us. I reckon Addie Pearl and me's about as good a team as you'd find in double harness. So Glory accompanied the sheriff over to the convent and up to Trillium's room, where the two girls were now sound asleep. Between the beds, Sister Lawrence sat, a restful picture of a nun saying her beads. Glory, said the sheriff, drawing her back into the hall and closing the door. Glory, you are a sort of deputy, you understand. I'm putting you here to keep your eyes open, and I want to hear about everything that happens. Everything, no matter how unimportant it may seem to you. I have to try it this way, you see, because the girls won't talk to me. Oh, they tell me what floats on the surface, but down underneath there's deep water. That's why I wanted you. They'll talk to you, where they wouldn't either to a sister or to me. Glory's troubled blue eyes met the sheriff's. All right, Mr. Thatcher, but I don't like it. Not that I'm scared, but I feel sort of dirty spying on the girls. Mother Theodore could have told them that all the spying in the world would do no good. But the sheriff said, It's the only way to help me, Glory. My daughter is here, too, you know. A few minutes later, Glory was sitting on the cot the sisters had provided for her in Trillium's room, and listening to the even breathing of the two she guarded for Glory was not deluded by the sheriff's need explanation about finding out things. She was a guard, and she knew it. The room was nice, crowded though it was with the extra bed for Mary Elizabeth and the cot for Glory. It had pretty furniture, and there were thin curtains and college banners and a bright rug. Exactly what Addie Pearl would admire to have. But Addie Pearl was safe, and all the nice things wouldn't half make up for it if she had to be scared all the time. Glory got up and examined the door. It had a good lock, the kind that turns with a knob on the inside and opens with a key from the outside. She turned it, satisfied that she and her charges were secure. She didn't know, of course, that several people had keys. Mother Theodore, Sister Laurent, and Rindy. Jarvis Thatcher, when he left Glory, paused in the dimly lighted hall and listened. Behind all the closed doors, girls were whispering, frightened. Down in the cloister, the sisters saying good night to one another would go into their separate cells to keep the silence until morning. It would be an attentive silence, and all of them, girls and sisters, would think of the sheriff as the bulwark between themselves and danger, 
a great perceptive brain boring straight into the maze solving their ominous problem yet here he stood his great perceptive brain staggering from one bewildering phase to the next and his most definitive response was anger at himself at the ghostly presence which could apparently come and go at will unknown and unseen and the presence lived undoubtedly right here on the campus inspired by wrath the sheriff tramped down the stairs and out into the night the lamp still shone from the guest house window when he crossed the lawn and knocked at the door it was opened immediately by crispin archer his thumb marking his place in a book his horn-rimmed glasses giving him the aspect of a benevolent professor his hair tousled and a purple tie loose under his collar too late for a visit mr archer the sheriff asked not at this house come in sheriff eric just got back from disporting himself at the movies sit down and we'll wag the chins a spell the sheriff looking determinedly pleasant followed his host into the living room already before he was across the threshold he had been handed mr eric's alibi for the evening by accident possibly i rather expected to see tolfelson by the fire or oh of course he's in bed eh jarvis seated himself in a large chair no the old duffer's over at his studio he'll be plodding along pretty soon now you're not here on business tonight i hope sheriff eric was not in the room but there were sounds coming from the back regions of the house jarvis's gesture made a molehill out of a mountain oh woman's nervousness mr archer the veil doesn't seem to make him any different in some ways the lord may be watching over them with a special eye but they still prefer the sheriff in an emergency archer smiled at this philosophy and this was an emergency of a sort having some kind of hunt up there tonight and all the lights were turned off and a girl tangled with a door in the dark nothing to it but mother thought i'd better look into it after the other unpleasantness naturally crispin seated himself opposite the sheriff by the way how are you coming on the ah uh, other unpleasantness making progress of course certainly but i'm just about convinced it was some tramp that wandered in a place like this is honey to a fly Jarvis nodded toward the book which lay face down on the arm of Archer's chair. Reading anything good? Crispin's air of casual interest did not change. Byron, he's almost too good to be good, sometimes. The sheriff laughed appreciatively, although all he could remember of the great bard was that he had a game leg and had swum the Darndellis. Franz Eric in pajamas and robe, his hair wet from a shower, appeared in the door. Hello, Sheriff. Chris, where did you put my shoe shine outfit when you got through with it this morning? It's still on the back porch. Enjoy the movies tonight, did you, Mr. Eric? Jarvis inquired. Franz glowered. Putrid. Oh, well, of course, I'm easily entertained, but I thought that motorcycle race was pretty good. He waited for a reply, and Franz muttered, Lousy, before he disappeared. In a moment, they heard him slamming around on the porch. Crispin laughed. That's life for you, Sheriff. Franz goes hunting entertainment and doesn't get it. And I stay home and it comes to me. Did you see that fellow? What's his name? Burns? Goes around demonstrating a churn contraption. Burns and Taffy, said the Sheriff. Say, I haven't seen him in a month of Sundays. Here today, was he? Put on a show in the barnyard. A fine dog he has. Yes, sir. Taffy's a fine dog. Burns came along tonight and sat here gabbing with me. You just missed him. Talk about a liar. That fellow's an eighteen carat Ananias. The sheriff chuckled deeply. That's about right, Mr. Archer. You sized up Theophilus. Is he an old acquaintance of yours? Mine? Lordy, no. Where would I meet him? No, he came asking for Tor, and I was alone, so I had him come in. A great character. A character? That's Theophilus. Supposing you were to use him in one of your books, Mr. Archer, how'd you wind things up for him? Have him live to a ripe old age, a contented old reprobate, running his face for a living? 
Perhaps, said Crispin slowly, giving it every appearance of thought, perhaps I would, Sheriff, but it would be just as logical to shoot him full of holes in about the tenth chapter. And then somebody like me would have to figure out who killed him? Eh? Uh, Jarvis arose. Well, I'll be getting along, not as young as I used to be, and I need to get my sleep. I'll step out and say good night to Mr. Eric. The sheriff stepped so quickly that he couldn't possibly have heard Mr. Archer's assurance that it wasn't necessary to be so polite. He came out on the back porch just as Mr. Eric slipped the very muddy boot out of sight. He couldn't, however, hide the basin of murky water in which he had been removing the worst of the slime, and the sheriff glanced at it with a raised eyebrow. Some denizen ran me off the road tonight when I was walking back from the village, Franz explained grumpily. I only got a boot full of mud, but I might have been knocked flat. Well, now, that's too bad, the sheriff purred. We try to watch out for reckless drivers, my men do, but we sure don't get them all. Drop in and see me where you're in town, Eric. I'll make you acquainted with some of the town lads. You must find it pretty quiet here, a young fellow like you. I do all right, thanks just the same, Franz rejoined. He picked up the basin of muddy water and tipped it into the darkness. The sheriff took himself off with a good night. Doggedly he plodded back to the convent and came into the main corridor. When he had attended to his immediate errand, he would go over to the barnyard and have a chat with Burns. Mother Theodore's office was dark, Sister Osmond's a pale square in the light she always left on. At least they have confidence enough in me to retire to the cloister, he mused, and it's more than I have in myself. I wouldn't retire into a concrete dugout with any feeling of safety. Into the new gymnasium wing he went, then lightly up the stairs to Tovaldson's studio. At the landing he drew back. Thus far he had not come stealthily, yet even on the bare old stairs the artist had not heard him. In the barn-like room, Tor sat before his easel, so abandoned to his study of something on the drawing board that he was disturbed by neither the sound nor the intuitive sensing of another person's presence. With two other images fresh in his mind, the sheriff watched him. Tor was not working, merely sitting in the armchair which he had pulled forward to a spot before the heavy easel. A strong light under an opaque shadow threw a glare on the drawing board, and in the reflection the artist's face was a delineation in planes and shadows. Peaceful, that was the description that fitted. The round, plump face was a study in repose. The red-brown eyes were dark in the absence of light, thoughtfully serene, not fixed in a stare upon the drawing board, but rather expressing a leisurely seriousness. The mouth was grave, relaxed, with a mobility that promised at any moment to cast aside the solemn mood. It was a face of great simplicity, given character by enjoyment of simple things, by the plain, uncomplicated sorrows which come to every man, no mark of bitterness or rebellion, but instead a deep contentment, and something else. Tor was thinking hard, so engrossed that he had not heard the sheriff's approach. His hair was pushed back in a wind-blown shag, and he wore a shirt printed in an oriental design, the collar open. He's a strong old gent, the sheriff thought, noting the muscular neck. He could pick up a girl and throw her bodily into the bayou. So could Archer. So could Eric. But was the casual, easy-going, negligent Archer a murderer? Or Franz, who could be charming even in a temper? Or this quiet, contented man who sat lost in thought over what? The sheriff moved and a board creaked under him. Immediately he stepped forward. Tor turned easily, almost as if he had been expecting a visitor. His smile was affable, guileless, not so expansive as to be irritating. Exactly right. I didn't hear you, Mr. Thatcher. Come in. I was sitting here meditating. There is so much to work out, and I find little spare time during the day. Push that canvas onto the floor and sit down. Jarvis unloaded the chair. If he sat where it was, he would be directly behind the easel, and therefore unable to see what was pinned to the drawing board. Carelessly, he swung the chair over near Tor, 
seated himself astraddle with his arms folded upon its back. "'Say, quite a place you've got here, Mr. Tobletson. You know, I've never seen an artist at work before. A little bit out of my line, but mighty interesting.' He laughed and let his eye be drawn to the glare of the drawing board. Upon it a pencil sketch was pinned, a dog upon a treadmill, and behind him a sea of faces, each face no more than a single line, but so expressive that the scene had life. The picture had been hastily done, but up in the right-hand corner there was another sketch, which had been lingered over, shaded and highlighted into a perfect portrait. "'Theophilus Burns!' the sheriff exclaimed. "'That's him to the life. How did you ever get him to pose for you?' He didn't know he was posing. I sketched him this afternoon while he was giving his demonstration. A wonderful bit of vanishing Americana. Old Theophilus, Jarvis murmured. It's hard to believe he won't turn around with that laugh of his and say something. Quite a fellow for the fast word, Burns is. The sketch is not that well done, Tolson said rather shortly. And he took up the drawing board and disappeared swiftly into the shadows with it. His voice came back, however, genial as ever. It's a habit with me to take notes, in a manner of speaking, on interesting faces. But this one is hardly worth keeping. Now here's something I think you may like, Sheriff. She posed for me this morning. Tor returned and set the study of Nerissa as a red-haired, green-eyed angel in the strong light. The mural was his pet subject, and a nod or two from the Sheriff sufficed to carry him along. But Jarvis's ponderings concerned the pencil sketch about which Tor had protested too much. Was it so insignificant when it could hold a man spellbound as it had the artist? And what was the errand which had brought the churn man seeking Tor at the guest house? Jarvis listened, managing an air of sober interest remarkable for one whose main appreciation of art was for laying wolves and leaping deer on calendars. I see. He nodded in reply to Tor's dissertation on symbolism. There's a good deal more to a picture than the paint, sir. I'm afraid, though, that I'd have the wrong attitude toward my work, granted the talent in the first place. Yes, I'm afraid I couldn't bear to part with a picture after I put in all this thought and planning on it. I just want to sit and look at it. Tor shrugged. Detachment has not been hard for me to learn, Mr. Thatcher. I never have felt that I painted with my lifeblood. While I am painting, the picture occupies my whole mind, until I bring it to whatever perfection is possible for me. Then I sell it. The check is in my pocket. Finis. I do not indulge in sentimentality. The best way, I'm sure, the sheriff agreed. But Tor indulged in other sentimentalities, calling himself an old man, for instance. Well, I mustn't keep you too late, Mr. Tobolson. I'll be looking forward to another chat. Oh, by the way, about when did you come up here tonight? Sometime before dark? Tor picked up the portrait from the easel, answering absently. I came up immediately after dinner, about seven o'clock. Why, Sheriff? No reason to ask, really. One of the girls fell down some stairs and ran into a door. I wondered if the commotion had disturbed you. The artist touched the hair of the portrait and rubbed the wet paint between his fingers. So something else has happened. Although Jarvis waited, Tor only stood there, rubbing his fingers together, his plump cheeks sagging a little, and the oriental figures on the shirt pathetically bright. Who was it, this time, Sheriff? Mary Elizabeth Melville. Cracked a rib, the doctor says. Well, I'll be moving along. Sheriff? Jarvis stopped in the door. Tor's face was pale now, and he made an obvious effort to speak naturally. Was anyone with her? Yes, now that you speak of it, there was another girl, Trillian Pierce. But she wasn't hurt? No, it seems like she wasn't. Well, good night, Mr. Tobolson. Don't stay up too late. Oh, say, when Burns comes along, show him that picture you made of him and Taffy. He'd be proud. The artist's eyes came up to meet the sheriff's. For only a second could Jarvis read the strange display of remorse, or was it pity, before the mask fell, and Tor stood rubbing the wet paint between his fingers. 
Clattering down the stairs, Jarvis halted on the floor below. The old place echoed like a well. Any sound from above would be clearly heard. But there was none. The sheriff went quietly on down and out to his car in the parking lot. Wake up, fella, he said to Pete Jenkins, snoring in the front seat. Got a chore for you. Pete was awake on the instant. Okay, chief, always on my toes. Yeah, well, tiptoe in there and keep an eye on Tolvetson. He'll be coming down from his studio any minute now. Escort him home. Let him know you're on the job. I'll send somebody out to relieve you in a couple of hours. Pete departed, and the sheriff continued on toward his next goal. But he saw before he reached the barnyard gate that his errand was to be fruitless. The churn man's truck was gone, and now Theophilus Burns, having disappeared, was more than ever intriguing. In three instances he had been mentioned tonight. High Muckleroy implied he had scared Glory and the kids with some wild tale. He had visited Archer, asking for Tor, and stayed to furnish Archer with an alibi, and he had been portrayed by Tolvetson minutely, as if careful study had been made of that unattractive visage. Why? the sheriff spoke softly aloud, and where is the connection, if any, between all these whys and the fact that Helen resembled Trillium? Well, we'll hunt up Burns and get a few answers. Tom, asleep against the fence with Auntie tucked under him, as she had sheltered Tom himself when he was a chick, craned his neck and gobbled. Jarvis took a quiet departure. As he trudged back to his car, the chapel clock struck twelve. End of chapter 13「Fourteen of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Fourteen. Theophilus Burns was in a hurry. Crouched over the wheel of his ancient truck, he peered into the radius of light moving dimly ahead over the swamp road, and heard, with dread, the commotion of his own passing. Muckleroy would probably have noted the exact hour, and could hand the information to that business-like Mother Hoosis, and she would slip her hands up her sleeves and look wise and think. The churn man cackled. What could she think except that Mr. Burns had reconsidered his acceptance of her hospitality? She wouldn't know the extent of Mr. Burns' trepidation. Had the fear of God knocked into him, so he had, so did even the curiosity to be aroused by a sudden departure seem preferable to remaining longer on the grounds of St. Aurelian's. And the churn man, by nature and profession, was not one to court curiosity. When the fine pastures fell behind and long scalp locks of moss began to show more frequently, dangling into the headlights from outstretched arms of live oaks, the churn man sat up straighter on the hard, springless seat. He was away, now. Any time he could stop and let Taffy out of the back and up where he loved to be, on the seat beside his master, his huge head resting where the breeze stroked him continually. Any time, Theophilus thought, but not quite yet, but a little more distance between himself and what he had seen back there, maybe half the way to Bayou Florette. With every chug of the engine his confidence grew. What had possessed him to tell that old secret to the Muckleroys? He would never know, unless it was that red-headed woman with her pretty air of hanging on every word. "'Yeah, her doin's all of it,' the charm man muttered. "'Me a born storyteller, and her eatin' it up. Yeah, that was it. Oh, well, no harm done. I've scun out on the double.' "'No harm, of course. Seven years was a long time. The fellow didn't recognize him. Else why hadn't he returned the wave Theophilus sent him?' Both of them had kept to themselves in that other era, never meeting more than to pass the time of day. The fellow hadn't been the kind you'd gas with. By the time the swamp had thickened to mere patches of solid land among vine-clad and hidden waters, Theophilus was his old cocky self. He could look back on the day with his usual bravado and see it as a milestone upon his own particular road. It had been a diplomatic withdrawal, only that carried him out the back way, in a long list trail so seldom travelled that it still held ruts from the spring downpours. He had planned, 
and the back of his head, to go to Bayou Fleurette, and he was simply taking the shortest route. The charman, as he would be the first to admit, was one to see an opportunity long before it walked right up and shook hands with him, and so when an inkling of an idea tapped at his mind, his foot grew lighter on the gas, the old truck coughed to a stop in the middle of the road, and he reached out automatically to shut off the switch. If he had not been so deep in thought, he might have noticed that another engine died with his, and not far back in the darkness. Theophilus also would have admitted that he had a one-track mind, and thus, when he was blessed with a new idea, he deliberated with a consistency that bulked description. It was long since he had an idea with the possibilities of this one, and he found it almost overwhelming. There would be no end to its advantages, so far as he could see. It would warm him in the cold, comfort him in tribulation. In short, be a steady and abiding support in his old age. The fellow would have to trust him, since Theophilus had seven years of silence behind him, to prove the stillness of his tongue, and so long as the fellow paid, the silence would continue. That wouldn't be difficult to put over. The churn man opened the door of his truck and stepped out, whistling softly. He would have liked to work over his exaltation in shouting and singing like a one-man revival meeting, but he didn't dare. Not that anyone would hear him. The swamp was as still as it ever is, whispering its own secrets. In the morning, Theophilus decided, he would go back. He could afford the night to think through his beautiful plan. He put his hand to the catch which secured the back doors of the truck. He could hear Taffy moving clumsily inside. With his hand turning the catch, suddenly tense, the churn man stood listening. Those sounds were not all being made by Taffy inside the truck. Soft steps were coming along the road, business-like steps, as if the walker knew exactly where he was going and why. Theophilus wheeled, flat against the truck. He had forgotten to turn off the lights, and in the pale red of the taillight he saw who it was. He tried to speak, but the only sound was a feeble croak. All his slimy little ideas of blackmail whirled up madly into his mind. He wanted to shout, to beg, to implore, but he could not speak. The only sound he could manage was that feeble croak. The gun spoke instead, and the churn man slipped to the ground like a broken toy. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 15 Twisting her handkerchief into a rag, Glory Muckleroy sat on the edge of her chair in the visitor's parlor and kept her gaze on three well draped marble maidens holding up a sort of bird bath in which grew tiny water plants. Glory was tired. The night had been an endless, waking dream, in which she had lain staring at the doorknob, in the fear that it would turn, then at the window in the hope that it soon would lighten with dawn. The girls had slept deeply, but such oblivion was not for glory. Lying there, going over the evening, every word and gesture of the churn man became loaded with meaning, and when she came to that conclusion, she would slip away from it, only to return because of one inescapable fact. The man had been terrified when he left the kitchen, and since there was no other reason than it must have been because he had told that horrible story, and if it had no connection with the doings at St. Aurelian's, he need not have been afraid. She would tell the sheriff, she decided, the first moment she could see him in the morning. And now that she sat before him and knew he had called her in for information on that subject, the significance of it became appalling. All right now, Glory he said, quietly. Neither of us had much sleep last night, so we'll take it easy. I'll talk to High, but I'd like your story first. Was Burns there when the two girls came into your kitchen last night? Oh, yes, sir. He'd been there maybe an hour by then. We'd had him to supper. The sheriff smiled and Glory relaxed. Mr. Burns was real interested in the mushquash, she added. She could see the girls so plainly. Trillium white and scared, Mary Elizabeth thrilled over the possibilities of the evening, 
the two of them putting the little animal into the cage. Manessa had loved the sparkling crown and wanted to touch it. Everything had been so nice, except, of course, for Miss Trillium. I didn't know it then, but I'd ought to of, because she was scared silly. Miss Trillium, I mean. You could see it plain as the nose on your face. She paused, then continued in an effort to be comforting. I guess it's been Miss Trillium that was the most scared all the time, only nobody seemed to notice. This morning she's still dopey from that pill the doctor gave her, but every footstep that comes to the door she starts up, listening, and she won't talk, Mr. Thatcher, not a word. Jarvis took a turn across the room. Glory, himself, Mother Theodore, Sister Laurent, heaven knew how many more had looked at Trillium and yet not seen her. He rubbed his eyes wearily. Now about that Burns fellow, Glory. What did he talk about after the girls left? You said it was just business up till then. Yes, and the kids playing with the dog real cozy. At first when he started this rigmarole, I didn't take much stock in it, because I thought he'd made up a good half of it. But before he got through... Glory shivered. She went straight through the saga of murder as Theophilus Burns had told it. And when she ended... All the sheriff's weariness had vanished. With its initial mystery, the charman in the scarlet shirt spun the terrible little tail, slipped over to the door, spoke sharply to Taffy, disappeared into the night. And the last thing he said, Glory finished, almost in a whisper, he said he didn't hold with murder, cause it's never done up clean. There's always tag ends. And then was when he got up sudden and left. Tag ends. Into the sheriff's mind there sprang the old fairy tale of the boy who had gone walking in the forest and come upon an old oak which contained the pot of gold. The boy had tied his yellow scarf around the tree and run for help in claiming his treasure. But when he returned, the leprechauns had tied a yellow scarf around every tree in the forest. It might well be that Theophilus Burns was a mock clue. Thus his only importance would be in furnishing Mr. Archer with an alibi. That the churn man, however, had scuttled away into the night because he no longer felt safe at St. Aurelian's was certain, because a gentleman of such roving instincts would not readily give up free board and lodging. Was it the murderer he had seen somewhere on the campus, the smooth-talking killer who had left the witness behind him in the swamp? By the way, Glory, you don't know at what hour Burns actually did leave the grounds, do you? No, sir. The kids had the radio on couldn't hear yourself think. Well, we'll find him. He can't have gone far in that rickety old truck. I'll have a watch out for him cleared in New Orleans. You go back to the girls, Glory. I want to talk to High. Then I'll... Mr. Thatcher, Glory broke in. Listen, Mr. Thatcher, somebody else has got to take over for me. I've got to get back to my kids. The sheriff looked at her sorrowfully. I know, you hate this surveillance job, and so do I, but I have to get to the bottom of the trouble here, Glory, and I can't do it unless people help me. There's nothing we can do for Helen, except to find out why she died, but I honestly believe that we can save Trillium's life. No, I'm not exaggerating. I give a year of my own to know what she's afraid of, but she's too frightened to tell us, and so all we can do is to protect her as well as we can, and try to find out in some other way. I think she may talk to you, Glory, and you know how grateful you'd be to anyone who looked out for Addie Pearl. It was not fair, and Jarvis knew it, to appeal to Glory as a mother, but he had reached a point where he couldn't choose. Last night he had done a lot of thinking, and the result was something to make him wonder whether he ever would sleep again. I need time, he added, and I don't dare take it unless I can be moderately certain that Trillium is safe. Glory, her mouth trembling, stared at the sheriff. I guess you can count on me, sheriff. Poor little thing, with no mother. I'll be as good to her as I know how. The sheriff held out his hand to her. Thank you, Glory. But Trillium, lying in her bed with her eyes closed, listening to the soft rustle of papers, as Sister Laurent sat correcting freshman English and filling Glory's post, was even then trying to think of a way to circumvent her protectors. In the drowsy intervals of waking, all the separate details of her problem kept jumping up, like wild-eyed creatures on a merry-go-round, disappearing in the dizzy circling only to pop around again. 
There was the coat, but that was not an immediate worry. And with the coat she could pigeonhole her concern for her precious letter, the last she had received. Beside that thought a gargoyle leaped out. What had become of the letter, which should have reached her several days ago? It hadn't come because Uncle Henry was out of town and hadn't been there to forward it. Yet in the three years she had been at St. Aurelian's, nothing ever had happened to delay the letter before. So he has it. I have to admit the possibility. It's perfectly logical that he has it. Charlie went back to the initial fact that Jim had taken the letter, picked it up easily with his own from the mail table. There would be no return address other than Uncle Henry's, nothing to help him there. But so vindictive a person would not admit failure for long. He would try in some other way to find her mother, to strike at Trillium herself. And if I'm not in a position to warn my mother, she'll be in greater danger than ever. So I'll go to Uncle Henry. The thought flashed in beautiful lightning across the darkness of her dread, and Trillium relaxed. In Uncle Henry's house, with the servants, she would be comparatively safe, even though her uncle was not there. Eventually, possibly very soon, Jim would know she had gone, and he would follow her, and his departure would leave St. Aurelian's in peace, and Mother Theodore would give up those long vigils in chapel and office. No trace of tragedy would remain then, except the remembrance of Helen and their prayers. I'll do it, she whispered, and sighed to cover the sound. She would sleep for a little while, then plan what to do. It would have to be tonight, tonight. Down in the barnyard, the sheriff was questioning High Muckleroy, not with any conspicuous gain, he realized, for High's story was much the same as Glory's. Corroboration, nevertheless, was good, and there was no shadow of doubt that Theophilus Burns had left because he was scared. High, in the toll shed out behind the barn, enjoyed holding forth to the sheriff, who was seated on a nail keg. Well, now, for myself, being a family man, I don't see this life of skittin' around, but to some, seems like it's the flavor in the stew. The Burns say where he was bound for it when he left here, High? No, Sheriff, didn't even say he was leaving. Do you know what time he went off in the truck? Seems like I recollect hearing a engine chuggin' around about, oh, long after Glory left. Long? How long? I don't know. I've been asleep a while, but it mightn't have been him. Lots of time a tourist gets turned around and lands up in our barnyard. Don't know this is a dead-end road. Glory thinks he went early, soon after he left the kitchen. Well, I ain't going to cross her. The sheriff gave it up. I've had the highway patrol looking for him since midnight. If he'd taken one of the main roads, they should have found him long before this. High sighted down the strip of tin he was hammering. Should have, right enough. If twas me, I'd begin looking somewhere else about now. For instance? For instance, on our own private little old road to buy your floret. He's a great one for Dodlin. Maybe he's camped along there. High, seeing the sheriff's interest, gave a final bang and put aside his hammer. That there road ain't much used no more. In the early days, the Bayou Floretters was mighty busy in tramps and over here. But we don't use it now only sometimes for a shortcut over to the highway, when we're going to New Iberia. Here, you step around the barn and I'll show you. The sheriff had got up, had gone to the tool shed door, and was looking hard at something outside. High went to his side. Old Sister Teend, bundled as always now, sat on the apple box as Tom and Banty, slopping happily through their pan of sour milk, and beside her, sitting on his haunches with his beautiful head in her lap, was an enormous dog, the dog that Thor had sketched in the strange little picture about which he had been so secretive. Taffy! I exclaimed. Where had he come from? The old sister, hearing the voice, raised her head timidly. The sheriff squatted down beside her, patting the dog. Say now, you have a real friend here, sister. Burns' partner, isn't he? How did he turn up? Sister Ateen, afraid to trust her memory, smiled and shook her head. It seemed to her that the chairman had been invited to stay overnight, but she was so often wrong. He came to visit me, she said. The feller wouldn't have left the dog behind. 
I remarked. The sheriff's frown silenced him. He just came to you, did he, sister? No truck around or anything? No, sir. I didn't hear one. I was sitting with Tom and Banty when he walked up to me. I think he must be hungry. Would it be all right to feed him? Oh, certainly, sister. Sister Atene set off happily for the convent kitchen. High bent on giving his conclusions before the sheriff, closed one eye, fixed the other on a far cloud, and burst into speech. The way I figure it, sheriff, there's family diddling going on. That Burns feller thinks the world and all of his dog. And still, he turns him loose, and the dog wanders back, cause he took a shine to that old sister. Looks like he fixin' to stay, too. Not bad, High, said the sheriff. Now, if you'll show me that road, or better still, come with me, we may find out why Taffy came back. You betcha, sheriff. I'll open the pasture gate, and you can drive right through. The road was little more than a cow trail, overgrown until only two dusty furrows remained, and in the dust the fresh track of a car was plainly visible. Jarvis kept his own vehicle astride the ruts. A mile or so from the pasture gate, they rounded a bend and came upon the brilliantly painted truck. The residents at Bayou Florette would not have been able to pass this morning, for the flamboyant jitney stood in the middle of the road. The sheriff's car rolled to a stop. Well, there she is, High said unnecessarily. Right, keep on the grass. The truck, gaudily flaunting, churned with burns, was empty. But a few paces on, in a clump of brown weeds, the churn man lay on his back. All the bravado was gone out of him. The red shirt was stained now with an uneven shade, darker than its own dye. His eyes stared straight up into the sun, and in one loosely opened hand lay a curled leaf, dead as the churn man himself. Hey, I never thought. I was figuring on him camping. The disconnected sentences sounded like a gobble even to High's own ears. He pulled off his cap and stood clutching it, trying not to look at what was left of last night's arrogant storyteller, and yet able to look nowhere else. A fly walked down the churn man's cheek, and the sheriff pulled out a clean handkerchief and laid it quickly over the face. Kneeling there, he touched the hand that held the leaf, as he had expected. It was very cold. So I'm too late again, the sheriff admitted mournfully to himself. Nothing to do now but go back to Marysville, send more telegrams, try to fit the tag ends together. For it was quite apparent now that Theophilus Burns was a tag end. Whether or not he had gone to the guest house asking for Tovaldson or remaining to Alibi Archer. He got up, brushed the grass from his trousers, and walked around ahead of the truck. In the dusty ruts there was no trace of tire marks. If the assailant had been in a car, he had come up behind the churn man, not met him on the road. And if he had come up behind him, it meant he had started out from the convent grounds. The sheriff walked slowly back until he passed the quiet truck. Now there were tire marks in profusion, made by a new diamond-shaped tread. The churn man's truck was not equipped with new tires. Hi, where did you leave your pickup truck last night? The pickup? Why, aside the tool shed, like always when it ain't raining. When it rains, I run it into the barn. Is it beside the tool shed now? Sure, you've seen it yourself, Sheriff. You bought some new tires for it last summer, didn't you? Diamond tread? High swallowed hard at a trembling mass that rose in his throat. So that was why Thatcher had been examining the road. Sure, I bought him, but I, Lordy, I didn't come out here. The fellow winked at Glory, but I didn't. The sheriff grinned. Okay, hi. I didn't think you'd resort to firearms. But somebody did, and it's ten to one he followed Burns out here in your truck. Could you tell if it had been moved in the night? Well, come to think of it, Monroe drove it in last night. Maybe he could tell. Maybe he couldn't. There's a kind of track all beat down from driving over it so much. But I don't know. If he'd left it about where Mun did, I guess you wouldn't know. How about the gas gauge? Ain't got none. Well, you'll have to stay here, High, while I phone for my men. Don't mind, do you? High did mind. 
the sheriff left him a reluctant little human creature guarding another who needed no protection against ordinary disturbances turning his car carefully jarvis drove back to the convent passing through the barnyard the sheriff hailed munn who was trundling a wheelbarrow of dirt toward the garden together they approached the truck which now stood in early morning shade beside the tool shed now this is important munn the sheriff said take a good look go all round it before you answer is that truck exactly as you left it last night Monroe took off his cap, pushed back his cowlick, jammed the cap over his eyes, shoved his hands into his hip pockets, and with a scowl that emphasized his deep absorption, sauntered around the truck. The verdict, Jarvis saw, would be weighed carefully. When at last Monroe was satisfied, he came back to stand, feet wide apart, beside the sheriff. He spat first. I tell you, sheriff, I couldn't rightly say she's been moved from where I put her. I was pretty busy at the time, and I ran her up there. Suddenly Monroe's exaggerated seriousness dropped from him. He leaped to the running board and jerked the gear shift lever. Jarvis spit back an exclamation. The kid would be spoiling possible fingerprints. Only there would be none. This fellow was too clever to leave his trademark behind him. Hey, Sheriff, she's in gear. Looky, I don't never leave her that way. The Sheriff jumped up beside him felt the same rush of excitement that shivered through Monroe. You're sure, Mon? You didn't accidentally leave it in gear? Certain sure. That's one thing Pa's real particular about. He says some day I'll leave her in second, and if she won't start and I'd have to crank her, she'll jump me and maybe kill me. No, sir. I'd swear any way you like. I didn't leave her that way. Good. You've helped me, Mon. The sheriff nodded toward the road he had just traveled. See? So I drove this truck up a bayou and shot Theophilus Burns. And the sound I had heard, Jarvis knew now, was the killer returning the truck to its parking place. You and Pop found him? Yeah, just now. Willikers! Munn's fascinated gaze went to the truck, then back to Mr. Thatcher's solemn face. Listen, Sheriff, I bet you I know something about the guy that drove it. You do? You mean when he left here? No, nothing like that. But I was reading in a mechanics magazine. When you drive in hill country, you learn to leave your car in gear when you park on a hill. If you park facing downhill, you put it in reverse. Leave her in second, if you're going uphill. Kind of an extra break. So, Monroe ended proudly, this jigger must have learned to drive in hills, because we ain't got none around here. He just left the truck this way out of habit. The sheriff gave a low whistle. This was the perfect explanation of one very small wisp. Yet how did it help to know that the killer had learned to drive in hill country? Archer had been everywhere. Franz was a rover. In his beloved Normandy, in Brittany, Tor would have found numerous hills. Well, say, when you're old enough, I'll know where to find a mighty smart deputy, Jarvis said confidentially. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't mention this to anybody, Mun. I couldn't say how important it may be except that everything's important right now. Monroe scowled, endeavoring to maintain a manly indifference. He did, until the sheriff left. Then he sat down on the running ward of the truck, and shook like an aspen in an autumn breeze. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 16 Trillium, by late afternoon, knew as well as she could know what her plan must be. Once, she had suggested to Glory that she dress and go down to the library to study, but Glory's horrified refusal had been so prompt that Trillium dared not ask again. Out in the halls, the hunters worked furiously against time, searching for the object, bearing the crown, growing more fervid with every strike of the old clock. The bells rang, the chanting of the sisters drifted over from the chapel at appointed hours. Everything went on as usual. But underneath the homely, wholesome activity, something else lay dormant, the relentless thing that would not be satisfied until murder had been done again. 
when sister laurent came in to relieve glory for an hour in the late afternoon trillium sat up stretching and asked sister can't i get up and dress i'm so tired of lying here sister laurent being young herself knew how weary a bed could become to young muscles and she had not been over cautioned by the sheriff so she agreed and trillium took her robe and went for a shower the sister busily straightening up the room failed to notice that trillium had slipped a stub of pencil and a piece of paper into the pocket of her robe glory coming back found trillium neatly dressed in her brown wool the gold belt buckled smartly her hair freshly combed and her mouth bright with lipstick mary elizabeth in a pink bed jacket with a pink bow in her hair languished upon her pillows and announced that she was hungry enough to eat a horse without cutting it up your patients are nearly well sister laurent informed glory you don't look very happy about it are you sorry to lose them no ma'am glory murmured a short half hour ago when she had left trillium had been lying with her face to the wall wide awake but pretending to be asleep the change to the poised quietly smiling young lady in the brown wool was too sudden not to be alarming i'm going to pin the crown to our class banner tonight glory she said oh but miss trillium sister laurent departed briskly and mary elizabeth said with complacence the hunters won't find the fleece don't you worry glory that nice mr thatcher didn't give us away trill is going to have her moment but you aren't well enough miss trillium i mean the sheriff isn't going to think you're well enough mary elizabeth laughed then wailed as she hugged her sore rib but trillium gave a little secret smile and opened her chemistry book thus far she had run into no obstacles in the shower she had written the note for mother theodore and this time there would be no chance for it to fall into the wrong hands because she would take it to the office herself in the last moment before she left the building and put it into the drawer of mother's desk her coin purse and her flashlight were in the pocket of the red coat a bandana folded in with them she could walk the mile into marysville without anyone being the wiser and if the tiny clipping safe in her coin purse meant what it said she would have a place to go when she reached marysville planning ahead that was what counted yesterday the clipping had been only a sort of hope now it was a possibility tonight it would be a reality feeling pathetically proud of her management she sat pretending to study but thinking it all through again glory will you get me a fresh drink of water please mary elizabeth asked after a time glory put down her crocheting and went obediently when she was out of hearing mary elizabeth asked trill are you going to the assembly of course but i don't think glory will let you trillium laid down her book liz tonight means more to me than i can tell you i i have to go you'll help me won't you well sure but sure if it's that important mary elizabeth was deeply impressed and trillium went back to her studying with a guilty conscience glory came back and sat down in the little rocker where she had spent so many hours but now busy as her hands were the crocheting ceased to occupy her mind she didn't like it miss trillium up and dressed for even though the girl seemed to be concerned with nothing outside of her school books her air was that of a bird perched on a delicate twig while the cat crouched on the last limb that would hold his weight if the bird had any sense he'd fly away glory followed the thought the crochet hook jabbed her finger as glory's hand stiffened it was true miss trillium's face in the light of the study lamp was quiet and determined as if she had made a decision and was calm because of it what if she had decided to run away remembering all the sheriff's warnings and her own promises glory was thrown into confusion she had been ready to refuse permission for the girl to leave but how to deal with this resoluteness she did not know if only hi were here to tell her what to do if the sheriff would happen along she could telephone to either of them but she would have to be gone some time to do it and miss trillian would have her chance to run away but there was mother theodore glory remembered hopefully 
if she could get word to mother the mother would warn the sheriff and the responsibility would be his going back to her pineapple design glory felt eased she would be the most ready to admit that she was not a diplomat still having thought out this neat course for herself she was equal to the game she even knew now how she would proceed glory was pleased when she saw rindy's dark face looming over the tea cart rindy was trustable and it was in the line of duty for her to carry messages having seen that the girls were settled with their supper trays glory followed rindy into the hall rindy please will you tell mother theodore i'd like to see her real soon yes'm i'm afraid she'll have to come up here i can't leave yes'm only she don't like it coming up all them stairs less than you all got a pretty nifty because if Glory had been less upset, she might have wondered why Rindy should take it upon herself to judge the propriety of her request. But such was her state of mind that uncertainty came to her more readily than composure. "'Can't you just say that Ms. McElroy's got to see her?' "'Yes, am said Rindy, unconvinced. "'Tell her's about Miss Trillium. That's all I know myself. Maybe it's just the convocation she's bound for, but there's something. Will you find Mother and tell her?' I'll take your message, ma'am, sure enough. Randy pushed the tea cart against the wall to await the empty trays. Through the short conversation she had not met Glory's eyes, and as she glided noiselessly to the stairs and down, there was something so cunning about her that she might have been a spy slipping away with deadly information. Supper's getting cold, Glory, Mary Elizabeth called. Glory went in and sat down with her tray. Mary Elizabeth, unaware that she was bridging an awkward moment, chattered on. Trillium ate her supper deliberately, answering sometimes, to all appearances merely a convent girl enduring a quiet hour. But she had not lain down or mussed herself up in any way. At the drop of a hat she could be out and gone. Randy, going down the back stairs to the kitchen, was more than pleased with the little incident. Clever, that's what she was. She hadn't promised to speak to Mother. She had promised to pass the word along. And that she would do. She laughed silently. And there, below her, as if she were sent at the proper time, was Sister Atene, on her way to the sister's dining room. Rindy wiped her eyes and choked off her laughter. Old Atene's timely appearance was a sign, and Rindy believed in signs. Without a second's hesitation, she hurried down to intercept the old sister. Trillium guessed what had taken place between Rindy and Glory in the hall. But as the half-hour became an hour, and Mother did not come, she began to wonder. The convent, in this last desperate effort of the hunt, was in an uproar. Thirty minutes more and the bell would ring out the seniors' victory. The underclassmen, dirty and broken-hearted, would make a rush for the auditorium, where the crown would be pinned to the seniors' banner for another year. Through the day the fever had run high and yet with the falling of dusk and the inevitable dwindling of hours into minutes delirium was reached sanity flew out the windows if mother theodore did not receive glory's message or even forgot about it that was hardly to be wondered at girls ran everywhere burrowed into corners that already had been ransacked even stood on the stairs and sobbed into their shirt sleeves they've done it again the cry began and soon the old halls were a wailing wall for the less valiant, who would not take the defeat. In the auditorium the school band began to play, off-key with excitement, but with full spirit. Up in the tower the clock struck, and the convent bell clanged the end of the hunt. "'They didn't find it!' Hilaria shouted at the door, red-faced, her hair on end. "'Hear that, kids? We're the victors! Hooray for our side!' Oh, go away, Mary Elizabeth snapped. Don't tell us about your fun. Glory, you'll have to rub my back. Get the alcohol. Trillium smiled at Hilaria, excusing the invalid. It was not natural, this peevishness, Glory thought, when the halls were alive with exultant seniors sounding like bees at swarming time. Mary Elizabeth should at least share as she could in the general gratification. If only Mother Theodore would come but there was little hope now until after the convocation. Glory closed the door and went to the closet for the alcohol bottle, but Mary Elizabeth was in a tantrum. 
For Pete's sake, Glory, your hands are like ice. Go and run some hot water on them. Glory was confounded. Her patient never had acted so badly before, turning her face to the wall, grumbling into her pillow. Don't mind her, Glory, Trillium said softly. Maybe she has a reason. Glory cuddled the alcohol bottle. Her hands were always stiff with cold when she was nervous. The washroom was only down the hall, and if she were to leave the door open, she could see Miss Trillium if she passed. I'll only be a minute, she promised, and scurried away. Mary Elizabeth bounced upright. Well, didn't I fix it for you, Trill? Scoot before she gets back. Trillium blew her a kiss and snatched her red coat from the closet. Honestly, honey, I'll never forget this as long as I live, she declared, and wondered how long that would be. Your good coat, Trill? Mary Elizabeth asked. You'll get it filthy up in that old loft. Take your sweater. This night will never come again, Liz baby. Bye and thanks. She looked around the room, as if she were saying goodbye to it forever, Mary Elizabeth would report later, and then she was gone. A few minutes after, Glory returned to stand in the door, her face sickly white when she saw the empty chair by the desk, a thin figure in a faded dress and skimpy sweater, which hung in peaks in front, seized with a fear that transferred itself to Mary Elizabeth. "'She's only gone to the convocation, Glory,' the girl protested. "'She has to bring the fleece from the hiding place to the auditorium stage. It's the crowning moment of the hunt.' But Glory seemed to be in a sort of stupor. No, she said. No, I've got to find Mother, right away, quick. She stood mumbling, twisting her hands, unable to distinguish between the different urgencies that shook her. Find Mother, find Miss Trillium, get word to the sheriff. Glory! Mary Elizabeth wailed, but it was not enough to stop Glory. The girl was alone in the room, listening to footsteps hurrying away through the hall. And now Mary Elizabeth was frightened. Trillium had taken her good coat. Why? Why did Glory go chasing after her as if it meant life or death? Mary Elizabeth did not get up to follow. She curled herself into a ball, hugging her sore rib, and lay watching the open door. Sister Teen, plodding along the cloister walk from the last visit to Tom and Banty, was bothered about something. Not about what was to happen this evening, for that was all quite clear. The convent bell was ringing, and she was on her way to the auditorium for the Golden Fleece convocation. But back behind her knowledge of the present, there lurked something else. Something she ought to be doing, or that she should have done. Roast beef, supper, Rindy. Rindy had given her a message for mother. Before supper. My old head is no good any more, she sighed. She couldn't even recall what Rindy had said. Only desirous. It was a curious word. If someone was desirous, and the message was for Mother, then it must be that one of the girls wished to see Mother in her office. That was right. She remembered now. Sister Team plodded up the steps and in at the east entrance. Everyone passed her, but she didn't mind. She was used to that. She had to stop and rest on the first landing, and by the time she reached the main corridor, all the girls were gone. All in the auditorium. Mother, of course, would be there, too. Mother, always kind, would forgive the late delivery of the message. Shuffling along with her hand on the wall to guide her, Sister Teen realized abruptly that she was in the wrong corridor. She had turned instead of continuing on straight ahead, and before her was the side stairs, seldom used, which led up to the second-floor dormitories. The second floor. That was where Trillium Pierce and Helen. No... Mary Elizabeth Melville lived, and Annie Pearl had told her that Glory was taking care of them. That was the message. Trillium wanted to speak with Mother in her office. Sister Teen laughed softly. It was so wonderful to remember something. She turned to go back the way she had come, but now there was someone in the hall with her, someone who had come out of one of the little used rooms on this corridor. The old sister had not noticed, in her own perpetual twilight, of the hall where she stood was unlighted. But now she saw the figure ahead of her silhouetted against the strong reflection from the main hall. Mother Theodore, of all people! 
Mother, whom she wished to see before she would again forget the message. Mother, if you please. The figure halted as if startled. Excuse me, Mother, it's Sister Atene. I have a message for you. Charlie and Pierce would like to see you in your office. She's not very well, you know. Sister Atene paused. When Mother made no answer, she took it as a reproach. I am very sorry, Mother. I should have remembered it sooner. If you'll excuse me, I'll not try to carry messages any more. My memory is too poor. Sister Atene was trembling by this time. Mother must be gravely displeased when she remained so silent and stiff against the light. The sister, her eyes humbly on the floor, moved along past the tall figure. Mother's scapular seemed to be divided in a queer way, almost like trouser legs, and her feet appeared to be very large. Sister was not in a position to comment. Mother never had been so severe with her before, and without saying a word, too. Sister Atene was so troubled that she very nearly turned into the cloister instead of going on to the auditorium. But the evening would be lonely there, and this upset with Mother brought back everything. The lost habit which never had been found sprang up before her with dreadful clarity. The doings of the girls would take her mind off it. When she came into the auditorium, she sat down in a back seat beside another sister. "'I was afraid you weren't coming, sister,' said Mother Theodore. Sister Atene gasped, then peered at the face beside her. It was Mother. There was no doubt of that. But how had she come here so quickly? And if they had met in the hall, why had Mother not seen that she was on her way to the auditorium? "'It was Sister Osmond,' the old sister exclaimed. "'What was that, sister?' Mother asked. Sister Teen smiled and nodded. She had encountered Sister Osmond in the hall. She was certain of that now. She recalled how big Sister Osmond was, and Sister hadn't spoken because she was miffed when she had not been recognized. So delighted was the old sister with this explanation that she forgot entirely about the message and turned to her enjoyment of the girl's performance. Behind them, Glory Muckleroy slipped into the auditorium. All the sisters were there, all counterparts of one another from the back. How on earth would she ever tell which was Mother? She couldn't walk right out into the aisle and look into their faces. Wait a minute, and Mother might turn around. But she didn't dare wait long. Not long. Trillium laughed to herself as she ran down the stairs through the main hall and into the small corridor from which opened the dressing rooms and the stage entrance. It had been so easy to get away. The hurry and bustle reminded her of the night of mustard seed, when Helen had called as someone else was calling now. Trillium! Has anybody seen Trillium? Hilaria tumbled down the stage steps. Oh, Trill, I didn't dare ask if you'd be here. After the way Liz snapped at me. Are you all right? Fine, and don't be mad at Liz. She was doing it to help me get away. Listen, Hilaria, I want you to come with me for the fleece. Hilaria made a delighted pretense of fainting, and Mercy Harding whispered down the steps. Is that you, Trill? Okay, go get the fleece. Everybody's rounded up. Silent, hand in hand, Hilaria and Trillium once again traversed the old halls, quiet now as if all noise had died in them and would never be resurrected. It was surprising to Trillium to feel so calm, almost detached from this girl in the brown wool dress, who walked along with Hilaria. At the turn into the old passage out of which Sister Atene had wandered so short a time before, they stopped, and Trillium swung on her coat. You go on, Hilaria. I'll stay here. Not on your life. I'm not going up there alone. Honey, don't be foolish. There could be spies still around. And if I'm on guard, I can lead them astray. There won't be any spies. The hunt's over. Haven't you heard, Hilaria? We're leaving the hiding place to the juniors in our class will. A secret codicil. So we're still keeping guard. I haven't heard about any secret codicil, and I'm the class president. Hilaria retorted promptly. What is this? Dirty politics going on behind my back? Please, don't make things difficult, honey child. Trillium begged. If our only chance was to go wrong now, when the open door was not fifty feet away around the turn of the hall. 
the juniors will probably think up their own hiding place anyway next year said hilaria come on let's get it over with before the ghosts walk hill if i thought you'd be such a goose i wouldn't have chosen you honestly i'll go to the head of the stairs but no farther and from there i can keep an eye on the tower door and on this hall too and when you come back if i'm gone gone for pete's sake if a spy comes by i'll have to lead her off won't i now go on well i'm carrying a st christopher medal so i may come back alive hilaria sighed and then thinking to get the frightening errand over quickly she ran up the stairs Trillian waited only until her partner was out of sight. Her hand in her pocket told her that the coin purse was there, safe, the note from Mother with it. She tiptoed down the steps to keep her high heels from clicking, and back along the corridor. Mother's office was dark, no trace of light showed through the frosted glass of the door. And yet, Trillian, her hand on the knob, halted, listening, her heart leaping in sudden warning. Run, run, her intuition cautioned don't open the door escape while you can still why should she stand there shuddering when all she must do now was to dart into mother's office and leave the note on the desk the note was not of extreme importance asking only that mother theodore would not try to find her but it was the first test of her courage to enter the dark room she gave the knob a quick turn the door opened as it should noiselessly swinging wide well what did you expect she thought and stepped inside in a single second she knew she was not alone against the gray window a tall blur loomed the exact silhouette of a nun before she could scream the blur swelled until it blocked out the window and powerful purposeful hands caught her by the shoulders her choked exclamation was nothing more than a gurgle and yet in the blackness of the inner office someone moved striking a foot against the metal wastebasket. Then a heavy body struck her assailant. He staggered, lost his grip, and Trillian pulled free. The door was still open behind her, and someone jostled her, escaping. She leaped backward, flew down the hall and out into the night. Who, she wondered in panic, who other than her attacker had been there in that black little room? The enormous, quiet figure did not linger. A moment after Trillium's departure, it glided along the way she had taken, but when it came to the east door, it continued on down the ancient passages below the convent. No one would follow into the tunnels. When Hilaria passed the office, scanning the halls for Trillium, the door was closed, and behind the frosted glass the darkness was unbroken. In the auditorium, the band was putting all its lung capacity into the victory march. The entrance of Hilaria and the fleece upon the stage touched off a celebration which could be compared only to a political convention when the favorite son had been nominated. The efforts of the band were noticeable only in distended cheeks. Juniors cheered for seniors, seniors cheered for themselves, and everyone else simply cheered in a colossal bedlam. In the small corridor behind the stage, Mother Theodore entered hastily, almost stepping upon a senior in blue jeans who was solemnly turning somersaults. Diana. Yes, mother? The girl came up with a flushed face. Ask Hilaria to step out here a moment, please. Mother was provoked, but frightened far more than she was provoked. Glory had shilly shouted so long that Trillium could be anywhere by now. Mother had overlooked the importance of being chairman of the fleece committee. She had taken for granted Trillium's acquiescence in remaining away from the convocation. I should have spoken directly to her. Hilaria, where is Trillium? Hilaria scrambled down the stage steps, and her face was blanched. She's gone, Mother. Mother Theodore swayed against the wall. But she was with you? Oh, yes. She said she'd wait for me at the landing where she could watch for spies, but she didn't. When I came back, she was gone. She'd have had time to lead a spy all over the campus and be back here by now. Mother, what will we do? Mother Theodore had read in books that brains sometimes went numb in terrifying circumstances, and always she had turned the page with superior pity, never giving a thought to the possibility that her own well-disciplined member could be capable of such inefficiency, but leaning there against the wall, with her own dread reflected in the young face before her, 
knowing that each separate event of the past days was not separate at all but only another fact of the terrible whole her thinking powers were numbed what will we do hilary had asked her as if there might be something they actually could do to turn the tide away from st aurelian's although it seemed to mother theodore that she stood there inarticulate through a whirl gig of time it was only seconds before self-discipline the watchword of the convent provided an instinctive pattern go back and act in her place hilaria and say nothing at all about trillium if the girls ask say that i am having a talk with her and no doubt by that time i will be do the best you can dear yes mother hilaria said obediently mother left her but if she had looked back she would have seen hilaria's eyes dilated with fright and her hands pressed hard over her mouth because hilaria knew now that all of trillium's chatter about the secret codicil had been a deliberate ruse to give herself a reason for staying behind and the minute hilaria was gone trillium had run away just up and went that was how glory had put it to mother theodore like the churn man theophilus burns had up and gone too that was the first thought mother had an irrelevant one she was certain yet it indicated that the numbness was lifting hurrying to her office she had time to feel a definite impatience with glory even a slight apprehension when she cast a head to what jervis would say she opened the door of the outer office quickly snapped on the light entered the inner room and snapped on another light there was no sign of any disturbance except that a corner of the rug in the outer office was flipped back as if someone had tripped on it but mother had not looked that way mr thatcher was at home when her call came hearing his clipped response mother realized that with his entry this time a new era would open for st aurelian's there could be no pretense that this was an accident that trillium had gone for a walk or strolled into town to the movies soon the campus looked like a northern meadow alight with fireflies as the sheriff's men searched sending the beams of their flashlights into every corner of the buildings and grounds the girls knew this time what the hunt meant trillium had disappeared perhaps as helen had gone and there was no attempt to mask the efforts to find her with auto lights burning a hole in the darkness around the bayou the hyacinths were torn away and the brown water dragged and when they found nothing jarvis thatcher did not know whether to be relieved or doubly apprehensive it was possible that something even worse than drowning had happened to trillium the sheriff's knock upon the door of the guest house was peremptory when franz eric answered it jarvis pushed past him into the living room and stood scrutinizing the homely scene as if he believed no part of what he saw in pajamas and dressing gown tor sat dozing in a big armchair his bare feet stretched out on a hassock toward the dying fire on the Davenport, with a multitude of papers laid out carefully on either side of him, Crispin Archer was arranged with a typewriter upon a card table before him. The Davenport was low, the table uncomfortably high for typing. Yet, if one were to judge by the half-sheets of paper covered with notes, he had been working in that position for hours. Archer and Tor turned the same startled countenances to the sheriff. Tor's feet hit the floor with a thump. Crispin half rose bumped the card table and fell back so much for you two the sheriff thought swiftly you show me your thunderstruck at my appearance here as for eric he's the guileless schoolboy caught off his guard a little more than the others but covering it up well wearing house slippers too fancy mexican affairs strange how each was arrayed to scream out the information that he had been spending a peaceful evening at his own fireside the sheriff stepped past Franz, who remained petrified in the doorway. But it was Franz who spoke first. Is she... He began and bit his lip. Is she what? The sheriff asked quietly. And who, Eric? Who are you so anxious about? Oh, come on, Thatcher, Crispin cut in. Disaster is written all over you. What's up? My dear sir, sit down, Tor urged. Franz, give Mr. Thatcher a chair. Never mind. I understand from various sources that none of you attended the convocation tonight. During that time, another girl disappeared. I must ask each of you to account for your movements from seven o'clock on. Who begins? Archer relaxed, at least in body, 
struck another key or two on the typewriter, and pulled out the paper, glanced at what he had written, and laid the sheet in one of the piles. Franz remained stiffly where he was, his dark eyes fixed upon Tor, but if the artist received any message, he did it so neatly that the sheriff was unaware. Tor, feeling with his feet for his slippers, spoke as he would to a child, naturally taking the lead. I'll be first, sheriff, but do sit down. You can't take notes very well standing up. I'll trust my memory. At seven o'clock? Tor frowned, thinking deeply. At seven, let me see. We had just finished dinner, a little late, because we sat there talking. I believe it was Franz who asked if either of us was going to the convocation. But you, Chris, you said it was pretty juvenile for us. The smile was so blatantly that of a good uncle, fixing up everything that the sheriff lost what patience he had. You didn't go to the auditorium. What did you do, you yourself? Why, I went up to my studio. For an uninterrupted evening, of course. Well, as it happened, no. I stayed about twenty minutes, not more. It was cold up there, dreary, and I began thinking of the warm, sunny places I'd been until I worked up a dark blue mood. I don't indulge myself often, Sheriff, but I managed to dispel any interest I had in my painting, and I came back here. That would be before seven-thirty, then? I'm sure of it, although I didn't look at the time. And you have been in the house ever since? Yes, Sheriff. I prepared for bed, but the boys came in and I joined them out here. Exactly what an old codger like you ought to be doing on a cold night. A shade too characteristic, Jarvis reflected. Without a word, he let his inspection fall upon Archer, barricaded behind his table, a cigarette idly in his hand. Archer seemed rather amused, as if this were a stage interlude in which he pleasantly participated. I have a heck of an alibi, Sheriff. I did some work in the college library, about eight when I left. I didn't get lonesome like Tor. It simply happened that I finished what I had to do and came home. And that's a heck of an alibi? Jervis snapped. Archer pulled out his cigarette, grinning. I'm afraid so. You see, I was alone the whole time. It's not funny, Chris, Tor reproved. The sheriff was becoming wrathful, a state of mind to benefit none of them and Franz was not helping the situation. He crossed to the fireplace, his back to the room, but Tor, broadside to the others, noticed that his black eyes smoldered, although it was undoubtedly only the reflection of the flames. And you, Eric? The sheriff prompted. I looked in on the convocation, juvenile or not. The kids were having fun. Did you stay long? No. One of the sisters got her eye on me, and I knew she'd bring me in and set me down with ceremony in a conspicuous place, so I scun out. He wheeled, defiance and arrogance in his bearing. I went for a walk through the grounds, out by Pirate Cove, around through the barnyard, and over to the golf links, alone. I came in about the time Chris did. What time? Eight, a quarter to, a quarter after, I don't know. Not much concern with time, are you, Eric? The young man shrugged. Tor, perhaps with an idea of apologizing for these two, pulled himself out of his chair, a dignified figure in spite of rumpled hair, and a split shoulder seam in his robe. Have we helped you at all, Sheriff? Is there anything else? No? Then let me say that I wish you Godspeed in finding Trillium, both for her sake and ours. The sheriff's voice was as quiet as Tor's. I didn't mention who was missing, Tovoltsin. How did you know? Instead of being thrown into confusion, the artist smiled. Did I ever show you the portrait I am painting of her, Sheriff? A log fell in the fireplace, and across the room Jarvis's penetrating observation nailed Tor where he was, his profile to the firelight, the only lamp behind him. Another man would have squirmed, but not Tolson. Head back, smiling so that his plump cheeks nearly closed his eyes, he met the sheriff's stare as if it were a wind in the face. The sheriff's departure was as sudden as his entrance, a swift opening and closing of the door, and footsteps dropping away into the night. Chris whipped a piece of paper into his typewriter with a snarl of the roller. What in the dickens made you say that, Tor? 
because it answered his question. I mean, how could you name Trillium? Tor seemed not to have heard. As if his thoughts had wandered to something of more importance, he sat down, pulled up the legs of his pajamas, and removed his garters. It felt like I'd forgotten something, he remarked. Then, with the green garters dangling from his hand, he puttered into his bedroom and closed the door. Franz and Crispin studied the door for a long minute before Chris wriggled out from behind his table and approached the fire, stretching and yawning. They might have talked, but they didn't, and it was not because there was nothing to say. I wish we had the makings of a drink, Franz said after a while. So do I, said Crispin. I'm dismal and heartsick myself. Parting, they went to their rooms. Tor, they heard through the closed door, was yawning as if he relaxed for sleep. I'd be crazy right now if I didn't feel almost convinced she went off on her own accord, Sheriff Thatcher declared to Mother Theodore, when, long after midnight, he sat again in her office. I've alerted all the highway patrols, started inquiries in Marysville, but I had to drag the bayou just to satisfy myself. That story she handed Hilaria Toms is what points to her going on her own. That, and Mary Elizabeth's statement about the coat. She insists that Shirley is careful of her clothes, that she wouldn't take her good coat unless she intended to leave the building. If that young lady had had her flash of intelligence sooner, we might have done something. But Glory insists Shirley was building up to an escape all day. He glanced at Mother apologetically. Glory did the best she could. She's a smart woman. Very, Mother said dryly. Oh, now, listen, Emmy. Jarvis, what earthly excuse could she have for not sending word to me that she was worried about Trillium? She wasn't solely responsible, and she knew it. She says she did send you a message. I didn't receive it. Well, she says she sent it by your maid, Rindy. Now, I wonder, did Rindy forget? Mother Theodore caught her breath. Rindy, polishing the office door brushing past the visitor's parlor, flicking impudence from her shifty eyes whenever she was corrected for something. Rindy had been different lately, independently different. That was the core of it. Rindy had been acting as if she didn't care about her job, as if the slightest hint might make her quit. What is it, Emmy? Rindy. Mother laid her hand on the telephone. Would you like me to get her in here for you, Jarvis? When Rindy came in to stand before the sheriff and Mother Theodore, her eyes downcast and her face the color of cold ashes, she could tell very little. Miss Glory had asked her to give Mother a message, but she was busy in the kitchen and she had forgotten. What kind of message? the sheriff demanded. She said to tell Mother she wanted to see her, but I thought it was just fussin', nothing important. Was it up to you to decide, Rindy? The girl stood there, sullen. Not a very intelligent creature, but she worked hard. Without any reason in mind, Jarvis asked another question. Randy, who cleans the guest house? Randy's eyes met his, wide, terrified, and her arm came up as if to ward off a blow. But when the eyes fell, the defensive gesture ended in fumbling for a sweater button, and the unguarded reaction was under control. Who, Randy? Jarvis insisted, watching her closely. Her tongue traveled around her lips before she answered. Me, sir. Tuesdays and Saturdays. They makes their own beds, and I dust the bathroom every day, but clean it only twice a week. What made your memory so brief where Mrs. Muckleroy's message was concerned? Was it because she didn't pay you that you forgot? Jarvis, seeing her mouth go shut stubbornly, knew he should not have lost his temper. But this girl was responsible, in a sense, for Trillium's disappearance or worse. He should talk to her, try to worm out of her more information, if possible. But he couldn't trust himself to do it now. All right, Rindy, you can go, and keep a silent tongue in your head. Understand? Her eyes rolled until the whites showed, and the sheriff groaned inwardly. Rindy was afraid of something, too. Of me, he decided, and waved her away. When the door had closed behind Rindy, Jarvis snapped shut his notebook. Well, all we're sure of is that Trillium's gone. And one more thing. I'm not kidding myself any more. I admit this killer has some means of getting around, so that he's practically immune to detection. 
Otherwise he wouldn't have dared come in here last night, with kids swarming all over the place. Maybe he's the invisible man. He paused thoughtfully. This sounds pretty far-fetched, Emmy, but could there be a secret tunnel somewhere under the building, some entrance he can use unknown to us? Mother Theodore had thought of the same thing once, and she answered readily. None, Jarvis. Last summer when the tunnels were being repaired, I asked the workmen to look out for old forgotten passages. But there are only the three, from the west end of the convent building to the contemplative's house, then at a right angle over to the chapel, and turning again to come back to the east end of the building. They make a square laid directly under the cloister walks. Well, it was just an idea. The sheriff got up wearily. If Trillium is alive, as I think she is, and turns up at her uncle's house in New Orleans, she won't find anybody home, only the servants. But I'm trying to locate the uncle, and I've notified the agent at the railroad station in Marysville to keep her there if she shows up. And by the way, your three geniuses are alibiless for the hour between seven and eight, when our little lady was making her get away. One gent was up in his studio, one and one in the library, one taking a solitary walk. And then they all toddled home and settled down cozy as bugs in a rug. And along comes the bungling old sheriff and finds him there. And meanwhile, of course, Theophilus Burns was getting himself murdered on the road to Bayou Florette. Jarvis walked to the door and opened it. and the harsh overhead light, he looked old. I'm glad we have capital punishment in this state, Emmy, he said softly, and went out and closed the door. Mother Theodore heard him plod away, almost like old sister Teen, as if he could see but dimly where he was going. All the lightness had gone out of his step. End of chapter 16